an article uh, entitled Art Notes on Noah's Ark, where he looks upon every uh, incarnation or hypothesis of why and how uh, Zortnot could have ended up here. This is whether this is really Zortnot or whether it's a Zortnot type building, whether it was Gagi Kashen or maybe it's just a universal three tiered design. And I'm inclined to this theory rather than uh, directly replicating Zortnot. This is the ideal uh, structure of the universe, which is why those who carved Saint Chapelle reproduced it rather than copied it. And this is what I saw in the vernissage here. It was made by, painted by a young girl. I persuaded her. I wanted to get her in the frame, but she refused. She didn't know anything about Saint Chapelle. But Zwartnot is descending on the summit of Ararat, exactly like in the shape of Noah's Ark. So this mythical uh, idea seems to be selected by Tamanyan. See how similar they are and how right are the, his critics claiming that he, uh, the proletarian architects that criticize him. We started later, Diane. So give me some leeway. He did not uh, hide the fact that he took borrowed elements from the church. This is taken from an academic publication uh, by one of our... that he literally replicated certain things uh, from Yereruik. There are some borrowings. Uh, anyway, so this culture... Culture 1 was then replaced by Culture 2, which uh, is the subject of discussion in Paperni's work. Culture 2 comes to hold this movement in architecture. It freezes, suspends, holds whatever uh, was there and makes it hierarchic. When we look at the buildings, they just add uh, balconies, uh, sort of a hierarchic classification uh, comes about. Not to expand too much, let me illustrate it with the most uh, um, famous example briefly. The palace of councils, which we could really claim is the line uh, after which culture one perishes and culture two uh, emerges. All of the proponents of culture one, they end up marginalized. For example, Moscow's film theater, that was the brilliant work of the constructivist Gevor Kochar. It has nice uh, bare reliefs and ornaments that would it definitely would not have had had it been built earlier. And he built it in the early 30s. Let me also add that these constructivists who were criticizing Tamanyan, many of them, with the exception of Halabian, who sneaks through somehow and becomes a chief architect when in 1931 they create the Architects Association. For many years, he was the first and uh, sitting chairperson of the Architects Association of the Soviet Union, whereas Mazmanyan and Kochar were exiled. Mazmanyan started to build Norilsk already in exile. Thankfully, they both go back from uh, exile, uh, and I'll still say a few words about them. So when this palace of peoples was built, it wasn't built, it was decided to be built. They, they chose a site for it where a 
19th century cathedral was erected dedicated to 1812 uh, patriotic war veterans and victims they just blew it up exactly what we were suspecting Tamanyan would have done. He uh, demolished the Gethsemane chapel for a different um, um, reason. And this is a motto instead of the uh, den of opiate uh, will build a palace. They blew it up. They started to dig the foundations for the largest ever structure that had to epitomize culture too. To get a better idea, this is there were about 160 contributions to the competition of designs, uh, including by Lego Buzier, the first uh, place was awarded to design by Ayofan Shuko and Gel Freich in 1932 this in 1932 the initial drawings were already available and it had to be topped off by the epitome of hierarchic uh, culture to this is this is no longer any egalitarianism there is this important feature here the assumption was that the parade had to go through the palace in the initial idea but this uh, was still a relic of culture one. So it's not incidental that pretty soon in 32, if I'm not mistaken, Ginsburg proposed to build a theater in Sverdlovsk, current day Yekaterinburg. They hold a party meeting there and decide that they should eliminate this pass through. There will be no longer pass through Culture one is completely that is uh, eliminated, eradicated. Let's remember that Tamayan proposed this idea in 1926 when culture two was not yet even in the plan workings. And let me add one more interesting thing to give you idea, an idea about the dimensions that were intended. This is where it had to be built. And the uh, Lenin statue that were to top it off had to be sculpted by Merkurov, who did another one in Yerevan. He was a uh, uh, sculptor of Greek origin, born in Armenia. It had to have the height of uh, 100 meters, and uh, all of the building had to be 420 meters high. There is an interesting uh, episode in this struggle between constructivism and proletari uh, or proletarian uh, architects and Tamanyan. As early as in 1925, Stalin made this famous statement about how new culture should look like. He said, proletarian... It should be proletarian in essence, but national in form. So this was his formulation for the first time in 1925. And the proletarian architects, of course, um, took advantage of this. Later in 1931, he repeats it uh, in a different uh, formulation. Should be socialist in nature and national in form. So the content has to be socialist, the form has to be national. So this is where Tamanyan uh, mounts the horse. And so look at it, this is national in form. It's in the form of uh, Zwart notes. What more national do you want? So it was already possible to look at it in retrospect. All of culture, too, was a look uh, back, not into the future. The future, of course, stayed, but it was already permissible to look back as well. So this was like the symbol in most all successive empires. When I quickly showed you the different designs submitted to the competition for the, one of them was uh, identical to Zikurat. So you could even 
look back at historical empires and incorporating them in the Stalin type culture to structures. Tamanyan also looked back and that was Armenian architecture. So he was fully entitled to quote. He writes in Pravda about it. So he, he won, basically, one may say, in this struggle, although both were using the same uh, grounds. So this temptation of the Palace of Councils that had to be the ultimate uh, structure this temptation, uh, Tamayan was not immune to either uh, or his surroundings. His great-grandchild uh, laments the fact that uh, his uh, uh, great-grandfather has succumbed to that temptation. Gansere did this by his design. And let me also add this. Uh, you see this sculpture. This is uh, the early design. Culture 2 was not yet uh, created. This is end of 20s, early 30s. I didn't find the date on this uh, uh, scaled model. It seems to have been pre-signed of what in Stalinist architecture emerged later. All of these um, high-rise Stalinist structures have these sculptures uh, embellishing them. So Tamanyan designed this uh, interesting thing. You may even guess that uh, it's the opera building in the inside, but on the outside it's something similar to the Palace of uh, councils and Merkur also had to top it off with the statue huh? is it okay to proceed was that a hint for me to i started 20 minutes later that's why okay there will be no questions about this one. Thankfully, this building, they did not even attempt to proceed with this because it would have been extremely expensive and there were some other hazards to be considered. And in recollections of Mazmanyan, who although seriously opposed this and you can see it in archival uh, materials uh, available today. But in his memoirs, when he got back from exile, and they were published in 1960, he recounts uh, how Sahakter Gabrielian summoned him after the exile, who was like the equivalent of a prime minister uh, back then. He liked this design and asked uh, him, should we go ahead with this or not? He wanted to uh, do this uh, to catch up with Moscow. But Mazmanyan told him that he himself uh, admitted that it wasn't worth it. And that played an important role in the final decision. It's very good that this never materialized. Mazmanyan tells that Tamanyan was so happy that he even was uh, leapfrogging two stairs at once uh, from coming out from that office when it became clear it's not going to be built. I'll try to fast forward. The Palace of Councils uh, never materialized either. The Second World War started. They could not spend so much metal on this building, which is why they refrained. Instead, they built the Stalinist high rises, the skyscraper, so to say. This was the first by the same motors predominantly, so it's symmetrical. And I'll briefly reflect on that as well. Instead, they built several uh, similar such Stalinist high-rises. This is known as Stalinist architecture. 
Sometime later down the road, in 1960s, they decide to use the same site for a big swimming pool. And it was uh, very important because culture too, uh, Paperni demonstrates that culture too also requires water. So the university is uh, in the background, the painter saw it better than the photographer, let's put it that way. In the 90s, they eliminated the swimming pool as well and rebuilt, brought back the old uh, cathedral. This, you can very well see it. the gilded cupolas and this was paid for by Zurab Tsereteli who distorted Moscow with his uh, statues. What uh, befell on this design, Tamanyan died in 1936 after a grave depression because his beloved daughter passed away. So they instruct his son, Georg Tamanyan, to complete the project. There is an interesting uh, episode here that even uh, genius architects need good editors. So his son seems to be exactly that, a literate editor. So thankfully this design doesn't materialize. Instead, in 39, they complete that which we already are familiar with. And he decides to eliminate uh, most of his father's culture one ramifications, uh, gets rid of them. And instead of the iron partition, they build a stone wall, symmetrically replicating the other side. The symmetry and the asymmetry, I'll briefly go through is the most symmetric, as you see, is this Lomonos of uh, Moscow State University. The most asymmetric is Tamanyan's Coliseum and Zwartnots hybrid, which his son basically made more symmetric. So his famous uh, building, which is one of Yerevan's brands, as you see, even on backgammon boards, they have it, uh, alongside Zvartnots, on chocolate box designs. So China, when they donated these buses to Yerevan, next to the Great Wall of China, they put this building. So this is uh, uh, equal in its symbolism for Armenia. But this is asymmetric, as you see. And so I can't uh, pin down the architects, but these are the Stalin type architects that claim this is not right, it had to be symmetric. They approached the Secretary General of the party, demanding that things be changed. But here again, the Gevok Tamanyan played his uh, role. He thought this was quite adequate, nothing. And Mark Rikorian also played a role here. He persuaded the Arutun of the first secretary of the party that it should stay as is. Whereas here's what Tamanyan had in mind. There had to be a tower in this section. Our contemporary architects decided to propose their takes on these. But something was missing there. This is a souvenir from the Vernissage where they placed even Ararat right there where the tower belonged. Although is located elsewhere, but this is asking for it. So Tamayan was truly thinking about two towers. 
Here's where the tower should have been. But Mark Gregorian and Sarapian built a different building in 1950, which was completed in 1970. You can see this here, the building, how this one impedes with the other. The assumption was that there should have been two major structures. One was that uh, tower that was never built on the square, and the other should have been the opera. They should have been joined by this axis, you can see it better here, by the Northern Avenue, which has already been opened up nowadays. But this building is still here. It should have resonated with this one. So when there is one already in place, the second one is redundant. This is very similar to those ziggurats that were epitomizing culture too. And it's oh, an almost similar uh, design had been submitted to that competition. So if we're trying to find the reverberations of Stalinist architecture, we look uh, rather here, but not in Tamanian's buildings. So it's not incidental that when Mark Rikorian, after Tamanian's death, took over the completion of the entire square, he also proposed to include water. And here's where we have this pond with singing fountains. Remember, I said that Culture 2 must have had water accompanying it. So, Tamanyan and this is that uh, pool in Moscow. I have to briefly highlight the most important feature of Tamanyan. Tamanyan assumed that this feast celebration, the main procession, had to take place either through his building or uh, in front of it. And all of a sudden, it turned into a reality. In this very same location, here's what transpired, which is now they're trying to replicate as we speak. This is how it started the popular movements in Yerevan. This is the locus. I tried. I have several uh, papers where I can uh, prove that this was a political celebration. It has every feature of a festivity. What he, what he assumed and what his son shut down by eliminating the Colosseum's Wart Notes hybrid uh, became a reality in 1988. Hakop uh, Hakopian, the great painter, shared his impressions of the time. It's a fully festive mood in his 2000 uh, painting. So, and this is my last statement, in fact. Many people tried to claim Tamanyan and rank him with Stalinist architecture, and I tried to demonstrate to you that he is culture too. He is the Armenian take on culture too. Typically Armenian. And this was created, uh, this predated the Stalinist culture to by far. That's the main premise of my communication. And let me add one more thing. He believed uh, that this was predated by an ancient temple uh, of culture. Even being the head of the architecture committee, he did not do any excavation, order any excavation. He did not commission it. So he reverted to explosions to expedite the building. It didn't matter to him to verify whether there was something there. He was so certain of it. And this is typically a typical approach of culture too. Not looking back, looking ahead, but not towards this, towards the heights, the 
huge structures in the Armenian history, which he found in uh, Swartnot. So I thank you for your attention, and I thank Tamanyan for this. Thank you. We've fallen behind. If you have questions, we can at least take one question, I believe. Very well then, if we have no questions, in any case, I believe we have a coffee break down there and we can so let's get back at 11.30. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. <coughs> Dear colleagues, we are continuing the work of our conference. I would like to thank our keynote speaker, Levon Abrahamian, for such a wonderful and interesting presentation. I hope the rest of the day would be as interesting as the beginning. We will be discussing issues related to different aspects of city anthropology. Uh, this part is devoted to the memories in the city, how they are linked. We will start with the spatial remembrance of uh, the genocide and we will also visit some Middle East cities. And to start with, we would like to give floor to Harutun Marutun, director of the Genocide Institute and Museum, and also his chief researcher in our Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography. I would like to remember a work on identity during the Nagorno-Karabakh war, which is directly linked to our today's discussion. I hope Mr. Marwitsyan will present an interesting talk on revaluation of the past and the memories. I also have this hope and hope that this will be actually understood that way. Armenian Genocide Memorial Complex is a site of memory, the situation 55 years ago and nowadays. It seems that the slides do not want to move. Okay. Yerevan is a 2,800-year-old city, one of the eldest cities in the world. At the same time, Yerevan is a young city because it cannot be compared with many other younger cities where you have 100 or 200 year old features which remain untouched. The time never stops and it always leaves its imprint on the architectural image of the city. In some places, social and political developments led to radical change of that image in other places to the Renovation in other places it remain, it's, remains almost unchanged. Uh, I believe Yerevan is among the first category. In this case, because uh, Yerevan is among the first group of, of in this case there are problems related to monuments, different districts, 
historical buildings, complexes to be conserved and protected in many cases. Uh, the solutions are in favor of the developers. In some other cases, there are some new developments due to new situation and environment in which they're located. What kind of developments have taken place as a result of the Armenian Genocide Memorial? At the time when it was founded, it was called uh, Memorial Complex. It was entitled as the main, uh, sorry, as the Memorial Complex for uh, the victims of uh, the Great Massacre 1915 Genocide Victims Memorial. Zizanakabert Memorial Complex, memorial or complex devoted to uh, the victims of a uh, great massacre. And in 1999, the founding director of the Lavrenti Barsegian uh, renamed the memorial. Uh, the Institute's Museum as the Memorial Complex of Great Massacre or the Genocide Museum, but uh, the Institute is in, named as uh, the Institute Museum of Genocide. I believe in uh, the Rhetorics, the change to, from Great Massacre to Armenian Genocide is due to the fact that in 1998, after the political changes, the recognition of international recognition of the Armenian Genocide became one of the most important priorities for the Armenian foreign policy. And this is the memorial complex. You see the two parts. You have a memorial wall. You have... Uh, the part where there is eternal flame, the memorial hall or the complex in uh, the explanatory note in 1965, as described by the architects as uh, the mausoleum. The same as used and uh, the communication on the official opening of the memorial in 1967 on November 29. So it is a 30-meter wide, with 30-meter diameter rotunda mausoleum, and uh, it will be an eternal flame in memory, in memoria of uh, the victims of uh, the genocide. And then uh, it was called the Eternal Temple. So it was rather more appropriate of the Eternal Flame in the Eternal uh, Temple. The 12 pylons resemble the 12 uh, Armenian provinces in the Ottoman Turkey. However, according to architect Sashur, Charyan, it was just an architectural solution. The obelisk in 1965, according to the idea of architects, is entitled Reborn Armenia, and uh, it is about the bright future of the Armenian nature and its creative power. The Stilobat or uh, the memorial wall, the obelisk, and uh, the temple have been uh, drawn following sharp architectural and geometrical objects. It is compared to the Western and Eastern Armenian Great and Minor Ararat. Arad major and Arad minor. The same idea is also expressed in the above mentioned note. Uh, the complex is divided, or the obelisk is divided 
into two parts, which is resembling the division of the two parts of the Armenian nation as a result of tragic events. However, at the top, it is basically symbolizing the unity and the trinity of the Armenian nature as well as, as it is an expression of the firm faith in the bright future of Armenia. Uh, we may assume that in 1965 the architects can, could not fully speak about uh, the Western Armenia. Sashur Kalashian, 50 years later now, again insisted there was no such idea behind this architectural solution. But the idea of creating this obelisk is uh, related and linked to the text of the brochure, explanatory note. So the first uh, significant intervention on the boundary of the memorial complex happened in 1988 on April 24th. It was linked to the mass massacres of the Armenians on February 27-29 of 1988 in Sumgayet near Baku. It was uh, response of Azerbaijan to uh, the self-determination of the Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh and their desire to reunite with the Republic of Armenia. The purpose was to terrorize Armenians and also the Soviet authorities with the prospect of bloody events and force them to actually refrain from just solution of the Armenian cause. There was also another development. Uh, massacres in Sumgait were in Armenian mind, the same as uh, the Gen Armenian genocide in 1915-22. One of those reactions was the installation of the Armenian Hajkar cross stone at the boundary of the Armenian genocide memorial on April 1988 when there was martial law in Yerevan and all mass events were prohibited. In 1990, uh, the municipality of uh, Yerevan erected an other cross stone devoted to the memory of uh, those who were massacred in 1990 from January 13, 1990 to Baku, in Baku. And the third one was uh, erected and devoted to the victims of uh, massacre in 1988 in Ganzak. This is the memorial, the, the cross stone to Ganzak, and the previous one was devoted to Baku, the three cross stones together, and always those cross stones are covered with flowers. During the April, April memorial march, uh, a lot of flowers are being brought to the complex on January 20, 13, 20, and February 27 to 29. Uh, people also organize meetings and special events in memory of uh, victims of Sumgai, Baku, and Kirovabad massacres. And calls for recognition and restitution are being heard. In, 20, in 2020, in 2021, January and February, uh, those events were attended by uh, the top political leaders of the country. Uh, usually, the cortege of the high-level officials visiting the memorial from foreign countries, president and prime minister of different countries, speakers of different parliaments are stopped at the three cross stones, and then the director of the museum explains the meaning of those uh, cross stones, and then explains the meaning of the memorial complex, and presents uh, the history of the Armenian genocide in 1915-20 in Ottoman Empire, and then also 
representing the story of 1988-1990, a massacres in the Soviet Azerbaijan, which happened about 70 years later. So this is an attempt to show the link between these events as well as uh, the firm memory of Armenians about those genocidal events. Those massacres simply witness about the fact that at the end of the 20th century, the leaders of Soviet Azerbaijan continue uh, the policy of Armenian genocide, which was first implemented by their ancestors from Ottoman Turkey, using the same tools. Uh, there are also pine trees which are planted there by different organizations and representatives of different states. So special wise they precede the memorial park. They precede the complex and they're located in the memorial park. In 1997, two years after the establishment of the Institute Museum, the first uh, tree, which was then a cider, then replaced by a pine tree, was planted by the U.S. Senator Bob Doe in uh, memoria of uh, orthopedic the surgeon Juan Ketikian, who saved his hand, which was wounded during the Second World War. According to the protocol on uh, the visit of the heads of the foreign states to the Republic of Armenia, there is a ritual of placing flowers at the memorial complex as well as planting a tree. Until now, 41 official and non-official representatives of different states, presidents, prime ministers, speakers of the parliament and others have planted 210 pine trees in the memorial park. Actually, we had more than 210, unfortunately. Some of the points have not survived and they have been uprooted. So you have also plugs in Armenian and English uh, stating who planted the tree in, in what year and what state that person represented. Those are the trees planted by high level visitors. Why this memorial? Grove actually was created. In 1965, uh, the Armenian Genocide Re International Genocide Recognition of the in Armenian Genocide started in 1965, but it was stagnant. So in 75, it was recognized by Cyprus, and only in 1991, after uh, September 21, Armenia again regained its independence, 29 other uh, states official recognized the Armenian genocide. On August 23, 1990, the Parliament of Armenia adopted its independence declaration, and out of 12 points, the penultimate one states that the Republic of Armenia is pursuing the international recognition of the Armenian Genocide of 1915 in Ottoman Empire. Uh, the, the Independence Declaration was the basis for uh, the Constitution of Armenia. So the Armenian Genocide in its international recognition becomes one of the main foreign policy directions for Armenia. So, it is an attempt to move uh, the recognition of Armenian genocide beyond the Armenian coast and make it an international issue. So, and uh, there was an important contribution in this regard made by the Armenian genocide complex. So, different official delegations visit and live, but uh, the best way of remembering the Armenian genocide is to plant a tree, because planting a tree is a 
memoria as a way of expressing empathy and sympathy or keeping a memory of a person alive or even overcoming death by life is a well-known symbol. When uh, the tree is a pine tree, then it means that it's an eternal memory. It is beyond time. So you see President Macron planting a tree, Foreign Minister of India. So uh, the establishment of the memorial growth uh, actually gives a new quality to uh, the Armenian Genocide Memorial Complex, moving it to the global level. So the idea that was in Armenian mentality that it is a global tragedy is actually expressed also through the memorial growth. Planting of the pine trees is not one-time action, because after many years, not only public officials, but also people who represent the same state or heads of new delegations visiting the memorial grove actually watered the trees planted by their predecessors, showing that uh, they still respect the memory of Armenian victims. Valery Pekres from Ile de France, this is Garibashvili, Prime Minister of Georgia. In our view, the memorial grove remains a powerful tool to move the Armenian genocide to a global level. Sasha Kalash in one of his interviews indicates that the memorial wall was built because on the left side there were some private houses on the left side and this long wall was built in order to separate the complex from uh, their houses. The second life was given and the wall received a meaning when 52, the names of the 52 large cities and settlements with the Armenian population have been engraved. Those were the cities in which the Armenian population was exterminated and they went on death marches or were massacred. And they are starting from the west, from Constantinopolis, and moving to the east, to Derzor. That's the principle they followed. And uh, the survivors of the victims from those places bring in place flowers under the names of their cities. The Arbekir, previous one was Mush, this one is Adana. So, and uh, you see that we have flowers under the names of many of those cities. The memorial wall or the wall of memory, it justifies its name also in another way. Since 1906 until 2012, we have also Soil brought from uh, the graves of uh, those political leaders, intellectuals, missionaries that have raised their voice in to protect uh, the Armenians and also had contribution to the survivor of Anatole France, James Bryce, Johannes Lepsius, etc. So it's in the back of the memorial wall. So we ensure the worldwide presence here. At the end of uh, the wall, in the front part of the memorial wall, we have the graves of five Armenian freedom fighters who died in, 20, in 1990, 1992. So those are actual graves.
And this is due to the fact that a memorial complex is also resembling a kind of graveyard. So people, this is from this year, by the way, people bring flowers. These five graves are the only symbol of fight for freedom in the area of complex, all attempts to install some plugs with information near the graves are being refused by the architects of the complex. According to our estimation, uh, more than 100,000 Armenians and foreign visitors a year are being deprived of a possibility or opportunity to learn about the fight for freedom in Nagorno-Karabakh at the end of the 20th century, also the of the opportunity to look at uh, the issue of the Armenian genocide and prospect and see how it is linked to uh, the developments at the end of the 20th century. Uh, memorial complex is not a static monument, it lives with own life, which is basically due to the fact that it is following the changes that happen, which are happening in uh, the social and political life of the people. Very often, uh, those developments are opposed by the architects of the complex. They use uh, the argument that this complex was built as a monument, which excludes any possibility of additions to the existing memorial complex I exhausted the time that I had been given and thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morochan. At the end of the panel, we will have an opportunity for questions and discussion. There will be also a uh, discussion. Professor Machola Molika will present some feedback and then there will be also a possibility for Q&A. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, uh, Professor Marcello, he is this. Yes, can you hear me? Well, yes, uh, you are welcome. But uh, uh, but the end, uh, you will have possibility to discuss all the paper together. No, I will comment at the end. Okay. Hajort Mesh Hura. Our next guest is Gohar Stepanyan. She is from the Archaeology and uh, Ethnology, Ethnography Institute, cultural anthropologist. She is focused on traditional and contemporary leisure and festive uh, pastimes. In the last year, she was involved in looking at the uh, collecting field materials about uh, exiles from Shushi in Karabakh and recording those materials. So on the basis of these fresh findings, she will now submit the results of her study. Mm -hmm. uh, Unfortunately, Mr. Marutian's uh, presentation carries on about national tragedy, wars. This is about a city with which I have a personal connection. It's not only the residents of Sushi that have a personal connection to it, but also every Armenian throughout the world. When in 1992, May 9, Sushi went under the control of Armenian armed forces and Armenians started to resettle back there. As a result of military activities, the city was in ruins and it had, with, it had very <clears throat> shaky security. It was misty, cold, rainy, total lack of infrastructure or utilities. It was far from being ideal for residents it didn't, it lacked security, it lacked comfort, and its uh, appurtenance was shaky. Anything associated with a home uh, was lacking in a larger scale. 
settlement in particular towns. But only 28 years later, as a consequence of the 2020-44 day war, in the urban narrative of those who were exiled from Shushi, we still feel the great love that they have amassed in this small town with a big love. Small city, big love is a Facebook post that characterizes the city by one of the former uh, dwellers of Suti. This is the best attestation there too. Over the years, the Shushi people had acquired the connection to the place, a significant experience was amassed. If we look at the Settelo's typology of connection with the locus, one may say that my communication today or the presentation is dedicated to the loss of the place, loss of the location. Of course, uh, economic, etiological, and religious or sacral connection types with Shushi are not excluded either. The objective of this communication is to see, to demonstrate that the basis of connection to the city was its perception as a home and as a household. In the history of uh, displacement, the lost uh, native land, the exodus, uh, and the idealization of it up to the idyllic heavenly portrayal is typical, and this can be seen also in the narrative of the Shushe Tsis. But there is also a realistic foundation for this, for the connection to the city. It's, it, it was its perception as a household, as a family, we did this study right in the wake of the war, shortly thereafter. I started in December 2020, the field work, all the way through October. The methodological route was oral histories accompanied by mental mapping. Our respondents were displaced Shushi dwellers who had mostly been put up temporarily in Yerevan. Those were originally former Shushi residents who from the early onset of the conflict had to be exiled and then returned as well as relative newcomers. Predominantly, there were women and what I portray may be even qualified as a we must take on the city. This particular study focused on the newcomers to, Suti, to the city who, in, at the onset of the Karabakh city, were resettled, displaced from the Armenian populated areas in Karabakh and resettled in Shushi. This was not a homogeneous group. There, the uh, interweaving of the cities and their personal stories start with looking for a house in Shusi and settling down, which is very typical for Armenians, creating a hearth, a home. Mostly this was done through the first experience of walking around the city and getting to know it. In the narratives and in the mental maps, one can notice that the city was presented from the vantage point of one's own home. And the road of searching for a home originates there. This is not specific to Shushi. Yes. Uh, in general, every uh, in every description of a settlement, this is characteristic uh, in mental mapping, to start with one's home. But in the event of Shushi, the city not only starts with one's home, but it uh, gathers around and is uh, sort of created or built uh, by the pattern of a home, a household and family. Uh, this is a typical quote from one of our dialogues. I want to emphasize that there was a time when my sister's and son, Vahag, used to work in David's retail shop, right at this junction. Down there was my brother, a cab driver, who was parking his car. When I got out in the morning, my road passed uh, by the taxi stop near Razanchetsot's Cathedral, and this was my sister's uh, 
apartment building, five stories, four or five stories building, one after the other in the third. Um, my uncle, my mother, my brother's family all lived in the same building and the uh, entrances were different. They, my brother worked at Telecom and was a cab driver for some time when I was heading to my work. Every morning, uh, for some reason, I recall the summer mornings with a clear and bright summer morning in some otherworldly way. I was feeling so well that I uh, welcomed, greeted Vag every day. Then my brother, my sister, I encountered them. I had this feeling that these moments were uh, unique and might one day never repeat. And that's how it worked out. I always felt that things could not have been so well so in this passage, we see how this woman presents her daily uh, routine pathway through the city, which not only completes the city and its mental map uh, displays the landmarks of the city, such as the Razan Chetzot's building, the administration building, the famous junction in Shushi, the buildings that were at the junction. She brings together her extended family uh, along her daily route and her mental map. This plays also the uh, family kinship relations and landmarks. The sisters' home, uncle's entrance, the brother's cap stop. In general, in almost all of our mental maps, one could see a similar pattern focusing on the kinship in mapping the personal city, especially for newcomers in Shushi who were completely new and were breathing a life into the city through them in recognizing the city, the birth of their kids and their early years are emphasized by the famous uh, idea of the circle. Everything starts through walking for the city uh, in the, uh, creating uh, as a way of creating the urban space. In the event of Shushi, this is materialized in the literal, uh, literally first steps that the toddlers born there were taking. It's remarkable that those who have left the traces of their first steps in Shushi, those who were born there are reserved the right to return to Shushi one day and breathe life in it one day. This is a sense of a mission. In the loss of the city, being the birthplace of the one's own children, this also is important by throwbacks to the past cultural historic significance of Shushi. One woman tells us Shushi is an ancient uh, location replete with museums and historical sites. My kids were born there, they spent their childhood there, and in this respect, she uh, juxtaposes Shushi even to Stepanakert. Even in the Artsakh overall context, Shushi is classified among small towns. As of 2017, Stepanakert had 56.6 thousand population, Shushi only had 5.3 thousand. But However small it was in territory and population, it has always had a specific significance for us Armenians, beginning with the early 20th century. It was called the Little uh, Caucasian Paris, Little Armenian Paris. These characteristics best describe the trading, uh, artisanal and cultural center that Shushi was. Uh, this side of 90s, the Shush Shushi restored its significance and the image of a pan-Armenian focus. The attention focused on it. People were performing their most personal rites, baptism, christening, weddings in Shushi. It became a pilgrimage site for Armenians, one may say so. As for native Shushi residents, it's very specific in the quote by this woman that her national cultural historical factors alongside these appear her children's birthplace as another major weighty factor. Shushi mothers and women's narratives best demonstrate 
As Lynch says, uh, their contribution uh, to the readability of the city and what an axis in it is the birth of the children. It's very characteristic. Uh, some of their ideas I have quoted here. And it's remarkable that they say this, they started to know the city only after the birth of their children. One woman who settled there in the 90s said, I started to understand and feel so she, only after the birth of my child, who is only six now, she says today, I recall more the sushi of my kid, the playground where we played every day, the toy shop that for him was an ideal fairy tale place. Uh, we can't find anything to replace it, not even in Stepanakert, not even in Yerevan, nowhere else in the world. Uh, rather than recalling her daily route that cut, cut through the <clears throat> city. This city, uh, feeling it, the trend of feeling it through one's own offspring more often than not turned into identifying the town with one's own kids. This is expressed by gauging the age of the city similar to the age of the children. I love sushi like my kids. It appeared in my life after birth of my children. Uh, we resettled and my kids were born. In some other case, you take care of the city like you would for your kids. Sushi is like uh, my kids for me. It emerged in my life only once they were born and we took care of it like we did for our kids. So they put the city up back on their feet together with their kids. The newcomers with newly formed families prevailing among them. This was very important in the familial perception of the city. They put back Shushi on its feet, caring for it, or as one of the respondents typically described, we were putting it together morsel by morsel in the 90s. What she meant is that in their courtyards, basements, attics, whenever they found something, a piece of rock uh, or a piece of wood or pottery, they thought it may have had historical significance. They collected it all carefully and handed it over to the museum, restoring the Armenian history of Shushi, which within the last century had been interrupted more than once, <coughs> once trying to complete and put back this history together. And here I would like to emphasize that in this respect, the dwellers of Shushi were particularly involved in building the city, in designing, one may say it, in creating it. The fact that in the West, in the 70s of the 20th century, especially the human dimension of the city, were emphasized in the urbanistic theories, emphasizing the involvement of the citizens, of the dwellers in the design, in the development of the cities. This happened in Shushi in and of itself, sporadically, spontaneously. The citizens of the city were involved in creating, building the city themselves. Uh, and this quote is also very characteristic in that if they were uh, resembling the city to their kids, once it's lost, it becomes a an infant, the most helpless and unprotected creature that they try to keep, preserve, and uh, make safe through their thoughts. These two motives I wanted to emphasize in attaching significance to the city. We see how concurrently in parallel the city child, the household nature of the city is ascribed importance to in one case and then the other its historical past. This photograph that was taken at is one of the most circulated ones closer to the end of the Artsakh war. It is entitled The Smiling Children of Shushi. Best captures and visualizes 
the so important axis uh, emphasized in the narratives of Shushi, the familial aspects and the historic nature. They're on the background of the Razan Chetzot's cathedral as a cultural historical symbol. And the kids are not just friends, they're siblings. Two siblings with their cousin. This attitude of the city, putting it together morsel by morsel subsequently has led to the personal perception of the entire space of the city, all public spaces. For example, <clears throat> they're shaken when they present how the Armenian authorities have once visited on occasion of some uh, celebration, the main square, where they usually organized all such festivities for the first time. Access was shut off to the main square and the people did not have access. They presented this as something out of the ordinary that had never happened before. And the same attitude prevailed towards uh, numerous educational cultural establishments of Shushi. They were perceived as uh, some uh, extension of one's house with free access where youngsters and kids were involved not like they're done in the other cities based on their preferences or talent but everyone is uh, simply in an integral part of those establishments Narekatsi Arts Union, Music School, Athletic School they were all uh, part and parcel of their lives and in conclusion if I attempt to say what made this city the way it was one may safely claim that first and foremost it was of the small scale of it and its pedestrian nature of course in shushi there was just one public transport route but people were mostly walking uh, around they preferred that and it contributed both to the readability and uh, sporadic improvisational nature of the town uh, if we use the terminology of the Serto. by walking through the city they rather than following the spatial patterns they chose themselves alternative shortcuts uh, scenic routes in the mental maps you can encounter shortcuts uh, scenic routes uh, one of the youngest respondents, a 13-year-old girl, said that she, together with her friends walking to school every day, preferred the scenic route, which passed nearby the uh, woods, which is why they preferred it. So their daily, by daily movement uh, through the city, they breathed life into the space and made the city live. And the second circumstance was the concurrent nature of creating a family and the city. Like I said, the demographics of Shushi determined that. And this also determined the third factor. There were no uh, extended social kinship relations that we're well aware of elsewhere. And more often than not, these were replaced by neighborly, links uh, educational cultural institution established links working relation work relations especially about neighborly relations people uh, recall these with particular warmth and in their mental maps and they particularly <coughs> flag the houses of neighbors and uh, uh, with captioning them with their names the neighbors seem to be replacing the extended families grandparents that you could leave the kids safely with and go to work you name it and in the event of one shushi woman uh, granny julia she seemed to have been the uh, grandmother of all shushetsi she was nurse in the hospital then the cook she died uh, right in the wake of displacement because of coronavirus and if we look at the Facebook entries and posts after her death, everyone was unanimous in recalling the meals she cooked, the good 
care they took of everyone in the hospital. She was the quintessential granny figure of for all Shushi people. Since we have a little more time left in the event of Shushi, the connection to the locus ascribes importance not as much to one's home as to the town itself. The basis of connection to the locus is deemed to be the home, but not in the event of Shushi. When in the 90s they settled in Shushi, they preferred not to choose the houses formerly occupied by Azeris. They were avoiding this. Many did not put up with the Azeri past of those houses, which cannot be claimed about the city as a whole, although it was a divided city beginning with the um, middle of the 19th century with its upper Armenian and lower uh, Turkic belonging, but its overall appurtenance did not uh, pose any questions for the Shushetsis. It's an often encountered idea. Even if my house is completely raised to the ground, uh, I would like to return back and rebuild it, go back to my Shushi. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gohar, for an exciting presentation. We will reshuffle our agenda a little. And we can now accept questions. Um, the author will take notes of the questions and then answer at the end of the session. You mentioned that Sushi was the second, second city in Armenia. Or did I overhear it? No, you didn't. It would be interesting also to mention that there were eight daily newspapers published there in the Armenian script. I think there was a need to mention that in the preamble. I think these two items had to be mentioned that after Alexandra Ball, it was the second, used to be the second city in Armenia. And maybe that was an omission, but let me clarify. What about the Shushi massacres? The, one of the two main reasons for the Shushi massacres in 1920 was not only the desire to get rid of Armenians, not only to ethnically purge it, there was a military objective to this. It's common knowledge now that Shushi has uh, even the school kids know that that Shushi has an overwhelming position looming over the valley. So in military terms, roads and water to this day have utmost significance. So maybe you could have mentioned that or even drawn parallels with today's they ascended and they took over the three basins of our source of water. These are so profound topics that open up. Whereas current reality, even 10, if 10 people were to scratch the surface, could not exhaust it. Thank you very much. I'll answer later. Other questions? <laughs> Other questions? I'll make a small comment about the children. Apart from the symbolic, when the child is there, you have to, you're connected to the space. Uh, you're, and the same issue exists when I was collecting field material from the Syrian Armenians. If a kid goes to a kindergarten, preschool, or school, the kid stays, the whole family stays put. This is a subject of a different discussion. Thank you for the presentation. Is that the question? Uh, have you ever looked at the 
attitude children have to the city. We have heard about the adults. And we have done that analysis, of course. If there are no more questions, let's give floor to the next presenter, Mr. Hakov Cholakian. Mr. Cholakian is from the Institute of Ethnography and Archaeology, chief researcher, has a PhD. It looks at ethnography and a wide spectrum of other issues as well, and in, within the framework of his wide interest, I will be presenting the city of Latakia from the mid-19 to the early 20th century. Please, you may start your presentation. Uh, you asked me why Latakia, because uh, for the Far East part of Armenian diaspora, Latakia with Antiochus was one of the most important Armenian centers, specifically a spiritual center. So this role is still played by the city for a part of the Syrian-Armenian diaspora. On the map you see the eastern part of the Mediterranean, across the Cyprus you see the island of Cyprus, you see a well-known seaport, Latakia, used by Phoenicians. Latakia is one of the most important Syrian ports, and uh, by according to the rumors, it has about 1.5 million population now. So this is one of the most ancient settlements in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, known as Phoenician Ramatan. During the Seleucids in the fourth century before Christ, it was rebuilt and called Laodike, and it is known as one of the three cities built on the hill. So since its foundation, it never lost its importance. It was called Laodis, Latakia, Laskia, and Armenians were call it, calling it Ladik. Latakia was occupied by Tigran the Great, then Romans, and then by Byzantines, Omayyads, Abbasians, and Fatimians, then Seljuks, Crusaders, Elupians, and then Mamluks, and since 1512 until 1918, it was part of the Ottoman Empire. In the beginning of the 19th century, it was predominantly a Muslim city, and it was preoccupied by Sun, Sunni Arabs, Kurds. Alawis were the majority of the population, but they were absolutely deprived of any rights, and they didn't have even the status of millet or community known in the Ottoman Empire, because they were mu Muslims, but they were rejected by Shias and Sunnis. There were also uh, Greeks in the city, or Horoms, as they were called, Maronites and Armenians, which have lost uh, the numbers and the influence. Since the 12th century AD, no longer the Armenian 
diocese of Latakia is remembered and found in any of the documents. Uh, a Jerusalem Patriarchate of the Armenian Church built in 1755, uh, special Kitum, if you use the Arab word, for uh, the pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem and the Saint Mother of God Chapel. The house built for uh, the pilgrims was then taken over but by the ruler of Latakia and turned that into an arsenal. And such seizure happened also in 1819 and 1826. And the soldiers have demolished and then sold uh, the assets and the property of the house. And similar events have been happening of over and over. This is the entrance to the Armenian Church, Armenian Apostolic Church of the Saint Mother of God, the church itself inside. <coughs> this is one of the holes inside the house for pilgrims, which is now serving as a hole for the school built next to this house, and sometimes it is a reception hall. The College of Inter uh, Translators, which was actually built in the inner yard of the church. Latakia was a provincial city surrounded by agricultural lands. The Armenians, Greeks, Turkmens, Kurds, Alawites, and Sunni Arabs. The predominant majority were working as Marabas, or wage workers. They were deprived of own land. And the agricultural produce was then collected by Turkmen and Kurd rulers. In the districts, there were some Armenian, Greek, and Alawit landowners, such as in Musaller, Aramo region, and Kesab. In 1832, Ibrahim Pasha from Egypt takes over Syria, including Latakia, and he builds in Latakia an arsenal. During 10 years of his rulership, introduced major reforms in the country. He actually relieved Christians from carrying customs duties, which were heavy ones, called Ufar, Die, and Chia. Uh, limited the rights of uh, the leaders of the communities to take over uh, the agricultural produce from uh, the farmers and limited the discretionary powers, established justice in different parts of the city and reconciled uh, different communities, Christian and Alawites, have received additional rights. So the rural population in general, and the Christian specifically, actually benefited from those reforms. And uh, after him, the reforms were so well grounded that they were irrevocable. This is Ibrahim Pasha by painting by Lefebvre, a French painter. Latakia had three main districts. The first one was called Sleepe or the cross, 
Until the 11th century, it was the center of a Greek city, probably one of the main centers of Laodike from the Selefkian time. <laughs> the other one was Gala or the fortress, and Oeni. Uh, or the spring. In Slepe, in the small cross, they were Arab, Turkish, and Kurdish community leaders and traders. In near the port, they were European traders and European. Consul, consuls and embassies were located, consuls were living and embassies were located. Slepe was the eldest, the, the most ancient city, and there were also some Christian small districts for Maronites and Latin Christians or Catholics. During the Ramadan in the evening times, uh, the people are flooding the streets and visiting restaurants, cafes, and in Gala, in uh, the fortress, we have uh, we have that uh, district located in, on the hill, and they basically celebrate here, eat Atta and eat Fatr, and Armenian House of Pilgrims located here, and there are also Arsenal, and uh, Ramadan Canon. Uh, the houses are two story, all built of stone. There is Karadrus, which is my place of birth, and there is also Selefke, which is near to near Musale, a bit above Latakia. Uh, it had 15,000 population in 1860s. So here you see some uh, remnants from the Selkids Sil times, Selefkian time, and uh, they're quite well preserved inside Lataki. This is Bacchus. Arc. In the center, the Presbyterian missionaries have settled in the center of Latin and in uh, the center of the city. So they brought some educational, healthcare, social, and cultural changes. So Europe came to Latakia. They have established a Catholic and Protestant communities out. Uh, the proselytes, they were protected by the Europeans. So the main reason for proselytism was to be better protected. And this movement reached enormous levels. If you look at the Kesab province, 70% were Protestant. <coughs> I'm sorry, this is the Latin church across the port. It's a marvelous building. The evangelical church was built, was composed of uh, the Armenians. Greeks and Alois, Alois. Many Alois became either Protestants or Catholics. It was led by the American Presbyterian missionaries, which entered this place in 1856. In 1860, uh, the community had its kindergarten, elementary school, secondary school, and then girls' college and there were also some branches in the rural areas, basically Armenians, Greeks, and Talo, which have benefited from this. 
Uh, the Presbyterian missionaries have also established the hospital, which is known as the Dr. Palfis, or as American Hospital, and it was the only one until the Syrian independence. Those uh, schools and healthcare buildings were new development architecturally, and they were representing the Western urban development expressions in Latakia. The changes have been also noticed in the daily life and in the dressing code. At the same time, we had U.S., Russian, French, British and Italian consulates located in Latakia, and it became one of the became the center of Mutasarif, Mutasarif, which is a province under Beirut. In 1862 and 1863, the city was the first where the telegraph was built, telegraph communication was built, and it was widely used to communicate with other parts of the world. This is a picture of 1880s from girls attending a, a college in Latakia. This is a school which was attended by students from different nationalities until now. It is standing and it has had a great contribution to the life of Latakia. It is Gul Jalaji school nowadays. Latake also started to cultivate tobacco, and uh, the monopoly was given to Latake Tobacco Company, which was monopolist in tobacco production. Since 1870, it was uh, turned to a French company, but the uh, Cultivation started at the time of Ibrahim Pasha. The Armenians were basically managing this French company in 1892. Khan Tukhan was built, which is uh, the Khan of Tobago, where uh, Tobago was collected and then exported. It was about 20 ships to taking Tobacco out of Latakia to Egypt and Europe and then to the U.S. Khan Tuhan is a Latakia, Latakia museum nowadays. This is the main building of the museum and you see the Hellenistic statues and other remnants in front of the museum. So at the time when you visit Latakia, if you visit Latakia, go and see this museum, you would definitely find many interesting items and exhibits from Armenian community and of Armenian origin. So Latakia cuisine maintained its national characteristic. So Armenians, Greeks, Kurds, and Turkmens, and, and Arabs had their own cuisines. And this was rather evident uh, during the folk festivals as well as other celebrations. So some you were visiting your Arab and other friends to eat special dishes you, which you will never cook in an Armenian house, and they were doing the same, so it was impossible. Hummus are full in the Armenian family, because we would say that this is an Arab food, take it away, but uh, the same Armenians were going and visiting their Arab friends to eat hummus and full in their houses. Latakia is also a city of sweets. So when we were saying bring Eastern uh, meant to go to Latakia and bring back kunefa with cheese, 
also pumpkin preserve etc so there is the song hey lilac haji lilac hinoletek bizetek utumi burmu which means Go to Latakia and bring Burma back. Because Latakia was of interest for archaeologists, the Latin and Presbyterian missionaries, as well as uh, councils from the Western countries, organized some excavations and they found different remnants and exhibits which were then exported to different museums in the world in 1860 at this in 1860 uh, who has donated 300 pieces of gold sent those to uh, sorry who found 300 pieces of gold coins had sent them to uh, Vatican and they are now in the Vatican Museum uh, those were basically of the made of the copper and bronze and fortunately Unfortunately, many of uh, the ancient buildings were destroyed. In 1820, the excavation started in Olami, and fortunately, this monument has survived. And this is an Ugarit Phoenician building. Many Armenians have actually had different high positions in the offices, and one of them for, was from Mestro Puplin from Smyr Smyrna, who was the director of the Tobago company, who did a lot in order to organize and keep the faithful remnant of the Armenian Apostolic Church away from the evangelical proselytism. So, inspectors from Latakia had organized uh, missions to Latakia, Antioch, and Antioch and many other cities in order to organize national colleges and national schools and in order to also keep the Armenian Apostolic faith alive. I have looked also at the issues related to the earthquakes, different plugs, etc. So very often we hear about uh, the earthquake of 1822 and 1873 in Antiochus. In 1873, it was a famous earthquake in Antiochus, which also shook Latakia, and there is an inscription at this about 38 kilometers from this inscription found 38 kilometers away from Latakia to the north. Latakia was also a place of robbery and inter-religious inter massacres. There were massacres in uh, 1860s when Christians were subjected to Muslim attacks. The Armenian church in Damascus was demolished in 1909 in April and in April, May. Kesab was attacked. About 30,000 people have attacked them, and uh, 7,500 people from Kesab found refuge in Latakia. And uh, they stayed there for 10 days, and in order to escape 
from contagious diseases, which were at that time, and infections at that time quite widespread in Latakia, returned to the homes. The head of the Latakia court, Yusuf Hakim, said that he had received an order from Jamal Pasha to arrest all Armenian officials to take them to and Aleppo, and only Yakub Sayer has been saved, as Hakim said, and others will simply shot to death. In November 5, those who were in uh, the house of pilgrims with uh, the spiritual pastor of the parish have been marched to death. In 1919, on June 6, only for 10 people who have survived have been found. In November, in November 1918, the French Legion and Armenian forces together entered Latakia, then it was French mandate over this part of Syria, and then in 1946, the Syrian Independent Republic was established, and Latakia becomes one of the most prosperous and quickly developing cities of uh, Syria with a large Armenian population. We can collect some questions and then Mr. Cholakin will have a chance to answer to those questions. I apologize, but uh, he is not speaking into the mic, so it's very difficult for me to hear what he's saying. Gana, <laughs> 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 Thank you, Mr. Cholakian. Assistant Professor from the Armenian American University in Armenia, Zarwiki Burgo, House of Memories, Oral Memories.
Uh, ignoring the enormous heritage of the Soviet Union left behind is an impossible task when you live in a post-Soviet country. Neighborhoods, buildings, interiors, home objects, they all carry the memory of the Soviet past. By successfully using material culture, personal and shared spaces, the Soviet Union managed to create a collective Soviet identity for people from drastically different backgrounds. From spoon shapes to buildings and their locations, they all enforce an emotional connection to the Rodzina, the motherland. Now, the Soviet Rodzina is long gone, but the connection to the physical spaces and materials, it persists. To this day, many Armenians uh, live in Soviet Khrushchevkas. They inherited from their parents. They use the same utensils and furniture that's been there for ages. In the age of capitalism, when individuality is highly propagated, the spaces have lost their initial symbolism. They no longer enforce the Soviet ideology of a collective, but rather they silently carry the remnants of it. I personally was born way into post-Soviet independent Armenia, but nonetheless, in my daily routine, I experienced firsthand the heritage of the Soviet Union. Be it the phrases I use in my everyday life or the bed I sleep in, these are all in one way or the other influenced by the long gone Soviet state. This influence is a continuation of the previously enforced into emotional connection while living in a visually changed and modern city, the urban life on the inside is often unknowingly connected to the Soviet era. And this Soviet memorabilia ultimately becomes the transporter of the Soviet past into our present. I see this object as a part of my life. I create memories and have stories connected with them. But at the same time, these objects are essential part of my parents and my grandparents' lives as well. Now these objects have their own memories, they tell their own stories. These objects, they tell stories and become a part of an intergenerational conversation. My research study and an art installation born out of it follows and delves deep into the stories and memories. They explore collective memory in a context of household objects and items and present them through an interactive experience in a Soviet department that is now often lost in a contemporary landscape of Yerevan. There's a good story about why I decided to do this project. One evening, my mother and I uh, were talking and she was telling me how the chairs we use in our house were the first thing my father and her bought when they got married. She was telling me a story how some of the chairs got lost during transportation, how some of them broke down and later they were going around buying identical chairs from strangers to fill in the set. That is how I started thinking, how interesting it is that many people all around Soviet Union had identical furniture, identical households and perhaps even seemingly identical lives. This conversation gave birth to a research which later became uh, the base for my capstone in the American University of Armenia in 2021. People living on ends of the Soviet Union had identically furnished, identically designed apartments. The Soviet interior individualism was framed by the standardized objects that were available all around the Union. Yes, factories provided a slightly wider choice, but more or less, be it in Kazakhstan, Armenia, or Ukraine, resident owned similar items, thus contributing to the strengthening of the Soviet ideology. Uh, when starting this research, I got curious to find out how people from former USSR countries connect with their objects, why and how they pass from one generation to the other, and what stories do these objects tell. As a result, my research turned into a creative project. Unlike the Western consumerist culture, the Soviet socialist citizens were tightly attached to their everyday objects. Ordinary clothing was hard to find, so every item was cherished and used until its very, very end. When a shirt, for example, had a hole in it, you would patch it repeatedly until it was impossible to add patches on it anymore. And even then, you would not throw it away. You would turn it into a cloth and use it for another two years. This immortalization of everyday objects created a special connection with every item one possessed. These items were also often passed from one generation to the other. There were not always things of significant material value, uh, but they indeed possessed substantial emotional value to the person. This emotional connection later evolved uh, into a multi-generational nostalgia for times long gone and for times that were never experienced. This nostalgia and the strong connection to the past often lies in these exact stories connected to, uh, to these preserved objects. Unfortunately, many researchers lack personal stories and examples on this topic. Thus, this topic seems too vague and intangible. My work explores stories of everyday household objects carry and how they become memorable, valuable memorabilia. 
Through an oral history approach, I collect stories of three generations and explore the connection between an individual and a material possession, specifically focusing on Soviet Union memorabilia. This research later turned into an art installation and it showed people personal stories and how they travel throughout the years and how they differ in each generation. It explores the very notion of nostalgia and its role in the shaping of the post-Soviet society. The idea behind this project is based on personal experiences and stories. It explores the intergenerational connection with material objects and thus puts them on display with each other. My main method of research was in-depth interviews conducted with carefully selected interviewees. To provide the project with relevant information and show the aforementioned connection, I carefully chose seven people representing three generations, each differently affected by the Soviet Union. It's the Soviet generation, the Perestroika generation, and what I called the generation after. The two interviewees of the Soviet generation were the first group representing the early Soviet era. Donald Rayleigh describes this generation as the Soviet baby boomers. These are people who witnessed the transformation of the Union from a totalitarian Stalinist regime to a lighter hush of thought. Unlike their parents and grandparents, they did not witness the revolution and the world wars, but instead they spent their formative days in a clearly defined, functioning and normalized Soviet Union. They grew up with the Soviet ideology embedded in them, and they are perhaps the ones who form the deepest connection with the Union and the details of it. Oftentimes, people from so-called Soviet generation remember the Soviet times fondly. They miss the stable, more simpler times of the Soviet era. Svetlana Boyem describes this as the longing, uh, described this longing as restorative nostalgia. Uh, the stories this interview is told uh, were often revolved around the safety and the stability and the overall peace in the Soviet Union that they felt. If you could hear these stories taken out of context, you would think that the Soviet Union was a heaven on earth. But as we went deeper into, deeper into the interviews, they all tried to step out of their idealized memory and they were able to tell a story from a more rational and interesting perspective. Uh, the poignant part of both interviews was uh, when my interview is reflected on the permanence of objects. One of my interviewees put it beautifully and said, the interesting thing about objects is that they often, often the person is not there anymore, but the object is, it outlives the person. This idea of permanent object and temporary human was the most common theme in both of these interviews. Uh, the second group of the people was the Perestroika generation. From the late 60s to the mid 70s, the Perestroika generation managed to study in still Soviet uh, universities, but started a career already during the thaw, uh, during its collapse, sorry. Uh, by the time the Soviet Union uh, was changing drastically and quickly, it was the post-op period, the economy was crashing, the shortage of everything came to be. But along with the weakening Soviet ideology, the freedom began. This generation got caught in a whirlpool of new ideas, ideologies, and open worlds. It experienced the rise of new music, art, new establishing relationships with the West. Along with often being glorified and represented better and happier than it actually was, this era truly was the golden age of the Soviet Union. The descendants of this era often feel what American literary critic Frederick Jameson calls nostalgia mode, referring to the consumable past that does not evolve the memory per se, but is instead focused on the fragments of the said past. Uh, yes, uh, the, both of the, these interviews, you could see that the newly created freedom and access to many things that their parents didn't have access to, let these people see the Soviet Union in a way of a, as a buzzing and curious place to live in. But at the same time, they do realize now, as already post-Soviet citizens, that a lot of material objects inherited from the Soviets were indeed valuable emotionally, but generally they were useless. They talked about the endless heavy check crystal sets, the children literature book series, and many other things that were never really used. And as one of my interviewees said, they were there because they had to be there. They, were, they had to be there as a part of your life as a Soviet man. Uh, as for the generation after, uh, it was the final group and it consisted of three individuals. Born into already independent countries, this generation didn't experience life in the Soviet Union but they did get influenced by its culture that was found in movies, music, and of course, objects. They also carry the generational memory of the Soviet times passed down from their parents and grandparents often through these stories and this memorabilia. They were born in the late 1990s and very early 2000s during the very harsh times for all of the countries in the former USSR. Unlike their parents who lived in between two worlds, this generation saw the Soviet Union only as a remnant from the past. 
Interestingly, people born in this period grew up seeing and using objects they inherited from the Soviet past and living in apartments explicitly designed for the new Soviet men. This juxtaposition of their worlds created an interesting narrative and connection with a time that they never personally experienced. What this generation often experiences is reflective nostalgia, as Svetlana Boyan puts it, which consists of an ironic longing for a time that was never experienced. These people see the Soviet Union not as an experience, but rather as a story in and of itself. In a way, all three of my interviewees see these objects as rather movie-like. They don't understand them entirely, but they accept them as a part of their lives. For example, they know how to use and use a bed that becomes an armchair, then, then back to an armchair, because they were passed on that, gener that knowledge from generations prior. At the same time, for this generation, a lot of these objects are untouchable. They were created uh, when in the case of the Perestroika generation, these objects were there for the sake of being there. In the case of the generation after, they were there to be looked at, admired, and as one of my interviewees said, appreciated and heard. So many had these endless crystal check, uh, check crystal sets put in high cabinets and taken out only on the rarest occasions but we all heard stories about the long life they have lived. The main goal of my project was not only gathering these intergenerational stories, but also constructing uh, them in an interactive way. Creating an art installation for my project made the Soviet experience convertible. It brought the stories to a different level and made them uh, exist together with the viewer. This interactiveness created a sense of intimacy and attempted to combine the two opposing feelings. On one hand, it familiarizes the viewer with deeply personal stories. In a way, it brings the viewer into the narrative. But on the other hand, it defamiliarizes the objects and puts them out of their context and into a completely new one. The installation allowed the viewers to touch, use, move, and in a word, experience the object while listening to the stories these objects have to tell. Uh, my grandparents' old apartment on Saryan Street in Yerevan acted as a site for the art installation. Most of it has not been renovated since the day my grandparents moved in in 1983. It had the classic Soviet spruce parquet, heavy kitchen cupboards, giant wardrobes that can't be moved, and of course, the crystal glass sets. Some of the objects uh, that were borrowed from the interviewees themselves and were as authentic as possible. The installation also featured some photographs, video clips retrieved from family archives, of course, with their consent. Uh, in order to provide the audience with a more intimate experience with the installation, I used music, song, and food all around the installation. This way, I created a welcoming atmosphere that fills in the installation space. In preparation, it was important for me to stay in solitude with all the objects in the apartment. As I was sitting alone in a sun-filled apartment among stacks of paper with people's stories on them and objects from different parts of the world, different eras all gathered together, and the photograph of my parents hanging from the wall was looking right at me. This was the ultimate moment of reflection. This was the moment when I fully realized that my project is a threat that started way before my birth and that will go on long after my death. From the second I started to cut out the printed snippets of the interviewees necessary for the installation, I realized that it was no longer just my project. It turned into a collective research and reflection on memories, a door into other people's minds, and how my, uh, one of my interviewees put it, a temple and a house of memories. Thank you. Thank you, Zari, for an interesting presentation. Please uh, stay behind for questions. Thank you so much. It's an interesting topic. Um, first, I was going to suggest do you plan on working on this to interview a lot more people? That way you'll have a larger corpus and more well-grounded analysis. But I'm curious if you've looked at the phenomenon how these common household items or furniture pieces are now being transported into public spaces, like restaurants and cafes use this Soviet nostalgic sense to create a certain atmosphere to attract more visitors, whether it be the locals or the tourists. So I'm curious if you've looked at it or what would you think about that? Thank you. Uh, yes. Okay. Other questions? The object of these three periods, do they coexist in harmony in the same household? 
are there no conflicts sometimes between the objects from these three different eras? Have you encountered that or or does it have to does one era item have to yield its place to another when they succeed each other? Other questions? Yeah, you have a reference to Kelly and Bass, who insist that there were Soviet people all around. But how ignorant one has to be of the Soviet Union to come up with such a phrase. Uh, I'm referring to these authors. For example, in the Tajik Mountains, and in the northern minorities who have hardly escaped the Soviet period civilization. They have returned to their tepees and they're herding their deers. What, what furniture, what items? And one more question of principle. It would have been nice if you were to reflect on the following. The similarities in the Soviet Union were determined by the market. The question was not that whatever was in demand was imported. The question came from the opposite side. The Soviet Union considered that only that is in demand which is imported which is why they were importing uh, furniture that sometimes did not belong in commoners uh, apartments. The hierarchic structure was maintained in the trade system. Each structure had its platform and the procurement were random, depended on what you encountered being available for sale. Whatever country offered something, uh, you got textiles, other consumer items for whichever country offered it. And the most important feature, it seems to me, uh, and the question is the following. The issue of long-term use, sustainable use of items, objects, is not only the Soviet phenomenon. By the end of the 20th century, sustainable use furniture is removed from the agenda. 300-year-old furniture existed back then and exists even now, but it's become obsolete. It's no longer in demand. You should have reflected on that. It's not only pertinent to tools. Plant obsolescence pertains to white goods, to tools, instruments, not only furniture, everyday items. The Soviet specifics boil down to the particulars of the market. They just offered whatever they did and I had to buy it. That was the setup in the Soviet Union. I apologize. from Kaliningrad all the way to the northern. In the 80s, the Uzbeks started to get back to their routine. They started sitting on the ground. Those, that was the vector of change closer to the end. I apologize. Just wanted to add. It's not only a question as far uh, as much as a comment. Well then. You've referred to preserved objects, but are there also discarded objects? Preserved objects versus discarded objects. You may compare what's being discarded and why, and what's being kept within that context. Thank you for the presentation.
Thank you. My question was about this Soviet period uh, objects. Have you tried to uh, throw a link to the Parajanov Museum, the world of Parajanov's objects epitomizing the Soviet period? Is there any linkage with your uh, study? This is uh, an observation. And the uh, object uh, or an item in the context of a system of the set of uh, values that a person subscribes to. And the third observation, how would do he look at the daily routine versus the festivities and celebrations as a documenting uh, the time? Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the presentation. We now move on to the discussions. And uh, the discussant will be Marcello. Professor Marcello Monica. Hello. Hello. Uh, this. Marcello Monica is from University of Messina, Associate Professor in Cultural Anthropology and Ethnology. And uh, he will discuss our panel now. Please, Professor Molika, your comment and questions. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so I will follow my order, which is not the order uh, you, um, the, the, the presenters, the, the order you follow there. So I will start with Gor uh, Stepanian. That was a Fascinating paper. It's about today. It's quite uh, you know um, contemporary paper, which is about the sufferings of war, the atrocities of war. Uh, it's about the attachment to both home and city, which is magnified by the expression "I feel at home." I feel at home in the city. So. Uh, oh, She's working on boundaries here, the way how you can uh, extend these boundaries. So porous boundaries, leaky boundaries, open boundaries, boundaries that can penetrate, let's say, the district, uh, can, can penetrate the suburb, and she builds upon the work of Mary Douglas. Well done. Uh, also, it's about attachment, so belongings, uh, belonging, which is not just a genealogy or economy here, belonging is also, and that's quite important in post conflict scenarios. It's about pilgrimage sites. It's about sites of veneration. Then, and that's the first question. The, the category she's looking at is displaced women from Sushi moving to Yerevan. So I would like more articulation on the way she has chosen this category, white women. Of course, I know it's about the creation of the city and uh, uh, to identify the city with their children, even naming the, the, the city, naming also giving a, a time span according to children. That's quite intriguing. Um, then I was wondering, uh, since you're doing field work in Yerevan, uh, whether you also find some similar notions with citizens in Yerevan. I mean, do they start sharing the same former feelings of citizens? And if so, are they mixing those with memories of war of people in Yerevan. Second one, it's Akob Chalakian. Of course, we know quite well, me and Professor Akobian have been working much on your work. Uh, Latakia, the old Laodicea, the relation between Latakia and uh, Kesab, of course. This trajectory is not looking at uh, Mosalir or uh, um, Anjar in Lebanon. It's about the relation between Latakia and Kesab. Uh, the relation with the like, of course, it's. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to be, you know, otherwise it would be to try to be a bit provocative here. Um, we have uh, similar uh, roots, this diasporic roots, which is reproducing from Latakia to Kesab. Uh, Shall I say we have also similar attackers, the victimizers? We could even name them recent 2014, uh, Turkmen militia. Then we had Al Nusra, not yet, didn't change the name, the Islamic State. Turkmen supported, uh, paramilitary group supported by Turkey, right? Uh, and there was a narrative that developed on that. Then we have also the same shelter places, 
I mean, even the same buildings used again after one century. And then we, can I also say we can also have similar, shall I say, saviors, those who actually helped people from the south once they moved to, to Latakia. What's provocative? Probably it's time also for us to try to look at why Kesab. Uh, we're looking at also what's the um, point of view of others. And what's your idea about that? Uh, location, topography, the symbolic. Should we talk to people who actually involved, were involved in this? What they be? Why they did it? Then. Uh, the paper by uh, Arutyun Muratian. Uh, well, it's, it's about the dichotomy, the old, fascinating dichotomy of a town being both old and new. Uh, a case study that develops upon the use of the Armenian Genocide Victims Memorial Complex, and above all about the changes, the changes uh, it encountered, including here, terminological changes. That's what we are looking at, so the semantic. But you know what? Even more that naming places and changing in naming places, what was probably, what could be uh, also a way to look at this? It's about legitimacy. How do we legitimize these changes? So how do we legitimize changing names? Who is in charge of uh, giving this legitimacy, this imprimatur? Uh, I, uh, I, of course, I, I understand and I agree with your conclusions of this uh, uh, memorial complex, uh, which is not, uh, you suggest, not a static structure, it's fluid, of course. Uh, it's the embodiment also of Lied Memoir, but even more, several memories, uh, many memories. Uh, but then, Probably what I was also expecting was uh, uh, something on, I don't know if you are looking at that, but uh, because this became important recently in the war in Syria. Uh, uh, do school programs now in Armenia consider a visit to the memorial? And uh, even more, this, uh, uh, the memorial, how is the memorial represented in textbooks? Uh, that would be also fascinating to discover. And finally, uh, the last paper um, by uh, the Rui uh, Of course, I enjoyed the beginning. It's impossible to ignore the heritage that uh, the Soviet Union left behind when you want to live in a post-Soviet country. And here, your field work, so your data collection involves three generations, uh, which is good. Uh, of course, uh, not easy, I assume, also, the, um, the way how you collected your data. Uh, then I was, uh, um, are you sure that your paper is about objects and is not about memories and the representation of memories? The way our memories then is reproduced. I frame it in a different way. Uh, I mean, these memories, uh, cannot be the same if you go through the three different generations, of course. And I was uh, actually wondering whether you actually find, um, there is a moment when this object and the memory linked to that object clash. Why do they clash if they clash? So there is a generational clash, which is embodied by the same objects and the memory they carry on. Okay, I am, uh, I thought it was uh, fast enough, Professor Akubian. Uh, thank you, Marcello, for your comments and questions. Okay. Uh, and now uh, the authors uh, will be server. Yes, thank you. Yes, in summary, I singled out two questions for me who is in charge of. The Do school programs consider the visits to memorial? Uh, I'll try to cover it all once this uh, opportunity presented itself. I reflected on several issues. 
when it comes to the Hajj cars, the people themselves brought them uh, on April 24, 88, and installed, erected the Sumgait Hajj car. The people, it was a popular uh, eruption, sort of. The people brought it themselves. With respect to Baku, the same logic applied. The Baku massacres were compared with the genocide. Even the Supreme Council of the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic took a resolution where uh, they used the word genocide twice. So this time the state intervened, but this was the overall pathos, the wave that existed in that period during 1990. As for the Kirovabad, it was uh, erected by the initiative uh, was by a group of uh, former dwellers of Kirovabad. Usually, as it happens with the Hajkars, there is an inscription there in stone saying, uh, donated by siblings, brothers, this and that. People self-organized. It was not the government, the state. People self-organized and brought. The Khachkar place, the Khachkar Square is my own description. There was a uh, bar that closed access because cars were usually parking there. It turned into a parking lot, whereas there were fir trees and pines planted by individuals or organizations right next to it in memoriam of the victims of the genocide. So this already had a sacral nature. Only one step remained, the organizational step that is installing or closing the turnpike gate. As for who is in charge, it was both the people, the administration, and the state altogether. As to how the park was born, like I said, the idea was maturing for some time already. When you look at the English language, Memorial Park or something similar, in English, it means by default adjacent to a cemetery. Whatever phrase you use in English, it still implies adjacent to a burial or a cemetery. It's common knowledge, and I have several articles on this, that yes, the memorial complex of the genocide is perceived as a cemetery and has many features of it. But in this particular case, there were several factors at play. There was a high-ranking American uh, individual who wanted to pay tribute uh, and like elsewhere in the world uh, this can be done through planting a tree the ask weekly has the photograph it was not a pine it was a birch then this birch uh, this pine replaced the birch and it outgrew into something more serious and I installed a more somber sober meaning into it and upgrade the sort of the significance of this cove of pines and the memorial wall also transformed its function initially it was just playing a physical function the initial intention was to carve it with bare leaves of episodes from the genocide there were several meters carved already but then they uh, eradicated the remainder plain flat wall. It gradually outgrew into a memorial wall thanks to the fact that the first director of the museum started carving on it the names of the toponyms. And on the backside, Pietro Kuchukan, Italian Armenian, had a role here. They took urns with the uh, soil from the interments, and the world became a part of moving this purely national tragedy into a more global scale <clears throat> plane. Everything contains different interventions. People always ask how and why those graves uh, and tombstones uh, emerged there. The reason 
is both interesting and also allows the visitors to reflect on our those pages of our history. In the 90s, there was uh, uh, the early 90s were years of uh, interregnum. The, the impact, there were 80 armed uh, units. The army was not yet fully formed. There were 80 combat units dispersed. And if the head of the unified staff uh, uh, fell, they decided to inter him there. And the ideology underlying it was clear. The Azeris are the same Turks that are attempting another genocide against us. Therefore, the boys who put up a fight against them are fighting against genocidal Turks. Therefore, if they fall, we bring him here. The last internment took place in 92. Prior to that, several months before that, already the Pantheon, the Yerabalur was there. So all the remaining interments uh, thereafter took place in the Yerabalur Pantheon. <coughs> so it's not clearly the, defined that the government uh, decided this was legitimate, this was illegitimate. There is no such regulation by the public authorities. I'm trying to uh, take steps by the administration for all of the events that are taking place on the territory of the memorial complex to be dedicated exclusively to the memory of the victims thereof. They have to be linked this way or other to the memory of the uh, victims of the uh, genocide for, for various political considerations not to distort and go against the main function, not to politicize it redundantly. This memorial is dedicated exclusively to the memory of the victims of the genocide. That is its main functions, and that's how it should stay. Since my colleagues are here, uh, let me add a few things. This memorial was born uh, uh, they decided to so there was an idea by a Russian sculptor, a sculptor, Armenian sculptor from Russia. He curved that in stone, and this, he had an idea to have that placed at the memorial complex. However, the memorial complex is protected by the Department on Protection of the Historical and Cultural Monument, so it was refused. We have suggested to actually have it erected two levels below. It won't be the area of the complex, but it would be absolutely in line with uh, the philosophy of the memorial complex and because uh, the church has decided to canonize them, uh, it would be a good idea to show this notion, but it was refused by the architects and then they suggested to place it even at the lower level, which was refused by the uh, author of the sculpture. So, and this is where we stand now. Do we have uh, special visits uh, for the for the students to the memorial complex? I don't know what do we have in uh, the state curriculum, but in the month of April, specifically in the period from April 20 to April 30. We have many students from different schools visiting uh, the memorial complex with their teachers. 
So they bring flowers, and they pray there, they sing there, and there are even some memorial dances which they perform at near near the flame. So uh, this way, we continue to pass those memories from generation to generation. <clears throat> of course, I have not interviewed the teachers myself, but information is actually in the memories are transferred in a very, I would say, sober way, and uh, there is no revictimization or any other bad notion. Uh, thank you, Professor, for reading uh, materials that I have material I have presented. Your opinion is very important for me. Taking into account your recent research with Arsen Hakopian, where you also look at 44-day uh, war in Artsakh as well as Shushi. If I understood your question correctly, in case of many cities. Uh, the notion of house is very important for many cities. We may hear that often also in Yerevan nowadays. But in my case, I try to show what are the grounds for that. If in case of Yerevan, you feel that Yerevan is your home, it is rather pathetic, and it comes from uh, the indigenous people of Yerevan, people who lived in Yerevan for a long time, and they try to make, uh, let's say, draw a line between themselves and the newcomers to the city. In Shushi, <coughs> there were inhabitants who had no links, historical roots in Shushi from the very first day. They, had a notion of Shushi as a family. And they were rebuilding the city together from the very first day. I remember an interview by a woman from Mingechaur city of Azerbaijan. She spent her childhood that in that sunny city, often hot, very humid because there was water near that place. And she was living in Shushi, a place which was absolutely the opposite of Mingechaur. She had an opportunity to return to Mingechaur a uh, few months later to bring her belongings. She was telling that when I returned to Mingechaur, I found myself in a completely strange city, and uh, Shushi was very dear to my heart. In a few month period, I felt at home there. I hope I answered your question. Mr. Gulans and Mr. Hakopian's comments are very important. I will take those into account. Uh, during the publication, I had no notion of speaking about the history of Shushi because there is a lot to say about that. <coughs> during the publication, I uh, I will definitely do that. And the next question, first of all, thank you for the question. Because of the time constraint, I was not able to talk about that, how children treat Shushi. There are many groups of people from Shushi on social media. This is a kind of virtual life of people of Shushi on <coughs> Facebook on other social media. If you just take a look at those pages, you will feel that specifically youngsters who were born in Shushi and spent their childhood in that city, in their case, they have even deeper pain for the city they lost. Because for the parents, the city is, I would say, associated with their children. For the children, the city is associated with themselves. And after uh, 
talk, one of the kids said, in Shushi I feel that I am myself. After Shushi, if I am not in the city, I don't feel like it is my true self. So he is an eternal pilgrim to Shushi. I wanted to answer your question, and yeah, I actually, uh, in the further studies, uh, in the master's degree and other further studies, I do plan on researching more and delving deep into not just Armenian stories and Armenian household objects, but also trying to expand my research into other countries and seeing how this connection is similar or is not similar <clears throat> in other countries. Uh, what you mentioned about this objects being taken away and used as a, a, a way of like consumerist culture. And uh, I think it's also very interesting. And I think it, the main point of it, it, it is actually <clears throat> stored in that um, idea that uh, Boehm puts out of uh, reflective nostalgia when it is an ironic longing for time because a lot of people who do this uh, have never experienced the Soviet time as it is, uh, but or experienced it very little, but they did experience it through these stories. So now they have this uh, ironic longing and they try to recreate the time that they hear from stories and they hear, hear from this culture and music that puts out. So I think that's an interesting point. Thank you for the question, because I think that is also an interesting point in research and thinking about how, uh, how people use that object as a way to uh, make money now, really. Uh, as for uh, the other question about the, uh, <clears throat> about the Kelly and Bassin article, uh, the idea of, <clears throat> apologies, uh, the idea of um, material attachment, uh, of course, it's uh, unique for every country. Uh, and it is, exists in every country because um, objects are preserved for, for generations, I'm sorry, <clears throat> for generations in a lot of different places. But um, I believe that it is slightly different in the Soviet times, thank you, uh, because of mainly, because, of, uh, because these objects often come from the shortage of things and because these things were not very easy to get. So uh, when they're not easy to get, you cherish them more. And that's why I believe that this idea of preserving an object is slightly different in the Soviet, uh, in the post-Soviet society than it is anywhere else in the world. Um, as for the uh, comment, as for the question about the, the trade and the marketplace, that was just, uh, as you said, uh, yes, that's true. But at the same time, the reason why the market was bringing certain objects was not accidental. And the reason why certain objects were made a certain way, that's also not accidental. A lot of people were behind every, um, every item that was made, every apartment that was um, engineered and architectured. All of that had a lot of history and a lot of research put into it. And as a lot of different researchers state that all of that was meant to contribute to this idea of the Soviet ideology and constructing the Soviet ideology through everyday objects and through houses and, and apartments. Because at the end of the day, people spend most of their time, people spend a lot of their time at homes and with these objects. So that was important for them. And, but yeah, generally um, it was not accidental, the things that they were bringing, it was not accidental. And even if people didn't realize it, so when people got certain objects and got in possession of certain objects, they formed not only this emotional connection to the objects because of their memories, but they also formed this connection because they were meant to form this connection to this object and to this house. So uh, if that answers the question, I hope. And uh, you also pointed out the question about these objects coexisting in a place together with modern objects and maybe with modern memories. That was uh, exactly the, the point I was trying to make and the point I'm gonna further try to make in my further studies that these objects, even though they were specifically meant for a Soviet person and they were designed specifically for a Soviet person, they now coexist with people who have never experienced a Soviet life and who uh, only know it through these times. So, and they form their own memories. And it's actually very interesting when you put, for example, a 
Soviet glass or a Soviet cup in a completely modern drawer, or especially if you put, for example, a Soviet plate that you use for generations and you put it in a dishwasher, it's a very interesting juxtaposition of these words. And it's very interesting how all of these things exist together. I hope this answered all of the questions generally. Thank you, uh, uh, Marcello. Marcello? Yeah, can you can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we do. Please, uh, I would like to ask you to repeat question to Professor Cholakan because we have technical problems. Ah, the question for Professor Cholakan was about uh, Kesab, right? Can you hear me? Yes. So Yes, we do. Please go on. Marcello. Yeah, it's a, it's a bad connection now. Okay. It's a, uh, it was about. Uh, is there a time now where we should ask uh, also different perspectives? It was provocative insofar as uh, why Kassab? Does he have an idea about why we waste Kassab? Why do they attack Kassab? Uh, in 1909, the attack on Kesab was not the first one. There have been similar events in 1860s as well, specifically in 1890s when the National Liberation Movement reached actually Kesab and nearby provinces. The main reason for attacking Kesab was the following. Kesab was inside uh, the Ordu region. It was linked to Antiochus. So the ruler was sitting in Antiochus. It was representing uh, the place where they were collecting raw materials. And when in uh, Kesab they had developed a big market and it became the place where they were collecting uh, agricultural produce from Greek, Turkmen and Arab producers. They gave uh, to Ordu the trade of animals. But in Ordu, there was hatred towards uh, Kesab and its becoming of a major trade hub. So in Halep, Aleppo Vilayet in, in 1909, they started anti-Armenian pogroms and they reached also Kesab. The main reason was to rob people of their riches. and they called it Talan, which means robbery. They have been about 160 victims who died, but the Kesabians who were not in Kesab were killed on the road. But the main goal was to basically rob the houses, markets, the market, uh, small shops, etc. They took away all the agricultural produce and animals. It uh, lasted for three days. In this three days, people from Kesab reached Latakia. There was a correspondent, Ben Ibrahim, in Russian St. Petersburg, 
newspaper, there was an article published by this author, and he said that the crowd wanted to enter the Latakia province and rope in Aramo Ghanemi and a few other villages. But the Kurds and Alawites from those villages stopped the crowd and never let them to enter the Armenian villages. So those villages survived. But there is also another phenomenon. Those villages were in Lutakia province under Tripoli region. And 1909 massacres have happened only in Aleppo Vilayet, in Aleppo province. Only two villages were in Latakia, Armenian villages. The other major vi Armenian villages were in uh, Aleppo province, and they have entered one of the Armenian villages and completely destroyed it, but never went to Verin Bagjarat's village, which was just three kilometers away. So it seemed that it was an order coming from the higher authorities to have those actions only in Aleppo province, but never enter Latakia. This is about Kesab massacres and why Kesab was chosen. The same happened in 1919 and 1920 when people from Kesab returned to their birthplace. And uh, people in the surrounding villages heard that pe people from Kesab returned from the United States, brought with them a lot of wealth and weapons. In reality, only 1,200 people returned, and 30, 40 people as volunteers returned from the U.S. in order to help uh, their compatriots. And crowd attacked Kesab, thinking that those Armen uh, American Armenian legionaries have brought a lot of riches, and they are going to restore Kesab and also have a lot of weapons. You know the story. In 1920, they attacked Kesab. Of course, they were destroyed. And for a year and a half, people of Kesab, because of uh, well-organized defense, lived independently. They had political and military leadership, Armenian leadership in Kesab. And then Kesab was included into Syrian territory and became part of Syria. Same happened in 1214. I was an eyewitness of that. No people from Kesab died, but all shops and houses were robbed. No house had survived this. And the houses were not burned because they were of armored con concrete. So, but they took away agricultural machinery, other tools and equipment as of the question. The pilgrim's house was only for the Armenian pilgrims. It was an international house. There was also a similar house in Aleppo built by the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. It was a house to protect the pilgrims. It's not only for Christian pilgrims, but also to protect Muslim pilgrims. So it was a semi-military, paramilitary unit called Dalis. They were actually protecting Muslim and <coughs> Christian pilgrims so they would not face any danger, risk. It, those Dalits were multinational units, Turkmen's, Kurds, Armenians, Greeks, and Arabs, Muslims and Christians. In Kesab, we have, for example, Delhi Sarkisian family, or Delhi doesn't mean 
daredevil or crazy person, but it was rather uh, used as a synonym to courageous or brave people. And some of the villages were paying money to Dali Bashi's gifts to so-called commanders of Dali units. And there are also other pilgrim houses in Aleovit hills. Uh, there is one hill which Arabs until now call Kitun, which means a small pilgrim house, pilgrim house which was built probably for pilgrims who were traveling on that road as of Martalai. District, it is a Christian district nowadays, but some decades ago when they were opening the road, they found a small chapel which was covered by earth, which was Martala itself. So they excavated that, then installed fences around the chapel in the ground for the pilgrims and tourists to see Martanla of the 12th century. I have said that there are many mosques which were built above or on the top of the churches. Now, as of the cuisine, these people were living together. One of the most ancient indigenous people of this region and with Aleovis are Armenians. Arabs came to this region in 7th century and Greeks during the Selefkian times. Kurds came over in 12th, 13th century with Salah ad-Din. When Salah ad-Din took over the fortress which is now named after him, and took over also Antiochus and other cities. For centuries, these people were living together. Until now, now the costumes had some uh, specific features. Uh, for example, the boots of Turkmen's, Jizmans, were always on the market. So, if you see red boots, I mean red. It means that those Armenians, they were wearing similar pants. Uh, uh, those were large pants. In the back side of the pants, in case of Alovitz, they were beaching the ground. In case of Kurds, they were tight. Uh, Armenians had medium size. Hence, Armenians were using Burk, which means Burk, a type of a hat which was used only in Kesap. Arabs were using Agal and for Fasa. And during or after uh, the national liberation movement started, we were using so called Papa, the round hats. And uh, these people like each other's cuisine, but the same uh, dishes are not cooked in their houses. For example, Turkmen were running to on uh, the Annunciation Day to participate in celebrations with Armenians in order in order to eat aubergine, and they call it call. We're calling it Padar Jan Bayrama. It's cooked by Armenians in Kesap on the, on the Annunciation Day. It's meat, eggplant, and uh, Arabs were coming to eat the same. They had the same ingredients, but they were never cooking that dish. And <coughs> Only now, on at the table of people from Kesab, you will find, I mean, from Kesab, you will find almost or full. In the 
previous times in the past, if any elderly Armenian man would see a Musar fall on uh, their table, they would immediately ask to take them away because those Arab dishes. But they would go to their Arab friends to eat those. We also have galor, so called, uh, in Kesab, in Musalar, and other places. It's a type of bread. And Arabs know that this is uh, Armenian bread. We call it, uh, call it Bagar Jahat, or bread without yeast. Uh, there are some vegetables they never cultivate in their land. So, for example, Arabs say we will destroy our soil if we plant. A type of zucchini or pumpkin that the Arabs, for example, cultivate. For example, garlic is not cultivated by a specific family, Armenian families, because they consider that it will destroy the soil. So, uh, there were such traditions and stories attached to it. Thank you, dear speakers. Thank you, our dear professor, for discussing those talks. And we would like to invite you for a lunch. Please return after 45 minutes. Don't be late. So we'll resume at quarter to three. Recording stopped.
շարունակում ենք մեր նիստը եւ այս մի այս մի Recording in progress. We continue with our conference. And this part panel will be on urban toponymy, formal and informal. We will be looking at the very interesting issues and items pertaining to this terminology. Let me tell you that in English, it sounds somewhat different. We uh, did not succeed in Armenia to convey the same meaning. Informal urban toponymy with in, in parentheses. So informal and formal basically are not divided by a slash or and, but are forming a unity in a common word often you cannot make up your mind which is formal which is informal we didn't we failed to do the same in the armenian translation of the title let me just recall one thing we will be looking also at ergonyms you will learn what that is shortly once they had to bring me something and they needed to know how to uh, which route to take i described it by the street names describing buildings landmarks but whoever had to bring the stuff they uh, were, were only of ergo names which cafe or completely new names which we today will also touch upon we will hear school names and there will be an Interesting things to learn about the lepo, to to toponyms, name changes, naming, you name it. The first presentation will be by Nelly Manu Charyan. Since 2014, she's been employed with the ethnography and archaeology department, anthropology, uh, Institute Anthropology Department as a junior researcher. She's also our postgrad student. Uh, the scope of her interest covers identity, the processes of uh, building identity in the Soviet Armenia between 1920-1953. Nearly several years ago in 2016-17, was uh, a Carnegie scholarship winner at the Davis Russian and Eurasian Studies Center at Harvard. Today she will present a communication called Displaced Toponyms in Soviet Armenian Urban Space. Please. Thank you, Mr. Abramian, for the introduction. I'm very glad to enjoy this opportunity to share with you my initial findings of this study. I will have to apologize and switch to English since my slides are already in English. Um, so, the scope of toponymic studies is constantly expanding to include representatives from sociolinguistics, cultural geography, anthropology, history, urban studies, and academic, other academic fields. But let us dwell a little on the semantic definition of toponymy. Uh, the landscape consists of space elements carrying no subjective meaning, and these space elements become places when we attach the meaning to them. As Claude Lévi-Strauss indicates, spaces become places when we name them. Toponyms are names for places which signify uh, geographical elements within the landscape and mark the place identity. Uh, toponymy, that is the study of place names, 
toponyms has been studied from different perspectives. Recent studies draw attention to the relationship between toponymy and power. Uh, others emphasize the importance of place names as a strategy of nation building and state construction, demonstrating how governmental authorities construct new regimes of toponymic inscription to present specific ideas of history and national narratives. In spite of the above mentioned research, there has been little investigation on the relation between power and toponymy of the communist cities. Studies of the socialist city were rather inclined to focus on the formal and informative aspects of Soviet toponymy, and less attention was paid to the street district names as one of the major system of implementation of the communist socialist ideology in the urban space. With the establishment of Bolshevik power in Armenia, a large scale process of naming, renaming of place names began. To institutionalize the new regime, government used the urban landscape to represent socialist ideology and values to the citizens of Soviet Armenia. The renaming of place names became one of the main tools for the legitimization of the power and also for the process of state building and identity formation in Soviet Armenia. At the same time, uh, parallel with this, another uh, very interesting process of urban planning was going on. In the middle of 1920s, the Soviet authorities made, made a decision to build new settlements for the Armenian genocide survivors, uh, Western Armenians, very close to the city of Yerevan. Later, these settlements became city districts. The process was interesting, first of all, because it took place within the policy of the program to ensure the repatriation of the Armenian genocide survivors. And moreover, the settlements or districts should carry the names of the settlements of Turkish Armenia, becoming duplicates of toponyms, top, toponyms or displaced in quotation marks toponyms, such as Nor Arapkis, Nor Sebastian, Nor Kilikia, Nor Malatia, with the prefix Nor, which means new in Armenian. As Levon Abrahamian mentions, in this process of resettlement or displacement, the naming and renaming became somehow a creation or a recreation of the place. The urban plans of some of those settlements were developed by architect uh, Alexander Tamanyan. In my research, I will try to present some fragments of the construction and naming policy of these new settlements or districts in a frame of Soviet nationalities policy, as well as the peculiarities of the center periphery urban identity boundaries from the Soviet urban planning perspectives. The study will observe the toponyms in the frame of policy of colonization or nativization or indigenization in a broader sense, or let us say from the perspective of the policy applied in the affirmative action empire, as Terry Martin mentioned. Through the analysis of the official discourse, the paper will present the paradigm shift in Soviet nation building narratives of communist power in Soviet Armenia during the period of 1921 till 1939. This study is in its very initial stage. As such, it raises more questions than answers, such how was the Soviet urban planning policy intertwined with the Soviet primordialism approach on the constructing uh, the Soviet nation? Or may this process of urban development in Soviet Yerevan be the reflection of, as Terry Martin defines, uh, the use of strategic primordialism of Soviet authorities on constructing the nation? How did the urban development project of Soviet periphery become the, became the example of foreign and domestic policy interplay in the Soviet state? and which actors were involved in the urban planning and what kind of political interlinks are visible through this. The study is based on the comparative analysis of archival documents for streets, district naming, renaming cases in Armenia from the National Archive, along with various maps, district plans of Yerevan and other uh, documentary sources of this period. So the first mention of Yerevan streets and districts in the liter literature dates back to the 16th, 17th centuries. 
Uh, during Persian rule, functional importance within the city was given to the districts. Uh, so the uniqueness of medieval Yerevan urban toponyms lies in the fact that naming preference was given to the districts, while the construction and naming of regular streets was of no importance. Another characteristic of this period was that the districts were mainly assigned names of important places or social or domestic life, and there was almost no district with anthroponymic name, that is carrying the names of a famous people, of famous people. The anthroponymization of urban toponyms in Yerevan will appear much later during the era of Tsarist Russia rule, and the first official names of Yerevan streets became known in that, uh, in that period. In 1858, the Russian official Nazarev drew the plan of Yerevan, including the official names of 30 streets. Among the names preserved from the Persian era, like Cholmakchi, Shariati, Muskiti, etc., there were appearing streets carrying the names of famous people from Russian timeline, like Astafievskaya, Tarkhanovskaya, etc. A more detailed uh, plan you can see uh, on your screen, um, a more detailed plan of Yerevan was drawn in 1911 by architect Boris Mehrabian, who completed the naming process of Yerevan streets and districts, which had started in the previous century. Later, Alexander Tamanyan used this while designing the plan of Yerevan in, 18, uh, in 1924. So at the beginning of the 20th century within the Russian empire, Yerevan appeared as an administrative center with more or less constructed streets and districts. So when the Bolsheviks took power in Armenia, they launched a wholesale street renaming process in the first year following the declaration of Armenian SSR, over 50 names of streets, parks, squares in Yerevan were renamed. Uh, the official documents preserved in uh, National Archive of Armenia assert that the decision regarding the first renaming of Soviet Yerevan street was made in 1921 by the Council of People, People's Commissars of the Armenian SSR. And the first changes were immediately publicized in Armenian Communist Party newspaper, Horostain Hayastan, uh, Soviet Armenia, in September 1921. So, um, the renaming cases for this period from 1921 till 32 aimed to eliminate the symbols of Tsarist Russia and by rejecting the symbols of the old regime, toponymy needed to construct a new model of urban toponyms. So as a result, in the early 20s, by destroying the pre-revolutionary names associated in any way with the former regime, a wide range of symbols, characters were incorporated into the urban area, aiming to erase the history of the, in quotation marks, bad past, and to strengthen the ideology of the good present, present of the communist power. One of the specific uh, features of the renaming process was the curtailing the Armenian historical past, underlying the idea that the entire history and culture of the nations and regions began with the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, basically, in this period, uh, the bulk of central um, Yerevan with the Soviet names was created. So, by the middle 20s, the uh, central government not only subjugated the renaming process, but also became interested in toponymy as a new genre of propagandist practice. Starting from 1933, political transformation of the party, reaching its climax with Stalin's repressions, were instantly reflected in Yerevan toponyms. The harder were the repressions of the protagonists of socialism in the USSR toward the nation, the more actively people glorified them publicly. And the implementation of the planned lifetime denomination as a widespread, uh, widespread practice during the years of Stalin's repression demonstrated the legitimacy of the Soviet concept of socio-ideological toponymization of the geographic and social landscape. Uh, <clears throat> meanwhile, uh, against the background of the process of legitimization of Bolshevik power in Soviet Yerevan, including also through the reconstruction of urban toponymy in Soviet Yerevan, the use of the resettlement of Armenian genocide survivors was still remaining unresolved. On the one hand, the Lausanne Treaty signed in July 1923 made it clear that the displaced Armenians would not be able to return to their homes 
And on the other hand, the idea of creating an Armenian national home in the decisions of League of Nations was moving forward with difficulties. In spite of different uh, attitudes of Armenian national delegation, Soviet people co People's Commissars of Foreign Affairs, uh, Georgi Chicherin, and the rather strict position of uh, Lenin uh, toward the idea uh, uh, lo uh, of location of Armenian national home, it was, however, decided to relocate the Western Armenians on the territory of the USSR. At first, it was planned to exclude the possibility of gathering Western Armenians in one place, and the extraterritorial resettlement was encouraged. But later, taking into account the role of compatriotic unions, that is, the Armenian diaspora groups from various towns or regions in the former Ottoman Empire, in this process and other factors, the Soviet side took a positive stand on the issue of the resettlement of Armenians in the territory of Soviet. Soviet Armenia. So uh, here bringing the Armenians to the internal frontiers of the Soviet Armenian Republic uh, matched the logic of uh, Soviet Union's territor uh, territorialized vision of nationality, as uh, Lakov mentioned. Uh, the Armenian refugee resettlement project matches with other elements of Soviet nationalities policy in 1920s, uh, uh, that is the policy of colonizatia, together with the strategy of combining national groups within the clearly defined territories. The resettlement process required large-scale financial investments, uh, which were made possible due to the efforts of liberal diaspora organization like Armenian General Benevolent Union, the Armenian Compatriotic Unions, the HOK, that is Committee for Armenian Relief. So here, uh, HOK uh, also performed uh, an intermediary function between the diaspora organizations and the Soviet government. The con these connections were uh, the cornerstone of Soviet Armenian reconstruction until the period of Stalin's repressions, when all of them were banned and some members of which were repressed. So the decision was uh, taken to build new uh, settlements for Armenian refugees near the city of Yerevan, assigning them the names of lost cities in Turkish Armenia. Some authors explain this political action of the center from the standpoint of the benefit of the Soviet socioeconomic situation. Um, others stress the purpose of generating financial support from diaspora communities. But the fact is that this process uh, is carried on, uh, out under the direct political directive of Moscow. And however, uh, these new settlements were found close to Yerevan, which later were to be linked and become districts of Yerevan. New set, uh, settlements were built mainly in the area close to Yerevan, including all borders of the city. The compatriotic unions strongly emphasized the geographical location of those settlements, stressing out the visibility of Ararat Mountain as a symbol of the occupied uh, homeland. The issue of the location of each settlement was uh, discussed and agreed upon in detail with the representatives of compatriotic unions. So following this principle, Nor Aresh, Nor Arabkir, Nor and Nubarashen were founded and the plans of those settlements were developed and designed by Alexander Tamanyan. Uh, in the middle of 20s, North Malatia and Sebastia, Kesaria, North Homarza, North Tigrana Gert, and other settlements were founded close to Yerevan, uniting Armenians from those settlements carrying the same names of the cities, villages um, left in Turkey, intentionally reminding of the lost towns of historic homeland. So, uh, Interestingly, these settlements bearing the names of the hometowns or, or provinces left in Turkey were often relocated to the urban uh, 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 landscape of Soviet Armenia, along with the names of their constituent small villages and provinces. In this case, the names of the latter were uh, given to a building or a group of buildings in one or another settlement, which later turned into districts, as if recreating or preserving in this way a micro image of the indestructible integrity of na native settlements. In North Sebastia, for example, you can see on the screen, uh, there were built North Kamis, North Partisak, North Kochisar. These are the townships uh, constituted 
constituted the Sebastia province, nowadays Sivas in central Turkey, or um, for example, the compatriotic union of Hacht village applied to the Hoq uh, to, uh, to, uh, to build and name a house after Hacht, uh, the village of their origin in North Sebastia. So initially the newly built townships were inhabited by the Armenians from those settlements, uh, kind of creating a unique communal islands, a kind of ghettos, preserving the idea of a very local homeland. This can be conditioned by the fact that each patriotic union was already a structure uniting a po population of a particular settlement, a city, province, or a village remained in Turkey. A very practical, a vivid practical example of the Soviet authorities' attitude toward the construction and naming of these settlements is summarized in one fragment from the opening ceremony of the foundation of Nora Rapkij. It was the first settlement built on the border of Yerevan. It was founded as a result of an agreement signed between the Yerevan City Executive Committee and the Arab Kid Compatriotic Union of America. The official ceremony of the foundation took place on November 29, uh, 1925, uh, exactly on the day of the fifth anniversary of Sovietization in Armenia. The foundation ceremony was attended by high rank officials of uh, Transcaucasian and uh, local Armenian nomenclature, uh, who, together with the representatives of the Compatriotic Union's laid a foundation stone of the first building of Noradapkij uh, through the melody of uh, Antim Internationale. And it was proclaimed that the Armenians of Arabkij from all over the world uh, had to be resettled uh, here to get involved in the construction of Soviet Armenia. So this, this ceremonial act seems to sum up the idea that, there is the, that the settlements bearing these names, regardless of everything, are now in the Soviet territory, within the Soviet borders, and having this Sovietness does also contain a unique triumph over the opposite, uh, opposing powers. It is um, Noteworthy that in different uh, Soviet years, the renaming of urban toponyms, which generally took place under the ardent slogans, never spread to these Western Armenian settlements. They remained unchanged throughout the entire Soviet period. However, in late 30s, they were merged into regions, rayons, and somehow were disguised under the names of those rayons as if reflecting the Soviet ideology of national inform and socialist in content, but vice versa, thus constructing only a socialist form. For instance, in September 14, in 1939, uh, with the approval from Moscow and by the decree of presidency of the Supreme Soviet of Armenian SSR, North Sebastia, North Malatya, and other newly constructed settlements for uh, Western Armenians of the same neighborhood were merged into the name, uh, merged into and named as rural rayons. And then in uh, 1940, it was renamed after Lavrenz Iberia and uh, right after Stalin's death in 1953, by the decree of the presidency of the Supreme Soviet in USSR, it was renamed after Stepan Shahomian, a famous Armenian Bolshevik revolutionary. In 1933, uh, uh, Yerevan, though, had been already divided into three districts. Uh, you can see on the screen uh, districts or rayons and named after Kirov, Stalin, Spandarian. And um, I should say that during the years of Stalin's repressions, the only Nubarashen district, uh, di district after Pogos Nubar, the founder um, AGBU, was renamed to Soviet Ashen for several years. But a few months after Stalin's death, it got its name back. So the resettled or uh, in quotation marks displaced toponyms of Western Armenia in Soviet, Ar uh, Arme uh, in Soviet Armenian urban landscape could be seen as a political message of early Soviet power within a domestic and foreign policy orientation. Naming of settlements for Western Armenians could be seen as a part of the program of the Soviet national policy, in particular as part of the state program of colonization uh, in uh, the early 20s, which later in 1930s turned into the idea of nationalist in form, socialist in content, which, however, was implemented on the opposite. 
The preservation of the names of displaced toponyms in Soviet Yerevan uh, can also be considered as center periphery, uh, periphery op opposition specificity in Soviet city when the politically well-shaped center is opposed to the peri periphery or suburb where the deviations which are not allowed for the center with some reservations could appear there. So developing this research further on the example of this urban construction case, um, it is planned to highlight the factors influencing the paradigm shift in Soviet nation building narratives of communist power in Soviet Armenia during the period of 1921 till 53. Thank you very much. If there are questions to Nelly, please. Nelly will jot them down and then respond to your questions. The names of the districts of the city. Any other questions? Nelly, thank you very much. This was really interesting. And I mm -hmm. guess you are going to improve the structure. Otherwise, it's really great research. And my question would be, you showed quite well that the... Um, um, the idea of these urban toponyms are neatly connected to power relationships and uh, propaganda and indoctrination of uh, power, let's say, Soviet um, ideology. So uh, I have many comments which I'm going to give you in cool words, my insights. But uh, at, that, at this point, I would ask you quite uh, kind of, um, it's uh, like joke, you see, question. Uh, it seems to me that you showed quite well that the, for the purpose of propaganda, these um, Armenians who, who were um, thought as uh, repatriates, as expats who should come back to, uh, not come back like quote unquote, come back to Armenia. And for that reason, they would, would give this Kavrishki, um, right? To call the, the suburbs with name of their uh, former villages and, and uh, uh, districts. But my question would be, there is an urban folklore, like urban legend, maybe that's true. Um, uh, somebody can answer this question, maybe, but that there was a very funny, interesting story during the Soviet Union, when Galust Gulbinkian asked uh, Soviet uh, leadership to um, to build and to uh, give an infrastructure and, and connect Yerevan with Echmiadzin. And the only uh, precondition was that the prospect would be called after the name of Galus Gulbenkian and Soviet leadership actually immediately, uh, you know, rejected. So uh, I think this is another great uh, um, example and illustration how uh, how urban space is made as a propaganda uh, is, is turned out to be propagandistic text uh, with its significance, etc. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Richard Sitka. Shnagarutsun Nelly. Mirhajurt. Thank you, Nelly. Our next speaker is Nicole Margarian, cultural and social anthropologist. Since 1993 until now, he is working at uh, the Archaeology and Ethnography Institute in the Ethnography Museum, PhD in History, 
has 35 years of ethnographic field studies, participated in 60 different research projects. He was also lecturing in Gyumri Ananya Shirakatsi University and Yerevan State University, where he is an adjunct professor. He is interested in many other topics as well. I'm not going to tell you which ones, because you will ask him questions and actually lead him astray from the main topic of the presentation. Ergonyms as urbanonyms, struggle for naming urban landscape, please. Thank you. The presentation is uh, about uh, the use of industrial names and plants, name of the plants used to name different squares, groves, parks, uh, squares and districts as unofficial ergonomes when uh, those areas have their official names as well. In the toponymy, there have been suggested different terms or concepts which are basically taken from the Greek language. Urbanonym is a general name of objects in the urban landscape. Godonyms are names of the streets and boulevards. Agronyms are names of the squares and coronyms are parks, large urban complexes, are agro-industrial sports, student hotels and barracks. <coughs> and ergonym is the name of enterprises, organizations, entities in general from ergos work and onim name and sometimes different uh, different urbanonyms are being used which are sometimes the antonyms of the official names used in the official toponymy let me start with official urbanonyms presented in five different matrices. Okay. <laughs> So, the first uh, three uh, represent the highways and streets on the left side. In the left column, you have unofficial urbanonyms. Then the next column is official urbanonym. On the Far right side, you have official ergonym of an enterprise or organization. And uh, the third column represents uh, rough location of the enterprise or organization, the names of which are used in unofficial or as unofficial urbanonyms. As a result of our offline and online surveys, we realized that 19 different names are 
known under 22 unofficial names where the official names of the enterprises or organizations are being used and they also uh, used in order to identify the districts as well. I have also four squares, three circles, and three parks with unofficial, where unofficial names are used. So they can be grouped into the following categories based on the field of activity. Production, trade, catering, transport, active and creative, entertainment, font religion or religious organizations. Some of the streets and squares have uh, several ergonomics. Musaylan Street, it's on Sharan, Kino Prakat, Khul Hamrej, and Paita Mashakman names, because there were four enterprises located. The cinema renting uh, also, uh, the sweets, factory, also wood, factory, and for other places there were used so-called Chulochni and Kahkum areas, because uh, the city communist party building and the textile factory were located on that street, and uh, people in Gimbri still use this ergonomics, though many of the enterprises are either shut down or do not have uh, the previous volume of production. So, not always the ergonomics repeat letter by letter the name of the enterprise. So, uh, contextualization plays a role here, as well as some specific features of uh, the local language. So, Stroimash are following the name of the Stroimash enterprise, which was producing stone cutting equipment. Mass Combinat, that's meat production factory, it's the Russian acronym for it, or shortened version of the Russian name. Textile, textile Combinat is from the textile factory, Sovkhoz is from Sovkhoz Technicum in 1980s. It has, it was Hatsik Agricultural College, but they still use Sovkhoz Technicum. Kulhambrej. Kulhambrej is a shortened version of uh, uh, the building for the union of people with hearing and speech impairments. Kino Yerevan Ergonim. Has changed its ye to e, and it's called Erevan instead of Yerevan. There is also Patamski name from Botanic Garden. It is wrongly pronounced word. So all those names have also official names, and our study shows that in the daily language, urbanonyms made of ergonyms are competing with official urbanonyms, are winning over, and the success is based on several factors which have a general and specific nature. First of all, official and unofficial names are following different strategies of naming 
the urban landscape. Urbanovich and Hall look, say that after the Soviet Revolution, the names were named not based on the toponyms, but rather ideology. So the streets, parks, groves, districts were named not based on their topographic features or uh, based on their economic or functional belonging or historical importance and value or features of the local population, but rather they were uh, reflecting the different ideological notions, young communist, communists, international, socialist international, etc., etc., as well as the names of the Bolshevik leaders, Kirov, Len, etc., which was rightly pointed out by Professor Levon Abraham in one of his studies. Uh, during the Soviet times in Leninakan, from uh, some of the urban names we can uh, remember, Katsayatan Street or Katselny Street, and uh, Tsanandatan Street. So the boiler, boiling house and uh, the maternity house buildings. And in one of the districts, we were calling it textile district, there were only buildings basically given to the workers of those factories. There was also Antarman uh, district, and locals call it Andar or Antarner, which means area covered with forests, which was a historical resemblance of uh, the forests covering that area. Out of uh, three highways, the main names are based on ideological approach or basically have numbers as in case of uh, the newly built Ani districts, where many of the streets have only numbers. Un unofficial ergonomics are created based on topographic belonging and other features. So they're called uh, by the names of uh, different plants, organizations, and factories. And in those urban uh, places, they refer to the fact that some organizations enterprises have existed in that district at some point of time. So, the urban landscape areas which do not have official names are also called by their uh, topographic names or toponyms. For example, crossroads, intersections, or bus stops are called by ergonomics. So, the crossroad of the seventh, the crossroad of the eight, the dermatological cross section, etc., uh, twin sources or springs, stop, etc., etc. Why and how? This daily or unofficial urbanisms are able to win over the official urbanisms because they are better recognized, they are more visible, and they better represent that part of the landscape. It should be also added that in different areas of Gyumri Leinakan landscape, there were different plants located, and using the names of those plants go beyond uh, the boundaries of those enterprise districts and are being widely used in the city, as opposed to, for example, people living near the textile street who could have been informed about the official name of the street, which was Alinina now Garaginashte. People in other parts of the city were not familiar with the official names and were using textile street, which, which is showing that this street was important for them because the textile factory was located there because they or their relatives, friends were working in that or were employed at that factory. And it was the street where themselves or their uh, close friends or relatives were working and this is the importance of the street for them. So the taxi drivers, postmen, or people who had to know the addresses 
No, the Gorky Street, but uh, Kino Erevan Street is well known beyond the city because uh, Yerevan Cinema was one of the three cinemas which was one of the most visited ones. Several park streets and squares of uh, Yumri and Lenakan, which have ergonomes, have proven that uh, the decisive role for ergonomes belongs to the importance of those specific organization entities and factories in the city. So, on Kalini Street, besides the textile factory, which is Karagin Nashta Street, there was also so called Shlifovalni, the polishing factory, but uh, the street is known under textile street name. It was uh, the largest factory in Gyumri, where 6,000 people were employed, as opposed to 1,500 employees at the polishing factory. It is also applied to the park, which is the official name of the Friendship Park. And it was, by the way, closer to the polishing factory. We have also an other intersection known as Kruk, but Kruk is less used than Kino Hayastan, which is highest Armenian cinema. And it was a transport hub well known to uh, people traveling on the road and Hayastan cinema was known as one of the three most visited cinemas. There are also some Gertsen, Kutaisi, Koshtoyan, Manuchian, Street, Sakharov Square. Those are known under their official names, but they do not have any, uh, let's say, enterprise or organization of the city importance or national importance, and therefore they are known under their official names. And basically they serve for the purposes of educating the local people or people who are living in those districts. Uh, in 1990s, there were official names of the streets, sorry, unofficial names used on the transport, Sovkhoz, Textile, Mass Combinat, and others. They were used on the public transportation and made them even wide, more widely used. And also, and there are also some new urbanonyms which have been originated in the post-Soviet times with the shrinking uh, population of the who were living in the Soviet times and increasing number of those who were born in the, in the, during the independence. Uh, we have, for example, in any uh, district. So-called Virgin Park or Pityorichki Street, Vanaturi Street are used only in the city. Some of the streets are named after the benevolent organizations or well-known shops or trade organizations. Uh, there is also a tradition of naming. I don't know who is that, but please turn or shut down your microphone, mute it if possible. 
There's a Soviet tradition of using ergonyms as uh, still used. So there are no large enterprises built after the Soviet Union, but there are some medium and small enterprises which somehow hybridized the urban landscape and led to new urban names. There are reference points for uh, the districts where they are situated. Many coffee shops, bars didn't have their specific names, and they were known only under certain numbers. But they were also remembered based on the ergonyms used in that specific district. And now uh, they have names. Yarli House, OK, Corona, Pichorchka, and others, which are ergonyms originated outside Gyumri. It is due to the fact that during the Soviet times there was only one owner of all enterprises and organizations. It was the state. Now we have some private owners, a multitude of owners, and they represent different tastes that these people have, and uh, those names also reflect the ergonyms. And some organizations and some such medium and small enterprises are known now under the new ergonyms without even reference to the streets or districts where they are located. This creates a chaos and makes it difficult to move around the city and a young taxi, taxi driver should know what is on Shavan, but an elder passenger may not know Musaidan Street. And this is a way of communication. It should be ensured that this communication is uninterrupted. This could be supported by making some of unofficial urbanisms official ones. Some of the unofficial urbanisms are linked also to the history of the city. By making them official ones, we can also support the recovery of the city history. It could also interest the newcomers, because they are dealing with official urbanisms only. In 1960s and in the post-Soviet times, such approach was adopted in Moscow and St. Petersburg in Russian Federation. So, Nevsky Prospect so, has been returned its old name. It's a habitualized, habitualized norm. In many other countries, in Paris, many of the official ur urbanonyms have been taken from unofficial ones, which were created based on the toponomic approach. This approach, on the one hand, is sorts out, sorting out uh, the cows with the names in the city helps to move around the city and on the other hand, expands historical, economic, and Nikojan, <laughs> 
ունի եւ կողնորոշվելու հնարավորություն է եւ երկրորդ այդ այդ մի հարց եւ երկրորդ հարցը ուղղակի հասկանալու համեմ մեթոդը սրա հետ կապված եւ երկրորդ հարցը էլի գործառնության հետ է կապված որով հետեւ բացի փողոցի անուններից եթե դուրս գան պետ տաքսիների խնդրից օկտագորցում ենք կարիք ունենք իմանալու եւ օկտագորցում ենք եւ որ օկտոբում ենք փոստից հա եւ փողոցի անունը կարևոր է եւ ըստեյության պետությունը վերահսկում են միայն այդ փողոցները որովհետեւ իրենն էլ միայն դրա համար պետք է տանվանումները ուրիշ առանձնապես կարիք չկար որովհետեւ նույնիսկ կանգառների հայտարարության պրակտիկա մենք չունենք մարդիկ իրազեի չեն ասում եւ նացած երևույթները ով ոնց է անվանում ոնց է տեղադրում իրանք իսկ ապե շատ հախորեն են տեղի ունենում մա ես դրա համար նաև ուզում եմ հասկանալ գմրում կամ միակ եզակի տարբերակ եւ որ Uh, named after Rishkov they renamed Kirov uh, Rishkov street but people still lingered on calling it Kirov street so i still fail to understand was it officially registered on the record somewhere because this was a big plaque uh, sign attached to the street wall is it was just another practical joke of the gumri people or was it really official let me ask a clarifying question oh do not answer i just want to clarify the question is this the question addressed to the methodology i just want to understand how did you make the count of what people are currently using well uh, other questions Thank you Nicole that was exciting and very interesting. This is not a question. I just wanted to see It seems to me what you're saying about unofficial street names. I think it also was a phenomenon during the Soviet time when ergonyms uh, today pertain to the name or the structure and have legitimately become the toponyms so these are two different processes if you want my opinion i just wanted to understand with better clarity what's the gist of or novelty of this study so what could this add to what's the added value to urban studies of uh, this communication if you could formulate that more clearly in the summary that would be appreciated thank you it was very interesting could you briefly formulate what's the academic issue at stake in the context of all of these observations they are similar these two questions yes anything else seems that there is none thank you thank you the next speaker is neli karapetian Nelly Karapetian is a postgrad student in the Archaeology and Ethnographic Institute. The scope of her academic interest include educational anthropology in 1920th centuries, ethnographic photographs. She's employed in the Ethnographic Department of the History Museum of Armenia as a senior as a researcher. She will be talking uh, on renaming schools, the process of renaming schools in post of it, dynamics of renaming schools in post of it Yerevan. Thank you. As it was mentioned, I'll be speaking about the dynamics of school renaming in post of it Yerevan. Yerevan as a capital city became the epitome of socio-economic, cultural and political transformations, the stage for all of these transformations and all of these changes leave an imprint first and foremost on the Europe and on the Yerevan's cultural space. The biggest wave 
was incarnate perhaps in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, on the path to the formation of a nation state. We looked at the ideological political impact of these processes in um, eternalizing uh, names in particular uh, in renaming of the schools. Uh, we're basing it on historical archival materials and documents as well as field work combining the data and analyzing from both sources. As Lefebvre mentioned, every revolution creates new space. In this respect, the school is viewed from two angles, as a physical and social space. And in fact, the renamings uh, bear the imprint of not only ideological transformations, but also physical landscape transformations are implied. First and foremost, this is incarnate in monuments, uh, busts and plaques that are erected and placed. As a result, the space of the school becomes a specific, unique uh, memorial space, which, uh, according to Pierre Nora, is a place where the disrupted memory of the past uh, connects to the present, resulting in an uninterrupted chain. The official discourses of history and contemporary times are combined. At first sight, they seem to be detached from the realm of ideology and politics. Ostensibly, the prevailing majority of the schools in uh, Yerevan have been founded in the post-Soviet, uh, in the Soviet period. Before the Soviet time, there were three dozen schools, and the names in that period were reflecting functional nature. They indicated the school's uh, purpose or whose property they were, for example. the It was called the parish school, the parish school. One such example of that period of uh, naming a school in memorial pertains to the Romanov's uh, dynasty. Uh, that was in memory of the Romanov's house. In uh, 1913, year one was to participate in the celebrations of the third centennial of the house of Romanov's. And for these celebrations, it was decided to uh, prepare a program with several items in it. One such was uh, the naming of a seminary after uh, the house of Romanov's. Another example was 1860 C. Gayanyan. Uh, uh, gymnasium, which was set up by the decree of the Echmiadzin Synod, and it was called after Gayane, the martyr of the Ripsimian maidens. Earlier in 1850, uh, the gymna female gymnasium, girls gymnasium in St. Nina Women's Benefact the charity organization uh, board uh, named it after Ripsime. So in the imperial period, the educational institute's type and function were also uh, correlated with uh, religious or imperial uh, names. As for the First Republic years, there were no significant changes in those years that we encountered, just an interesting episode. According to the data we received from the National Archives, on February 24, 1884, the Alexandrian Girls Gymnasium Educational Council decided to apply to the Ministry of Education to rename the gymnasium after Evgenia Tersarksan, its founder. But the Dashnak Education Minister rejects the this turns down the decision of the Educational Council. Uh, reasons unknown. The school had opened in uh, 1906 as a pro gymnasium. In 1812, in 12, 1912, it was transformed into a gymnasium and called named after Alexander the First. In the Soviet period, the renamings were mostly bearing the imprint and impact of the ideology of the administration. They were mostly named uh, after politicians and statesmen, the bearers of communist ideology, writers, authors, uh, publicists, which also led to the augmentation of the physical landscape by the uh, 
busts and statues thereof. A couple of examples, both have been pulled down. In the Soviet period, Yerevan had become a creative platform and played a role in setting new cultural models and roles. After the independence, Yerevan becomes the platform for uh, erasing it from the memory. The first such renamings uh, mostly took place in the central districts downtown where reputable schools uh, were located bearing the primary quote unquote like this is a quote from Mr. Uh, Brahman the names of primary heroes quote unquote when it comes to the names of primary heroes one should mention that Stalin's and Beria's schools were renamed already in the Soviet period the Stalin school was renamed Vahan Terian, Beria was renamed Hakopakopian. And one may notice that during the Stalin period, the ideological meaning yielded partially to the local national uh, uh, names, uh, which reflected the cultural policy trends of the period, as opposed to the Stalinist period, where the uh, cultural educational um, area was merged with the party policy and ideology. In the Khrushchev period, it was detached. The ministry became a standalone public agency, encouraging free development of culture along the national lines. How were the schools renamed uh, post independence? Usually, the meaning of naming these schools, first and foremost, was uh, for memory reasons and to make them distinct from other similar phenomena. Apart from the numbering, successive numbering of the schools, which already make them distinct from other schools, they also added a phrase, a name that had a memorial function. We encountered the issue here as to what type of individuals had to be memorized. Uh, or which aspect of their sector of their operation had to be memorized. We're encountering the issue of the political uh, use of the past. And the question who could have been remembered and who not, of course, was officially formulated in the regulation. In which, if we briefly presented, the educational institutions could have been named after natural persons or non-commercial entities, provided they have had a significant contribution to this particular educational institution's building, renovation, and the significant input has been defined in this regulation. Apart from that, they could also be named after those graduates of the same institution who have had an input in increasing their reputation uh, of the school or have rendered services to the motherland. And the third is already, if they are of national significance, figures of science and culture. And another bullet point enshrined that it could be named after a natural person at least five years after the latter's death. There are a few uh, two differences between central and peripheral schools renaming practices. In the post-Soviet uh, aspiration to erase the Soviet past, the first victims were the central schools on the one hand that was determined by those uh, actions, uh, by those schools being in eye-catching prime locations in downtown, as well as the positive correlation that is viewed between the strategic importance of central location and the authority and reputation of the person to be memorized. The schools in downtown Yerevan streets were named after uh, primary heroes of the Soviet uh, country. So Connor Tone mentioned that this was uh, the oblivion of undesirable past assumed respective erasure, first and foremost, of the bearers thereof. And although the procedure I referred to stated that a uh, motion for renaming could be submitted by various 
public governance entities, the educational institutions themselves, or natural and legal persons. Our queries have demonstrated that when it came to centrally located schools, downtown schools, their renaming was mostly initiated by public governance bodies, ministry itself, in particular as for peripheral schools, it's more often the occurrence when the school itself comes up with the motion to be renamed or some natural person petitions for it. The process of renaming during the independence year can break down into several basic trends. One such trend is erasing, uh, replacing the Soviet revolutionary names by the national liberation struggle figures, those who participate in the Artsakh liberation war. In this context, it's symbolic that in 1990, the first renamed school, one of the first renamed schools uh, was the replacement of Korupskaya with the uh, Education Minister of the First Republic, Nikola Balian. The, the selection of the name and the fact of renaming was the decision of the ministry. Although the current deputy headmaster of the school, who used to be a teacher during those years, corroborates that within the school they've had other alternatives. They were proposed more historical uh, alternatives like Sahak Partev, for example, but the ministry has opted for the current option and it was accepted, approved. In the event of these schools, both schools are concurrently still used uh, by the public, regardless of the fact that even during the Soviet period, uh, there was a certain resentment and reservations about the name Karupskaya. So it seems as though the renaming uh, presented an opportunity to uh, delegate this Karupskaya name to oblivion but it still continued to be used in official even correspondence. One of the fifth graders of the school, a student said the following. When we talk with, uh, let me say, for cab drivers, we say Krupskaev, and uh, uh, in all other cases, we say Nikolaou Balian. This may be determined by two factors. On the one hand, Already in the Soviet years, the school was one of the most reputable schools of the city. Yerevan uh, comprised several micro districts, uh, each had its own infrastructure. And as a result, they came about so called prestigious uh, districts where high ranking officials or intellectuals uh, live. And the Krupskaya school was part of such a micro district and usually respective social strata offspring uh, studied here. It was even difficult to enroll in this school. This could also reflect another phenomenon when the oral collective history is more stable than the official written narrative. We see this in another school, the Kamo school, which was renamed already in 93, Argentinian Republic school, but still in vernacular uh, when you have uh, uh, instructions for the cab driver, you use, use the old name. It's another trend to use Armenian artists and authors and writers names. The same uh, trend, of course, existed in the Soviet years, of course, acceptable names, but diaspora Armenian artists and writers Names um, were more uh, widely used in the first uh, post-independence year. Kostan Zarian, Karapets, and Badbiraz, Fiamanto, Ruben Seva, Kalko Poshakan, and others. The Espra writers and publicists' names uh, have a common trend pattern. Mostly it's Armenian language writers who touched upon national identity, language, motherland uh, topics in their writings. In the event of Yerevan schools, benefactors' names are quite rare, which mostly apply to peripheral schools. 
the religious figures' names are also outnumbered. Uh, I would like to emphasize in particular the second, Harimian Hayrik, uh, whose name was used to rename a school. This is an, a unique example of a restored name because the educational institution was founded in 1906 by Hrimian Hayrik himself and was called after him even then. And in the Soviet period, it was called 26 Commissars, and in the independence period, it regained its original name. Foreign uh, nationals, Armenian scholars, and figures, Henry Morgenthau, Fritjof Nansen, Johannes Lepsius were used. In this case, uh, the renaming was determined by their efforts in legitimizing and internationalizing the genocide, the role they had in it. Nevertheless, uh, in the case of several uh, schools, the Soviet heroes have not succumbed to the trend and still are in the landscape of Yerevan educational, architectural and cultural landscapes. The Shahumyan school is the most salient example. Among the non-renamed, uh, there are also cases of non-renamed schools, mis uh, streets, Mr. Abraham already reflected on that. To save time, I will simply reflect on the quotidian uh, specifics that have applied to these intact names. In an interview with the, the headmaster of the school, when we tried to find out what is he, what is the intention when he remember, re, refers to Xiaomian Tsi's and their honor, he uh, clarified that it's the uh, school that he missed. When it comes to Akbalan, it's his educational, uh, enlightenment ideology and activities that were recalled and the headmaster also mentioned that the renaming is uh, obliging them to be worthy of the name in certain circumstances during public uh, presentations and celebrations certain nuances and emphases have shifted in the event of preserved names in the event of Shahumyan, for example. This is a quote from the Communist Daily, Russian language, where there is a reference to the teachers uh, of the school and an emphasis is made on that the Shahumyan school teachers have a different handwriting and as they were taught, they convey this to their own students to continue in the same revolutionary spirit, not to succumb to difficulties, to put up a fight against challenges, and there is an emphasis on the revolutionary ideology of Shahumyan, as opposed to the previous uh, statement by another headmaster. The renamings of the schools are not such a recent past. They're mostly 2021st century poets, uh, artists, politicians, names that are used. The exceptions are Movses Khorinatsi number 143, Narekatsi number 137, and first uh, school around the renaming of this school there were um, numerous discussions it was renamed only in 2020 the quotes here are from the debate around the renaming this renaming uh, implies also some power over the space or the territory it's not incidental that in nelson stepanian school when in the courtyard they were placing a plaque with a bust uh, by relief of the hero. His brother's grandchildren were invited to uh, participate in the ceremony. Public schools mostly have anthroponym renamed as opposed to the private schools, which we did not cover within the framework of this. And the only exception is the Argentina Republic School. In memoriam renamings mostly and predominantly refer to male figures. In the Soviet period, the only woman was Krupskaya. In the subsequent post-independence period, there is Silva Kaputikian and Russian 
states person Galina Starovoitova. So in the post-Soviet period, the process of renaming Yerevan schools followed the same principle. Soviet ideology and heroes were replaced by national ideology and national heroes. As a result, the cultural landscape, social and historical memory erased, uh, phased out the communist Soviet stratum yielding to other strata with some of the remnants uh, preserved. The Soviet and post-Soviet period renamings were determined by the particular location, whether it was downtown or not, and the reputation of the figure it was named, named after. It also assumed, implied the memor memorialization of the school, partially with the uh, ideological and political impact thereof as well. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions addressed to the speaker? As a graduate of the Nikola Balian School, I would like to reaffirm that they still use more Krupskaya than Arbalian. You mentioned that especially in peripheral schools, the schools themselves motion or petition for renaming, or it's done by natural persons. Are there any cases where the community has some contribution or prevails in the motion to rename and succeed in doing so? Thank you. Other questions? What is the issue or problem addressed by this uh, work or communication? From what's the ethnographic take on this? Thank you. I have studied myself in Viktor Hambartsumian school. We called it still Kirov because it was shorter, more appropriate to the school and its language orientation. So maybe that aspect should also be viewed as the appropriateness and brevity. I encountered the same issue uh, uh, myself when I was looking at the old and new names. One needs to do an intergenerational study, a large-scale one, or look at those who work, the teacher corps, the students of the school, as well as the district and the quarter the, where the school is located, look at the opinions and feedback of the inhabitants. On a city level, what is the reference to the school should also be considered. Thank you. A very brief question. Can we claim that, for example, we all understand that whoever names the school takes up a monopoly on it, and when the school is renamed or the old ones are let go, can we claim this is no a nostalgia for that period? Or is it just the momentum? Uh, thank you, Nuri. We have also last speaker. Uri Pilevosian. She is joining us on Zoom, right? Uri Pilevosian is studying social anthropology. She has, master, she has master's of social anthropology from London University, and she is looking at the traces of genocide and also memories in the urban landscape. 
The topic of her presentation is mapping Armenian-owned shops in Aleppo. <coughs> so we go now to Aleppo. Who are you, are you here? Yes, we do hear you. This woman, but she is. Uh, it's Kima. Uh, thank you very much. I will now switch to the organizers to start my presentation. Um, Hi Halib is a team effort by Saratel Basil, a writer and activist from Aleppo based in Sweden. Harut Mardirosian, a software developer, history enthusiast from Aleppo, now based in Lebanon. Rajni Avakian, a psychologist from Yerevan, based in Sweden, who is the only non-Aleppo person in our team. And Hovsep Markarian, an MA Cultural Studies graduate and a writer from Aleppo based in Yerevan. Hovsep is a founding member, but no longer part of the team. And myself, a social anthropology graduate student, researcher, photographer from Aleppo, currently based in London. Before I start, I want to give you a brief history about the Armenian existence in Aleppo after the Armenian genocide. In the early 20th century, the vast majority of Armenians who arrived in Aleppo settled in the old city in al jdaide neighborhood, and most of them started to open up their businesses in the area. After that, they started expanding throughout the city, especially in the neighborhoods of Al-Midan, or in Armenian known as Norkur, Suleymaniye, Azizie, and the Villat neighborhoods. I will expand more on the neighborhoods later, but this is just to give you an idea of what I will be talking about, uh, especially when it comes to the streets. So a couple of years ago, when COVID came into our lives, we suddenly found ourselves quarantining at home. That's when uh, new activities started to come to surface. And one of these activities was extensively talking more about culture and ethnography. Uh, Saratel and I were part of a group called Aleppo Antica or Antique Aleppo. Um, it's mainly for people from Aleppo who are on Facebook and the purpose of the group is to collect stories and memories from Aleppo. This is when we noticed the lack of Armenian presence in the group. Saratel started to write posts about Armenians and made lists of Armenian owned shops but there was no response in the comments section. After having long conversations uh, we realized that one of the problems behind this passive participation of the Armenian members in the group was the language barrier. All the group content was in Arabic and most Armenians didn't feel at ease expressing, them, uh, expressing themselves in Arabic. This is when the idea of Hi Halep came to life. After endless Zoom calls between Saratel, Harut, Rajni, Hovsep and I, we launched Hi Halep as a Facebook group in May 2020. We have a clear manifesto and a set of rules for the group. The purpose of the group is to create a platform for Aleppo Armenians where they can share stories, memories, even photos and videos. Through this aspect, we aim to, uh, to construct an archive, and I will expand a bit on that later. Uh, and we have a, a key rule in the group is to avoid uh, talking about politics, especially Armenian political parties in Aleppo, because once this topic pops up, people turn on each other and the purpose of the group gets sabotaged. We also don't uh, accept any religious posts, good morning and good night posts, which are the types of posts that are that uh, have been posted in previous uh, Aleppo Armenian groups on Facebook before. Basically, our posts are, are limited to Aleppo's culture, social history and present times. Using this mechanism uh, helps us filter out content and focus on the areas of research that we want to achieve. The bigger picture is uh, to why we wanted to create this group it goes back to our own struggles with finding information about Aleppo Armenians. Over the past decades, most of the information uh, available online about Aleppo is related to war. But before the war, there were almost no serious attempts to record the Armenian presence in Aleppo. Even in terms of numbers, we don't have a clear idea of how many uh, Armenians lived in Aleppo. According to the prelacy, the Arach Nortaram, there, there were around 50,000 
Armenians before the war and after the war, 10 to 15,000 moved mainly to Lebanon and Armenia. A large number then migrated to Canada, Europe, and Australia. Then again, none of these numbers are official. Also, we could only find records of churches, uh, some organizations, and some schools. Our purpose shaped around focusing on the everyday life of Aleppo Armenians and an attempt to collect the unwritten parts of our history. As a methodology, we decided to go with oral history, since as Spurkahais, uh, diasporans in English, uh, in general, and uh, as Aleppo Armenians specifically, we are populations that can flee, pack up and leave, and they don't own any sort of an archive. All these stories and the memories are with the people. They are not accessible in any way, and this is where our role becomes crucial in collecting and disseminating this information. It is iconic to mention that it took a war and another wave of migration almost a century later after the genocide to realize the importance of owning and having an archive. Our field is an unorthodox space. It's a Facebook group that we control because we couldn't physically be with one another due to the, due to the pandemic. As admins, we each live in different countries, just like our group members who are scattered all over the world. The one thing that we all have in common is that we are all Aleppo Armenians. We first started making lists among the three of us about Armenian shops, cassette stores, bakeries, and I'll be showing you some of the pictures now that we have. Uh, and then we started uh, to fill these lists as much as we could. Uh, we started posting these lists on Facebook so people uh, could interact with them in the comments. In the beginning, we expected more engagements with the posts. However, we barely got any comments. This is where the issue of lack of public discourse came into play. A simple Facebook post unearthed an issue that has been embedded in the Armenian community of Aleppo for ages. The fear of speaking out, of expressing thoughts and ideas. In this case, even something as simple as the name of a shop owner resurfaced, even though our methodology was trying to break the modes of silences. The next move for us was to start live interviews with the members of the community. We call it an hour with the Halepsi. Halepsi means an Aleppo Armenian. Each Saturday, uh, we invite a member of the community to talk about their life and memories in Aleppo. These interviews are based on photos, just like the ones that, are you, that you're seeing on the screen. Uh, we, sit, uh, we sit down with the, with the interviewees we have them rehearse the interview and we come up with the timeline together of how they want to present their stories through their photos. During the live stream of the interview, we allow people to comment. The nature of the comments uh, is usually greetings to the speaker. Sometimes people mention names or dates that the speaker doesn't exactly remember and it contributes to their stories. Um, the interviews are live streamed on, uh, on the group every Saturday as, they, as they, they are taking place, and, the, the, and every Sunday we post them on our YouTube channel. The interviewees not only are the intellectuals of the community, but rather people from all walks of life. We also have had people before in the interviews that are from Armenia who moved to Aleppo at some point in their lives, and they were talking about their memories and experiences as Armenians from Armenia in Aleppo. When for various reasons we missed scheduling these interviews, for a few weeks, we received messages from our community members demanding these interviews. For most of the group members, this had become like a TV show they would anticipate watching every Saturday. These interviews gave people the chance to learn about different types of lifestyles, organizations, schools, trades, and stories they never heard of when they were living in Aleppo. They thus opened a space for a peaceful interaction between people and a genuine interest in Aleppo's Armenian portion of the history. As a result of the interviews, we were able uh, to have more posting ideas and increase overall engagements with the post. One such idea came to us from one of the interviews was that mapping one of Aleppo streets that I mentioned before that was highly populated by Armenians during the early 20th century. Over the years, that street changed as Armenians started expanding and moving beyond the Jdeide area. As of today, we have around 300 shops mapped out on one street in Jdeide called Tilel Street. It was a collective effort to gather the data 
about the Armenian-owned shops of Tilel. One of our community members helped us create a map, which the snippet of you're seeing on the screen, where we mention each shop's name, the owner's name, the date of the opening and the closing. And I will show you an example. So when you click on any of the shops, it will bring out a, a card ID and you, you are able to see the names and the dates and even parts of their story. Some of the shops are still up and running until today. Others have changed over the years and, and some of them don't exist anymore. The nature of the map when we first created it was to allow anyone who has information to click on where their shop is located on the map and create their stories. However, due to uh, technical difficulties for our community members, many of them were not able to add the information. So I would have endless video calls with them to accurately place their family businesses on the map with its story. Some of them uh, would even send me message messages of the names of the shops and the shops next to them written on a piece of paper and photographed as you are seeing on the screen. This slowed down our data entry process, but it allowed us to be flexible because we, uh, because we care about having this information out there. The map only has one street at this point. Its purpose is to visually show the large magnitude of Armenian presence in the area and to archive and document all these shops that were never recorded anywhere else before. The data collection process also included written posts around different topics relating to the community. For example, recipes, traditions, celebrations, vocabulary and memories such as what was one remember about a certain space. Uh, we, we categorized these posts using uh, different, uh, different hashtags and topics so that in the future when people want to find content of a certain topic, they can search the list of hashtags and it will bring up all related posts. The members uh, would engage through comments or by directly messaging any of us as the admins of the group. In some posts, we ask our members to post pictures from certain years or specific venues and places in Aleppo. The question of consent is very important to us and it's important to highlight here. We have made a tutorial video explaining what consent is and how these pictures can be used after they are posted in the group. We have highlighted the fact that Facebook is also involved in the consent aspect of posting these photos. Since Facebook's terms and conditions mentions that when a photo is posted as a public photo, then it is open to sharing unless it is copyrighted by the person who is posting it. This is important for us because most of these uh, photos and stories are coming from uh, our members' personal archives. Uh, on another note, we recently started noticing more community engagement from our members who became very active in certain areas of High Halib. Pakrat Balabanian, who's a mapping expert, offered to create the map uh, and the interface for our inter interactive map. Matik Ebligatian, a, a writer and a publisher who helped us fill out the missing information um, in our list of Armenian shop. Matik also spent endless hours with me to find the exact locations of the shop on the virtual map. We spent almost uh, almost more than 20 hours with the, with the list and he helped me accurately place them. All of, uh, all of this amounts to one of our goals that we have tried to achieve, namely to create a community. As mentioned, there has been a major divide in Aleppo's Armenian community along political lines. We have tried to bridge the gap through people's stories and memories. As of today, we have around 4, uh, I'm sorry, 5,000 members from, who are living in 50 different countries around the world. Our engagement rate with the posts is over 85%. Even though we have passive members, the outreach of the posts and the content is beyond what we expected. We have also gained offline recognition. For example, I have been stopped by strangers when I was living in Yerevan and asking me if I am the woman from High Halep's team. Through, taking, through talking to people, whether it's through comments, private messaging, or live interviews, we have discovered new faces of Aleppo that we never knew anything about. For example, one of our latest discoveries are disco and jazz bands that not many people know about. Using the map to add all this information is giving us the chance to zoom in and out of the city and also to zoom in and out of how much we know about Aleppo from an Armenian perspective. 
Of course, we have come across many limitations that have affected the way High Halib works. Language is a key component and one of the main reasons why this initiative and this research started in the first place. We thought that by writing the posts in Western Armenian, people would be encouraged to open up and participate in a language that makes them feel more comfortable. We highly encouraged people to feel free to express their thoughts in Armenian script or transliterate them using the Latin alphabet to write in Armenian. However, there's still resistance in the group about writing in Armenian script. We have faced many cases where someone would write a lengthy comment only to be criticized and attacked by other group members for their poor knowledge of, our, uh, of Western Armenian script. This has discouraged many people from writing and participating and sharing information, which links back to the issue of the Armenian and specifically Western Armenian usage in public spaces, and how this is socially and politically constructed. The, nationalist, the nationalistic effect from uh, both living in Syria and its politics and the, politi and the politics within the Armenian community has left people constrained. Many find it hard to express their thoughts and opinions in public. Instead, the opinions they are allowed for them to have are pre-constructed by, by the political parties that they are affiliated with. The silences um, around basic and simple questions uh, such as where did you go to school are very, very loud. These questions become loaded because in Aleppo, when you're asked this question, they want to know your and your family's political affiliation. Given the, uh, prof uh, the proliferation of Armenian schools and belonging to different political factions. Also, this makes us question our methodology and, and the aspect of collecting these stories. For example, we keep asking ourselves questions like how should we find different ways to approach these issues? What kind of wording should we use for these questions? Eventually, after building a connection and establishing trust between us as a team and our members, we were able to get some of these questions uh, answered, but we are still trying and troubleshooting with them. Another aspect of our limitations is the lack of young participants in the group. When we first started, we expected more young people to join because they are more tech savvy and uh, be active parts of the community. However, as, uh, as of now, the largest age group we have on the group is people who are age 45 and more. This may also be due to, uh, due to the fact that the younger generation is migrating from Facebook to Instagram and other platforms, uh, which leaves them out of our main demographic. Due to, the part, uh, due to the age of our participants, most of them face technical difficulties in terms of commenting and engaging with the content, sometimes even watching the videos. And, uh, and I, as I mentioned before, the information of adding uh, their shops to the map. We are still troubleshooting and trying to find the best ways to make the information available and accessible to everyone. At the same time, all of this takes up more time than we originally anticipated and sets us back in terms of what we want to achieve within the group and its posting calendar. Even though the largest uh, number of our members are in Aleppo, we still cannot do live interviews with them. In fact, we generally have less participation from Aleppo, first because of all the reasons I mentioned above, and second, due to the lack of electricity and slow internet. People need to use a VPN to access some of the apps, which, make it, which makes it impossible for them to be able to, uh, to stay connected all the time. Lastly, all of the work that we do in High Halib is volunteer work. For that, we lack consistency in posting or interviews because all of us work or study or do both. We do all the work for High Halib in our free time and sometimes our busy lives takes over, uh, take over and causing us to miss out on posting or hosting an interview. We even had uh, to face some financial troubles as well when we needed to buy a Zoom account where Saratel used his own money, got the problem. And, and all of these issues um, keep interfering with our research process and sometimes even uh, shadow us from, from moving forward. Our long, uh, like I mentioned before, Hi Halib is still a work in progress. It's not a, a published work. We have been working on it for almost uh, two years now. So our long-term plans for High Halib include creating a website where we can start uploading the information that we have collected for a wider public. 
As a team member, I am fascinated with the work that Hushamadian does. Hushamadian's work is focused on recreating Ottoman Armenian village and town life. I can see High Halep going down that road. As a first step, we are now in the process of collecting, categorizing, and archiving the findings that we have. For some posts, we need to polish the content, uh, fix the small grammatical errors, and put them in the forms of articles, films, podcasts, on, and podcasts on our website. The website would serve as a hub where anyone who wants to find information about Aleppo Armenians can find these article, historical, visual material, as well as uh, content. And uh, we will also create a section where you can actually reach out to, to people uh, who are involved in the process. The next step would be to create an archive for people by people. Since no such formal archives exist, this becomes a community effort to try to, uh, to construct one and make it as diverse as possible. The various challenges we face range from updating such a site to including uh, Aleppo Armenians' stories from all walks of life to adhering the ethical guidelines, while at the same time keeping engagement as democratic as possible. Finally, High Halep can and can serve as a reliable source for researchers, academics, artists, or anyone who's interested to use the material for uh, of the archive and add their findings to it. Thank you. Thank you, Kuri. And questions, how to say it? Nona. Questions. Nona, please. Thank you very much. Uh, this was fascinating research and uh, I have uh, not no question really but I, I, I just want to say that um, this is a great job uh, and done in very interesting way and it, it, it is about how new technologies and high techs give us uh, uh, give us new chances to to feel homey to be at home and uh, being uh, uh, being not located actually in, in in the city like Halep and even if it's not uh, possible for political reasons so uh, I just think there is this great book written by uh, Bucitelli uh, which is called uh, Cities uh, Neighborhoods or uh, this is about this this kind of things uh, how communities uh, one of the chapters shows how communities uh, uh, of Boston like ethnic communities or ethnic side community uh, uh, places and, and communities who previously used to live there how they um, actually establish uh, in new communities, new neighborhood, new neighborhood uh, chain or network without even uh, leaving their rooms. So, yeah, thank you very much. That was very interesting travel to these new uh, perspectives and new areas. Thank, thank you so much. Uri Hi, Uri Jan. First of all, it's really nice to see you here. Um, while it's an amazing project, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm having a bit of a hard time seeing it as a research project per se, because it's an amazing archival project. You're creating a big corpus of data that can be useful for a lot of researchers in the future too. But if you are also presenting it as a research project, then I would like you to summarize a little bit what are your main research questions then, aside from all the... Um, various data that you described. What is it that you're trying to find out specifically after you're done collecting all this data? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Our discussant is Arsen Safarov. He received his education in the Central European University in Budapest, Hungary. PhD in international relations from 
London School of Economics and Politics, Political Science. He was CNRS and Chicago University postdoctoral student, and then taught then also Russian and Caucasian history, history of Caucasus in Russia, published then in Rutledge Publishing House, from conflict to, in, to independence or autonomy, when he discusses issues of South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and Nagorno-Karabakh, or Artsakh. He is now an adjunct professor at the chair of international relations at Sharjah University in the United Arab Emirates. He is interested in Soviet national policy, Russian foreign policy, ethnic conflicts, and Caucasus. Asen, we're happy to hear from you. Uh, thank you, Professor Abranian, for inviting me. Uh, it was uh, quite unexpected. And uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, it's OK. We're here. Okay. Uh, so uh, I don't want to spend uh, a lot of time uh, because we're running late and there are four presenters. So I'll try to give some constructive uh, criticisms and some perceptions on uh, based on reading these papers. So I'll start with the way uh, the presentations went through. Uh, so basically, basically, we'll start with uh, Nelly Manucharan's uh, paper on displaced toponymy. It's a very uh, nice, uh, well-written and a very promising research, uh, which I actually quite enjoyed reading. Uh, you pose a question uh, somewhere at the beginning of the research. Uh, it's not really a question, but it's some sort of a surprise uh, that you uh, express that, for example, during the Iranian period, a lot of uh, areas in Yerevan were not called uh, after commemorative uh, persons, so, uh, and it was just very practical naming. This is actually not surprising at all because uh, the period when Iranians were ruling over uh, Yerevan was a pre-modern period during which uh, the place names were used for a very practical reason most of the time. So that's not surprising that they were giving uh, given uh, very practical names rather than any commemorative names. And when the Russian Empire comes in the region, Russian Empire is a representative of a modern uh, Empire, modern European empire, they actually do tend to uh, give and use commemorative names. So this is something to kind of know that this is not surprising that uh, Iranians were using very practical uh, names for that period. Uh, uh, my general criticism uh, at this point, and it's a very mild criticism, is uh, you need to flush out a research question because if you're going to place this work uh, with a very clear research question, it's actually going to fall uh, and turn into a very, very nice uh, research article. Uh, for example, I, uh, when I was reading your paper, uh, I was having some ideas that uh, you can probably trace very, very closely the ideological developments in the Soviet Union with the renamings of the streets in, in Yerevan. Uh, very, very closely. And uh, all it takes is to kind of uh, give a time, a time frame for that and uh, see when the new names appear, uh, how they uh, disappear, uh, and whether they stick or uh, they don't stick around. Uh, one more thing is uh, you will also see that uh, Armenia doesn't follow very clearly the patterns that Terry Martin was describing in his book. Uh, Armenia is clearly, probably together with Georgia, very, very clearly is different in how they uh, implemented Korinizatsa, how the national question played out uh, in this region. So Terry Martin is a good reference point, uh, but have in mind that uh, 
uh, you're going to see a very, very different pattern in, in, in Armenia. Uh, again, this is something that uh, research will definitely benefit from by uh, placing it into the context of how the Soviet uh, policies were changing. Uh, one very brief uh, example that I managed to kind of uh, see on the slide that you showed, uh, you showed a slide which uh, had the names uh, and renamings. And I noticed that uh, there were uh, I think, I'm not sure if it was uh, a square or a street, but uh, maybe there were both of them. Uh, uh, the Turkic Panahan was renamed into Azizbekov. So I don't think this is a surprise uh, because uh, they, on the one hand, they're removing the unacceptable uh, Tsarist uh, or feudal term, but at the uh, same time, they preserving uh, the ethnic component. So this is something which is very, very carefully crafted into how they were carrying out these renamings. So this like very close attention to uh, the ideological developments in the Soviet Union and the timings of the renamings will actually uh, make this paper much, much uh, more uh, interesting. Uh, let me move to uh, uh, the next presenter. Uh, Nicole Margarian's paper. Uh, I actually learned uh, the whole bunch of uh, new uh, onomastic uh, terms uh, from your paper. Uh, and again, I have the same uh, criticism uh, that I had for uh, Nelly. Uh, uh, what I think is uh, going to improve the paper a lot is a very clear research question. Uh, what does it tell us? Uh, what is the importance of uh, names of the businesses displacing the traditional names. How is it, uh, what, what is the research question here? Uh, also, I found that paper is very, very dense and uh, as not being a native of Gumri, I found it very difficult to follow uh, the developments. Uh, so my suggestion would be uh, if you could uh, provide a map uh, of what's going on in there, maybe a, a sketch of some sort, that would actually make it much uh, easier to follow. But again, what I think is uh, going to improve that paper a great deal is if you uh, came up with a research question, that is going to tie together all the, uh, all the, all the practical research that you, uh, you have done with, uh, with that paper. Um, now, the third presenter, uh, Nelly Karapetian, uh, I actually find uh, that your paper is uh, very similar to uh, Nelly Manucharan's paper in a sense that uh, you both can actually uh, frame it in terms of trying to understand the ideological uh, developments uh, and how these ideological developments were reflected in the names in the one hand of the streets and in the other hand of the uh, of the schools uh, also what i think is uh, very interesting here is would be to trace uh, the uh, the story of the very few uh, tsarist era schools uh, because i'm sure they survived uh, but they just became renamed. They, they just acquired new names under the Soviet rule, and then they continued to exist in the post-Soviet times. So since there were very few of these schools, most likely they were very, very centrally located, uh, it would be probably not difficult to actually trace how they uh, changed their names. Uh, in some places, it was uh, somewhat difficult to read the, uh, the paper, because uh, there were chronological uh, inconsistencies. So you would be speaking about the Soviet names and you jump into the Tsarist name and then you jump again into the Soviet name. So if you just could go over these uh, minor uh, details and uh, flush it uh, uh, out so that it's more kind of straightforward in, in a narrative, uh, that would make it much easier to read. 
Uh, also, uh, 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 very interesting, I found that uh, you actually looked into the mechanism of renaming. Uh, and that can also uh, tell us a lot about the ideological values, both in the Soviet times and in the post-Soviet times. How the decision is arrived, are the people on the ground being consulted? Do they have any objections to, uh, to that or, or not? Uh, the final aspect that I uh, kind of remember from your uh, paper is uh, why some Soviet uh, characters remained and some did not remain. And I think I uh, can actually kind of uh, illustrate it a little bit. Uh, what what we see here is is not only the case of, of the schools we can see it in a, in the streets as well. Uh, there are some uh, Soviet characters which are not negatively perceived in Armenia. Uh, we all know, for example, that uh, we have uh, Spandaran, I think, uh, Spandaran Square and Garigin Nezde. Uh, metro station or, or the other way around, I, I forgot right now, in Yerevan. And we, we basically see the ideological opponents being uh, uh, neighbors uh, in, in the street. So this is not surprising that some of the uh, Soviet era names continued to uh, exist uh, and were not removed. Uh, from my work in the archives, I can tell you uh, another story, I don't remember uh, the name of the person, but uh, I found a very interesting letter at some point in which uh, relatives of uh, a member of the first Armenian Revcom, uh, who was later on killed by Stalin, uh, were asking uh, Karen Demerchan to name a school after him or put a commemorative plant on, uh, on one of the buildings. And this was rejected. And uh, the reason it was rejected, uh, it was like not openly stated, but you could read between the lines. The reason why it was rejected was that character, uh, unfortunately, I don't remember exactly who that was, but that character played uh, from the Armenian national point of view, played a very, very negative role uh, by uh, being virtually anti-Armenian in his uh, political position and more pro-Azerbaijanis than pro-Armenian. And you can see that later on in the Soviet times, uh, Armenian Communist Party uh, preferred to ignore his memory. While, for example, people like Shaoman, people like uh, some other Soviet uh, characters of Armenian uh, origin would be commemorated. Uh, and the final uh, final paper, Kuri's uh, paper, is uh, very nicely written. Uh, I enjoyed reading it. Very, very uh, alive language. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I think if you're planning to turn into uh, academic work, you need a research question. Uh, and uh, I can very clearly see there is a, a huge amount of uh, work that went into that. Uh, but if you're going uh, to uh, find a research question for that, that would turn into a very, very nice uh, project. I had some questions. Uh, maybe you did it intentionally. Uh, maybe it's very clear to you, but it's not very clear to, let's say, uh, somebody who is outside. Uh, the region, you were speaking about fears uh, among the Armenian community, and you were speaking about two political parties. And I'm curious, are you, you mean Armenian political parties or political parties in uh, Syria? Uh, and what are the fears? And I understand that it might be uh, ethically uh, difficult uh, issue to kind of bring up because, you know, you can actually have people living currently in there. Uh, but that would be something that needs to be uh, highlighted. In terms of uh, kind of, maybe it's not a research question, but in terms of making this research, uh, don't want to say relevant, but uh, more focused, 
Did you think about, uh, especially since you've been in Yerevan and obviously some Syrian Armenians were recognizing you, have you noticed any patterns of uh, the shops either carrying on the names that they had in Syria or the distribution? Uh, of of the shops because I I know that uh, Syrian uh, businesses in Armenia they concentrated in in Yerevan they concentrated in uh, several locations so do you see any uh, continuity between uh, how they were situated in uh, Halep and how they situated in Armenia or maybe in some other locations where uh, Armenians from uh, Syria relocated. Uh, the reason I'm asking this is because uh, there was a uh, research long time ago about how the colonists from England who settled in America uh, had basically uh, moved the pattern of their settlements from England into America. And you basically can actually see that the village with this name is located north of the village with another name and it maps the pattern that was uh, back let's say in England. So I'm curious if we do see any continuity like that. My other question regarding uh, your uh, research which can actually be useful in terms of a research question is uh, did the names of the shop uh, were just practical names or they actually uh, refer to some memories, especially because uh, the people who opened those shops were genocide survivors. So do you see any kind of continuity or any commemoration uh, of maybe lost places from where they originally were uh, or not? And also, why did they all settle uh, around uh, Tilal Street? Uh, any reason for that? Was it uh, uh, the cheapest neighborhood? when they moved in, uh, any other kind of reasons to settle in that area. So I'll uh, wrap it up at this because I think uh, I already spoken for quite some time. And I guess I'll leave it open to more questions, which I'm sure will be forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you, Arsene. It's the time for the speakers now to answer the question. We'll go in the same succession. Nelly will answer all the questions addressed to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Saparov, for your time and effort for reading and making your uh, uh, so uh, valuable comments. I will, of course, taking into account while developing and elaborating the uh, research question. Um, as I have already mentioned, uh, this is the very initial stage of my research, and I put uh, the hypothesis, and I thought that it is uh, clear that uh, I, I am trying to shape the research question like as how did the urban development project in Soviet periphery um, become an example of foreign and domestic policy interplay in Soviet state? But of course, I will take uh, into account uh, your um, suggestions uh, for, for developing the, the research questions uh, more deeply. As for uh, mentioning about the um, uh, Yerevan during Persian rule, it wasn't uh, surprising for me uh, also. I was just mentioning and just counting the, the periods to shape kind of picture to give uh, uh, to give kind of introductory text uh, to show the contrast between uh, Tsarist Russia rule, uh, Persian rule, and then Soviet uh, policy on the top, um, to, like uh, the, the policy of naming and renaming the districts. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for, for all your comments. This is, uh, this, uh, th those are really valuable for me. Um, uh, I will now reflect on the other questions. The first one pertained to whether within the framework of repatriation there were districts that were... I just want to clarify 
Are we talking about the 40s? Mr. Artron uh, asked that question. We're talking 1940s uh, about the great repatriation wave uh, was this question. Uh, 1946. My research pertains to the 20s and 30s of the 20th century. Yes, in the 40s, to the best of my knowledge, there was this district called Akhparashen, but one needs to understand whether that was the official name or the informal name. In my subsequent research, I will, of course, include this. As far as I know, in 45-46, in the wake of the Great Repatriation, uh, this was one district uh, next to Sebastia Malatia. Uh, the other question uh, was asked by Nona Shah Nazarian, which was pertaining to Gulbenkian's Echmiadzin Yerevan Highway, uh, renaming that highway after Gulbenkian. That was interesting. I will consider that, of course. But I have to say that. One of the renowned figures of AGBU was used to call Nubarashen. So I will I will consider your observation, of course, your comment. Thank you. The next is Nicole. Thank you. I will start with Arsen Safarov's comments. And I will also reflect on others' questions in passing without singling them out. Thank you very much for the idea of the map. Yes, it was worth uh, mapping this, but judging from your following question and other the questions by others, I have to say that perhaps focusing mostly on the quantity of examples to highlight the point and to prove that it was quite widespread. I, in the version that I have sent to you uh, in print, both the question and the answer and the methodology are laid down. The main purpose was to demonstrate how the names of enterprises turn into urban names and why. It seems to me that I at least succeeded to answer both questions. And even in the latter case, answering the why question, I offered several rationales. So if it's necessary, I could uh, reflect on them further. Perhaps it was necessary to reiterate several points uh, a few times to focus the attention of the audience to the question proper, which I try to illustrate with examples. As for novelty, We could uh, look at it at two levels. Nona raised that question. The one is on the onomastic level, the novelty, because uh, from this vantage point, when you look at the ergonomic phenomena, how they turn into names of a different category, they become landscape names. And how does that happen? Specifically, in the event of Lena Khan Gyumri, this is already on the urbanist uh, plane. How does this process happen? And the next question, how come that they begin to be remembered not through other names, but even if it's small enterprises, they become their own reference points. You no longer have to say the cafe on Kirov 
you just mentioned the cafe and since uh, as opposed to the soviet period it's not only cafes and shops that have names but also many other enterprises they become the reference points for their own areas they refer to this to uh, identify the place in many segments of the city people navigate by the uh, city mall locations uh, and that uh, was uh, in respect in answering your next question i don't know whether it will satisfy you or not and ganesha boyan's methodological observations the printed version that i circulated contained several approaches that were used to collect material. There were 100 questionnaires circulated, quick, brief questions. Uh, questionnaires were handed out where official and non-official formal and informal names were mentioned on the questionnaire and the respondents had to mention whether they're aware, familiar or not, if familiar, what area do they identify it with? And last but not least, they had to answer where, which district they live in and whether they uh, used to live in another one and which. In Facebook uh, platform in the group Alexandropol Gyumri, I also posted a big list of names. I can't recall the number of uh, clicks or comments, uh, the comments um, were quite significant and uh, informative. Uh, there was a special uh, standalone list of uh, street names and another list of uh, districts and squares, not to distract the attention of respondents. And this proved to be quite useful. I got a lot of feedback which allowed me to orient here. I had also six in-depth uh, questionnaires with knowledgeable persons familiar with all those six districts. Not to mention that I also continually observe and monitor living in the city. I move around, ask around. As far as I remember, I have made there are many uh, notes taken as a result, which uh, are significant as research material. And finally, the question why, if I'm not mistaken, let Gane correct me. In her question, there was this question that the authorities exercise their muscle. I agree, but when it boils down to the naming dissonance and the communication crisis. Based on democratic principles, one has to prioritize the quotidian names. And they have to be formalized. I adhere to this position, and this is exactly what epitomizes the democratic approach. I do not propose a revolution, of course. In many European cities, they use this very principle, like in Paris, and even in post-Soviet Russia, there have been historic names that the people have been using that were formalized. Those cases are not unheard of. I am thankful for the questions asked. Nelly will now answer. Thank you for all the comments, observations, and questions. Let me reflect first on Mr. Safarov's comments. Of course, all comments shall be taken notice of in pursuing this research further and turning it into a paper. Apart from that, as for the First Republic uh, schools, tracing uh, them and uh, 
following up on the information. I, of course, still continue my research and will do my best to trace them. Since the First Republic was very brief uh, in its existence, especially in official paperwork, nowhere officially there is any record or not yet found a uh, name of a school. I assume that the names existing there too far just survived. As for consultations with the local population or not in the renaming process, during my interviews with various uh, quarter inhabitants and school staffers, I tried to find an answer to this question whether they were ever consulted the locals, but never encountered a single case where such consultations would have been held with the community in question with respect to the renaming, of course. The Soviet names that survived, Shahumyan, Spandarian, schools, and also Miasnikyan, let me add it, it was not renamed. I, of course, mentioned that for lack of time, I'm not reflecting at great length on this phenomenon. Mr. Abrahamian, in his uh, studies, already has the answer to this question, because those heroes were more of national uh, characters and figures. Uh, for lack of time, and space in the text, I did not expand too much on that aspect. And now let me reflect on the questions asked. The first question pertained to whether the communities ever motioned for such renamings have there ever been successful, if any? Yes, there are such examples available as well, but mostly in the periphery, in Nork or other suburbs. For example, the school called after Norik Hachatrian was a student in the same school. He lost his life in the Artsakh uh, freedom struggle. So both the administration of the school and the general consent of the community were conducive to renaming the school. It was a common understanding. Uh, so it was a grassroots uh, petition. There are other calls like this called after benefactors also grassroots petitions rather than top-down. And the second question pertained to uh, formulating the research question and what's the significance of the study. As I mentioned in the beginning, the question was to look at the impact of political ideological transformations on the renaming of schools. The school here was not only a physical space, but also a social space. This question I have encountered a lot in the virt virtual space discussions and criticism. Why should the school be renamed to begin with, since it's an educational institution? What's the significance of such a renaming? For lack of time, I did not present too many photographs uh, to illustrate the point. In the event of renaming, there are museums incorporated into the schools. There are classrooms that are converted into museums. Memorial plaques are attached. Every year there are annual events to commemorate the person in question and his or her deeds. And question arises, why should this person be remembered? Uh, what's the significance of this? 
uh, the study could also focus uh, eventually on applied anthropology and focus on whether this practice of renaming should carry on. Maybe this procedure or the law should be amended to preclude that. For example, in my personal opinion is uh with respect to one item in this uh, regulation uh, allowing to rename it in after a natural person who contributed uh financially to the school if a person contributes funding to the renovation of the school and the school is subsequently renamed in his or her honor moreover there is a plaque or a memorial corner designated to the person, a student of the school who daily encounters this person's memorabilia. A question arises, who was this person? And if this person has not, for example, has nothing noteworthy, whether academic or cultural accomplishments, to report is just a entrepreneur maybe not even in armenia or but elsewhere and may even uh, have a criminal record a question may arise why should the school be renamed after this person and what is their what is the benefit for the school or the student they're at the next question pertained Mr. Markarian mentioned that uh, there is intergenerational aspect that could be used to look at this or collecting information. Yes. Within the framework of this communication, the first item has been handled, the intergenerational aspect one of the representatives of those generations is present here in this auditorium, Madame Maastricht Israelian, and the younger ones were also consulted. Exactly. The next question pertained to nostalgia. Let me tell you that this in my field work was not focused on maybe there were no expressions there but thank you for the comment i will pay more attention hereafter maybe nostalgia is part of the reason why the old names uh, persevere that's it thank you uh, and last but not least huri will Hopefully, she'll connect. Uri, Uri your turn. Okay. Um, I, will, I will respond in English. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Saparo, for your amazing questions. Um, I guess in terms of the first question, I will combine um, I will combine yours and what Lilith asked about finding a research question in all of this. Well. Uh, I mentioned uh, during my presentation that this is not a completed research. This is a work in progress. Uh, so part of the reason why we we started all of this is to to actually take fragments of it and turn them into individual research uh, projects. Because what we're doing is on a very very large magnitude, and uh, at this point, uh, I personally I'm I'm focusing on on researching my my school's history, uh, we have other members in the group who are uh, focused on on the music bands of Aleppo. So these research questions are streaming, like the lines um, are branching out as we go, and um, we've seen a lot of interests from from students who are in, actually in different fields, who have different focuses on Aleppo, but. The whole idea is that to do a research, we need material and the lack of material was was stopping us from doing anything or because if you're at any academic institution, you have a time frame to complete your research and not having any data 
most of the time uh, we had these discussions among students that it's it just it just stops you from doing your research or you decide to change your topic just because you have to submit a dissertation or a project on time so so yeah in the in the future uh, we do see this turning into not only academic work but beyond and i personally would like to take some aspects of it uh, for my for my future PhD when I'm done with my graduate studies and focus on different um, areas of what comes out of High Halib's research. Uh, going to the second question about the political parties um, and, and the fears of speaking out. Uh, in Aleppo, uh, uh, generally in Syria, the governing party is the state party and no other parties are affiliated kind of politically in in the decision making, but amongst the Armenian community, the the three traditional uh, political parties exist to some extent. Uh, they each own their 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 set of schools and scouting and uh, other activities. Even some churches are divided based along political lines. Um, however, there as as most of you know, there have always been tensions between uh, these three three specifically traditional Ar Armenian political parties in all diaspora communities, especially in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and these tensions kind of uh, kept, uh, kept people from even like Armenians within the Armenian community from interacting with each other, from sharing stories and experiences. Um, and it is interesting to mention that um, as team members, we all went to different schools that are affiliated with different parties and we keep laughing about this that how ironically all of us came together and formed this team so even the formation of the team kind of crosses the line beyond the the political borders that we we have been put into in Aleppo not to talk and interact with each other um, as to the to the pattern of the shops in Yerevan, uh, well, I have lived in Yerevan for nine years before moving to London in 2021, um, and I have I have definitely noticed these patterns of shops, especially when Syrian Armenians uh, started moving to to Armenia. Uh, I can give you one example on on Gokhbatsi Street, close to close to Republic Square where if you walk there now, you will see a set of like, in, in, in the tiny bit of the street, like you would, you would find a lot of uh, shops that are owned by Syrian Armenians and they are opening right next to each other. Uh, most of it is because they, they refer to each other. So if, if I open a shop and my friend wants to open a shop, I talk to the landlord they arranged it in a way that they helped each other open up their businesses, but it ended up being now the street where all Syrian Armenians have shops. Also, uh, the tunnels underneath Republic Square Metro, it's called uh, Aleppo Market or Halebishuga, where you can also see like a lot of shops, whether it's a barber shop or it's a printing shop or um, a shop that sells different food and spices. Um, and and this is a leap way to, to the next question about the shop names in Aleppo. Uh, some of them, uh, some of them just carry the family name. So it's whatever their family name is, whether it's Sarkisian or Nakashian or Yeramian or whatever. And, and then it says like the jewelry shop or a library or whatever. Um, others do carry names of cities like Marash or Antab or even we had a lot of things named Kilikia because people from the Kilikia region uh, ended up in Aleppo somehow. So, so the names, there are some changes to them. And you can also find like very organic names that, you know, like, I don't know, the, the green wall uh, grocery shop or whatever. So, but you can, you can tell the Armenian shops just because they usually had their their shop signs written in Armenian as well, uh, which you can recognize that even if the name doesn't hint anything to Armenian, it is written in Armenian script, so you can you can see it. Um, and 
As for the last question uh, to why Armenia settled in the in Tilel Street or in Jdeide the area in general, is because the Armenian presence in Aleppo predates the Armenian genocide. There were Armenians in Aleppo for centuries through different Armenian kingdoms that have reached Aleppo. And then uh, one of the main reasons is because of the 40 Martyrs Church or the Karasun Manuk, which has been there since the 15th century. It is in the area, so it helped. Um, it was, <coughs> I'm sorry, it was easier for people to, to come and settle close to the church. Um, for example, uh, the school that I went to is located in this area, and its name is um, Giligian High School. Um, and the name comes from because people who have migrated from the city of Cis in the, in the Cilician Kingdom to, uh, uh, to Aleppo in different, er in, in different times, they settled in these houses. And so my school was basically a refugee house uh, after 1915. And the street until today is called Sisi Street because it refers to people who came from Sis and settled in this, um, in this area. Um, I hope I answered all your questions. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Huri. Uh, Himaming, uh, and now we shall adjourn for a 15 minute break. Please be on time upon your return. We have one more session. Please be here at uh, <coughs> quarter to the hour. Recording stopped.
Սիրելի բարեկամներ, հուսամ դեր շատ հոգնած չեք, մենք մեկնարկում ենք այսօրվա մեր վերջին նիստը, որը նվիրված է կաղաքի կերպարին, բանախոսներն են Վիկտորա Վասիլանը, Մարամավետիսանը, Սոնամ Նացականյանը և Տիգրան Սիմյանը, յուրականչուրը գիտեք, որ ունեք 20 ռոպ է հատկացված ժամանակ, ներկայացնը մեր առաջին բանախոսին Վիկտորա Վասիլյանը, Հայաստանի գիտությունների ազգային ակալձեմայի հնագիտության ազգագրության ինստիտութի գիտաշխատող է, արվեստաբան, հնագետ, պատմական Հնդրեմ վիկտորը։ Մի խոսքով ուզենային նշել, թե որ տեղից ծակետ ես գաղափարը, կնոչ գերպարով կաղաքի անցնավորումը ներկայացնել բաղագույն ժամանակաշրջանից միջև մեր որերը։ Ատենախոսթյանս պաշպանթյան � որոշեցինք, որ վերջի գլուխը պետք է նվիրված ունի կաղաքամար դիցույիներին և ենտեղ կտանք բազմաթիվ արքետիպեր, որոնք որ ունեն զարգացում միջև մեր որերը։ Վլխավորապես տասնին։ For modern Armenia, and also we found that it could have some developments in the last eight years. We found many archetypes. I will make my presentation in English. The city in human form first appeared in Hellenic art, but its iconographical roots date back to earlier times. Social welfare can be associated with a defeat figures such as Tuche or successive heroes of state power. Artists created this character similar to heroes or demigods, possibly initially standing between divine and human sphere. Here you can see um, the image recording in progress from Artashat. And holy city could be portrayed as male or female figure, while female image was more prevailing. Close connection with male figure of demos reflects ambivalent character of urban culture. Polis can be understood as principal unit of Greek society in whole antiquity. Personification of polis understood as broad and diverse social, geographical, and political phenomenon can be approached by an analysis of archaeological and written sources. Defining polis in Mycelinous Hellenistic society is a complex task, uh, task especially when social historical context is not directly reflected by individual archaeological finds and detailed historical data. Uniform definition could not be appropriate as meaning and function of Polish change. Classical authors largely defined Polish as com community and territory, while autonomy and independence were obligatory. Um, analysis of the multiple Musical and how can I change? Uh -huh. yes. okay. Uh, analysis of the musical and ritual text of ancient West showed that cities were often identified with male characters described as women, as virgins, and so on. Human image as a personification of a country, a land, a city can be seen in Armenian highlands for the first time in the iconography of the Hittites and Urartian kingdoms, where the enthroned patron uh, goddess uh, was a symbol of fortress and the guarantee of fortune of city. The inscription of Meher's door uh, mentioned a number of deities who are the patrons of mountains, countries, and seas. The goddess Tushpoe was considered as a symbol and the patron goddess of the impregnable fortress of the city Tushpavan. In the Armenian tradition, the city of Van was built by Shamiram or Semiram, Sem, 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 Semiramis, it was called Semiramake, uh, which provides basis not only for the identification of Shamiram with Tushpoe, but also for the identification of images of the city patron goddesses with queens. 
Comparative analysis of cuneiform data show that in the kingdom of Van, queens were also considered to be the viceroys of the goddesses on earth, their supreme priests often appearing in a similar images. And here you can see such images in Basilic rocks. In this regard, the analysis of the image of a woman as an allegory of the city in the context of biblical tradition is very remarkable. From the point of view of revealing the peculiarities of the iconography of the patron goddess of the country or the city, we consider extremely important Vladimir Taparov's observation. The author clearly shows that there are two types of cities in cultural text. A cities protected by the virgin goddess of war uh, and B cities engaging in trade under the patronage of the mother goddess. During the war, the city had not have a strong defense system. The gates of the city were closed by the goddess. And during the merchantry, the gates of the city were opened. The patron goddess ensured fertility to patronage of the city. And Vladimir Taparov divided them into two types. A, prodigal cities, B, virgin cities. The example of the first city was Babylon in the image of a prostitute with the closed gates of the gods. And the second is heavenly Jerusalem in the image of the bride with the open gates. These two opposing characters, according to the researcher, are the two sides of the mother goddess which ensured her wellness period of eternity. We have the same cultural image in Armenia from the Urartian period until yet, as the patron goddess of the country, the city. One of such heroic characters for Armenia is summed up in idea of mother Armenia, the capital, the hero. However, the image of mother city goddess has come a long way in our country before it turned into the image of the capital, starting from the heroines of mother city goddess, who were presented as a humanized, personified images of Armenia. Um, if we will start from the beginning, then from the point of view of iconography, the goddess of the capital as the patron saint of the country originated in Armenia from ancient times and bore the stamp of the Hellenistic period. And uh, the Grand the Great presented Antiochia or Tuche uh, as his patron deity in order to legitimize his authority and emphasize his divine nature. The cult of the mother goddess was also spread in Armenia during Hellenism, which was compared to Anahit, who during the Artaxet period from the time of Tigran the Great was depicted on the reverse of the royal coins as the king's mother guardian. As the patron saint of Artaxat, she was also associated with Tuche Antiochia, whose statue was erected near Antioch on a hill on the banks of the Orontes River during the Selefkid period. Tuche, the image of city goddess, later became a prototype for the representation of queens of, uh, on Armenian coins. And such examples we have from Artashat. And here you can see such a depiction with Tigran the Great. And we call them Artashat city goddess, found from Artashat as well as coins brought from Cilicia, Damascus, Tigrana, Gert, Delphi, Antioch. Dozens of coins with the half face of Queen Erato were found from the ancient site of Artashat, on the obverse of which she is presented with her hair cutting on the neck. And here um, you can see such a city goddess, and this is a representation of Erato. Uh, and uh, on the reverse, the model of the city of Artashat's defense wall, and she is the uh, defender and she is guardian of the city. This is also a vivid proof of the comparison of the images of the queens with the goddess of the capital and identification with Artashat as the patron and guardian of the city. Now let's try to find the prototypes of these cities or regions depicting in the image of capital city goddesses representing as a woman. As it is known, presenting the homeland in the form of mother or female is a common pictorial metaphor and can be appealed to wider and archaic idea of motherland. Um, Alexander the Great in 1331, after the famous victory of Arbela, ordered a sculpture, the reconstruction of which was presented in Rome for the palace of Chigi. And here you can see uh, the sculpture depicts the dream of Achaemen Queen Atossa through the personifications uh, of ancient women in the image of Europe and Asia, facing the famous type, uh, type of capital goddesses with the mural crown uh, with the inscription Europe and Asia. 
As twin sisters, they hold a shield depicting the victory of Macedonian troops at the famous Battle of Arbela. It is not worthy, however, that uh, in the turbulent historical periods of Armenia, these goddesses were represented in different semantics. After the liberation of the Roman Empire's world ideology, the goddess of fortune and the goddess of victory were presented as symbols of defeated countries. And here you can see defeated Asian countries, uh, and one of them is also Armenia. During the reign of Augustus and during the Julian-Claudian period, the allegories of cities and lands are usually presented as a symbol of defeated country in the form of woman with a mural crown on her head, which is often found in mosaics, coins, and sculptures. Numerous examples have been found from the Hellenistic period when the city was represented by a woman in the company of rivers and lakes. The personification of Armenia was also represented on the Roman coins ordered by Trajan between the allegories of Tigrisis and Euphrates male rivers. And here you can see such a coin. In the uh, territory of Cilicia, as in other parts of Armenia, the cult of the goddess of capital was widespread who as the goddess of fortune was often met with examples of both coins and sculptures. In the late 1930s, archaeologists from Princeton University found an ancient mosaic of the goddess Cilicia from the territory of the ancient Armenian city Cilicia Mausoleum, where she is, uh, this is from Adana, now it is kept in our National Museum, and uh, you can see there. And this is goddess Cilicia, and with inscription Cilicia, Corona Muralis on her head. She is depicting in the contemporary dress of an ancient woman sitting under a tree, facing the personification of a Mesopotamian woman depicting next to her, from which part of her leg and part of cornucopia has been preserved. Beside her was Yefrat, Tigris, Jehan, Tarson, Rivers. Two of that names have not been kept. And here you can see one part of cornucopia. The image of the beloved mother city goddess woman as Armenian personification is known to us from the Ark of Trajan in Benvenutus reliefs. And this is this relief, uh, where she is kneeling on one foot before Roman Emperor Trajan on the image of Tuche, goddess between Tigris and Euphrates River. The picture of the fallen Armenian personification between two rivers is also reflected on Roman coins depicting Trajan. Tuche as a symbol of defeated Armenia also was represented on Diocletianus and Maximus triumphal arc sculpture compositions. Uh, his uh, restored and the newly represented um, um, image we can see in Dialata program and the remaining sculpture moves are stored now in Rome on the Capitolinian Museum which is attributed to Diocletian in Maximus and here you can see the another Armenia as Tuche mother city goddess. And one of the heroic images of the city for Armenia is summed up in the idea of motherland. The image of Mother Armenia first emerged as a symbol of the National Liberational Movement. His subsequent revival also lived in the medieval Armenian culture, with the image of loyal Armenian noble woman under his jaw as poster on 19th century by Janik Aramian on 1862 that uh, was um, kept in France, and it was written by an, uh, an, uh, an artist, writer, publicist, and reformer of the Armenian alphabet. His composition was published in an improved form in the August 16, uh, in 1861, in Paris Weekly, and here you can see. The poster was called Spirit of Armenia, Mother Armenia, Armenia, or, or Ruins of Ani, or I Mourn for You, Armenia. It became the first example of an Armenian poster on the theme of patriotic struggle, presenting Mother Armenia as a disparate crying woman sitting on the ruins, outlining the basis of the Ararat Araks perspective, surrounded by the ruins of 12 historical Armenian capitals, Armavir, Artashat, Dvin, Ani, Kars, Van, Vagar, Shapat, etc. 
and here you can see another representation. Um, and as, as well, the ruins of the shrine of the goddess Anahit in Artashat, the shrine of Bahagan in Ashtishat, the ma mother cathedral of Echmiati. In the middle of them, the artist placed the seated image of a young Armenian woman in a sitting position in a costume dedicated by the Renaissance goddesses. In the foreground of the painting, the artist placed Bell's armor, the Ashakuni dynasty flag, the Artaxia crown with the image of eagles, a spear, a dagger, an arrow, and bow. Mother Armenia be became one of the most popular figures in Armenian iconography of the 19th and 20th century, meaning the historical Western Armenia. This example then was depicted on Edelbesim carpet stamps, poster, postcards. And here you can see one of them now, now is kept in Sardarabad. And Armenian queens as spirit of Armenia. Every discourse of, on female allegory in general and female character in war memorabilia in particular implies another aspect. The relationship of the human body to the state, which is highly gendered one. It is noteworthy that this tradition was so deeply rooted in 19th century that it was reborn in Soviet art since 1945. Even the two world wars of 20th century do, did not eliminate the woman's ideals and her powerful worship. After the end of the war, the entire Soviet Union began to stop the motherland and women's personality, symbolizing the freedom of the country. The monument of victory, imaginating the feminist differences of the nation state of the 19th century, showed the weekly point that uh, still exists in the idea of citizenship. These mon monuments are dedicating to the memo memory of men, although they use the beauty of the female body in their content. In the Soviet Union, Motherland and Victory Monument were praised for the Patriotic War. By recording the consequences of the war, the war memorials, according to Barbara Coral, played a special role. By sacralizing military forces and cautioning the issue of the material body by means of eradication of mystification, they produced that national sovereign subject. From the national patriotic point of view, it is the masculine body sacrificed mostly voluntarily on the altar of the fatherland. And this body fundamentally underlies any victim discourse to which the relationship of the female body to the state, on the other hand, is quite differently constructed since women had no access to the military forces and could not sacrifice their body on the altar. They were erected to expected to provide the patria with sons whose body was then offered on this altar and whose death later could be mourned by the wives, mothers. And the living condition of women in the 19th century, uh, says Ruth Roach Pearson. Because military service was the key to uh, full citizenship and promise of extended civil rights, women were excluded from the state political scheme, but they were not excluded from the national embrace. Nonetheless, the women saw themselves after the Great War again firmly in the national embrace, was portrayed uh, in monuments as a nameless mourning mother on the nation or as a triumphal Nike, once again proving its suitability as a figure for patriotic heroes or sacrifices. In Armenia, since the most ancient times, the mother goddesses and virgin warriors were identified with the homeland and were considered as patronists and keeper guardians of the native earth and the country. During development, that uh, antique female allegory of Armenia revives in monuments by Ara Harutunyan, here you can see, Ara Sarkisyan, uh, in the image of Anahit Adibek Grigorian's mother Armenia, and Bertashan mother Armenia, uh, now it is in Artsakh, uh, in Marton region. Prototype of the image Mother Armenia, which first appeared in Rome as a symbol of defeated country over the centuries, has become a symbol of victory and became the mother and guardian of the nation in new and modern period. Armenian nation that survived the genocide, survived the massacres, suffered wars, earthquakes, and are still on the stage of geopolitical developments in the East and the West. For our people, the image of the city became multifaced. First, um, and first, if uh, we try to typify image of the city in us, it came in four, uh, four types. A is the mother goddess, the symbol of the victorious country. B is an image of a defender, um, defeated city or country represented by Rome. 
And here we have such a representation. Sees Armenia as personification of Armenia mooring in the ruins of Ani. And this mother Armenia is a symbol of the spirit of war and defender of the city country. The other important aspect refers to the dual faced image of the city as the motherland and fatherland. We see this approach from Hellenism as demos, people, and police city. The symbol of capital in our popular perception is considered Yerevan after, after the First Republic of Armenia, and as fatherland, we consider Gyumri Alexandrapol. In the sacred and holy religious city image, we have Echmiatin, Vagarshapat, Horvirap, Dvin, Sis. Ani and Kars became the symbols of lost Western Armenia. Cilicia, Tarsus, and Romkola became the royal cities of the Renaissance and symbols of homeland. However, in this respect, it is noteworthy that the ruins of Ani became a symbol of the lost homeland in the collective image of all cities of Western Armenia. Ani was associated with the Armenian style. Artashat Garni Van was the capital of art and the royal residency. Erebuinu Yerevan is still considered city of sun and capital. Gyumri is a cultural capital which after, in, uh, after 1988 earthquake became a mooring city and mainly associated with the ruins of Ani. The other cultural capital, Shushi, the center in Artsakh, which became a symbol of the whole lost Artsakh in 2020, in the psychology of our people was identified with the history of occupation of cars. Thus, according to the functions, we can classify the image of cities. A, capitals of sun as commerce production. B, cities of education, enlightenment, art, culture. C, religious cities and centers. And D, lost territories, mowering cities, symbolizing Armenian's mowering. The prototype of the iconography of the capital, which first originated from the Greeks, was, was transformed over the centuries, became a symbol of victory in the new and modern eras, the guardian mother of the people. The image of the capital did not lo uh, lose its traditional description among the people during its development. It is connected with the militant image of the mother goddess rooted in the national self-consciousness. And here you can see the last image, see Mother City Goddess from Artasha. Thank you very much. Shnora Kaltsun, Victoria, Shatretak, Kivze Kutsman Hamar, Yete Kan Hartsesh. Thank you, Victoria, for an interesting presentation. If you have questions to Victoria, please, you can ask her. Thank you, Victoria. It was a very interesting presentation specifically. In relation to Shushi, I would like to say the following. Uh, Shushi is a bride uh, connected to White Church Cathedral, Ghazan Chenot's Church, or the Church of the Savior. And in uh, the literature, uh, Shushi is considered to be a bride and among the people as well. White color of Ghazanchenot church is associated with a bride wearing white gown. So this is another image that we can use in your imagery. Thank you. Do we have other questions? It's not a question. It's a continuation to what Gohar has said. Probably <coughs> related to this, uh, the military operation of liberating Shushi was called wedding in the mountains. I have referred to this. I refer to an article which represents Shushi as a bride. Shushi is understood as a bride, then wedding in uh, the mountain. The name of the well-known military operation after which Shushi was liberated by Armenian forces. And then Levon Hyrapetian, a benefactor, organized large wedding ceremony for several hundreds of couples and until now uh, this, it was organized actually in two places in Gandhasar monastery as well as in Shushi but Gandhasar is forgotten and basically they refer to wedding in Shushi around St. Ghazanchenot's church. I will definitely respond to your comments at the end. If people who follow us on Zoom have 
No questions, we can move forward to the second presentation. Uh, talk by Maria Mavetisian. Master student of culturology at the Yerevan State University, interested in uh, social anthropology, specifically gender studies, uh, urban anthropology, conflict and social sciences, migration and diaspora studies. She's working in the Armenia Cinema Center as the coordinator of the archive and her presentation is related to post earthquake city recovery visions and their impact on city development for using the example of the white city or uh, sorry uh, spitak city sorry so In 1988, we had the devastating earthquake, which had a serious impact on the further development of the city. It destroyed all the industrial part of the and industrial quarters of the city, leaving some buildings and drains, and uh, there was cut of power and water supply and gas supply. So during those days, Spitak was at the core of international media and they were flooded with information about the devastating earthquake in Spitak because it was the most famous among the natural disasters that happened in the last decades of the 20th century. And uh, there was no Spitak city, there was a whole area left in ruins burning plants, a crazy city covered with whipping mothers and running around people looking for their relatives. There were several visions suggested for the recovery of the city and what did the former mayor of Spitak uh, Surinavetisian. So this is the post-earthquake picture of Spitak. There were several rounds of recovery. The first one was related to the international humanitarian aid, and it has some imprints of uh, several countries that have provided their support. However, most of the countries provided uh, basically uh, the first aid provided some tents, also medicine and food for the survivors and survivors. And then there was a need to build some shelters for the people. So different contracting companies arrived uh, to Spitak and wrote necessary raw materials in order to build those shelters. Uh, the work started without any master plan. And uh, because of the seismic situation, it was decided to move to the beyond its boundaries, so closer to the Yerevan Spitak Highway. Some of the districts have been built, and out of gratitude, people of Spitak have called them Estonian, Norwegian, Finnish, Italian, Uzbek, Swiss, etc., by the names of the countries that have supported the recovery. This is the Uzbek district of Spitak. This is the Norwegian district, uh, actually part of the Norwegian district. The Norwegian Red Cross also support, funded uh, building of a Spitak hospital and in memoria of uh, Norwegian humanist and a friend of the Armenian nation, Friedrich of Nansen, is named after him. Then several wooden houses have been built along the highway by the Norwegian government uh, for those doctors who will be working in Spitak Hospital in order to help them to 
have accommodation. There were some temporary shelters which were built. So here in the Norwegian quarter, there are also four nuns who had arrived following the call of Mother Teresa and is now working in Spitak with people with disabilities mostly. Uh, it is uh, on the outskirts of the city of Spitak, and it's not considered to be a very prestigious area. I also looked at the Swiss quarter, which was built by the Swiss people according to the city plan. It was supposed to be the center of uh, the new city. Uh, it was decided also to build a church here, but soon the master plan changed, uh, so the foundation of the church is there, but uh, the construction is left unfinished. Today in Spitak we have some specific corners of those countries as a resemblance of the support and uh, they're named after the countries that have supported uh, the construction. So the newly built Spitak was located at some distance from the historic city, and there is an empty space between the two cities. Of course, uh, there are some commuters taking people to the new place, but it doesn't solve the issue because uh, it seems that you are dealing with two separate cities. So after the earthquake, it was decided also to restore the industrial quarter in the city. It is well known that Spitak was a small industrial city with several factories during the Soviet times. And uh, it was a decision uh, by the local, by uh, the national government, to restore some of uh, the factories, including the shoe factory, a cheese factories in Spitak and Nalbond, and uh, two other factories. And we have also bakery, which was reopened 10 days after the earthquake in order to supply fresh bread to people. <coughs> Some of the factories have been uh, raised. The, we had also the elevator factory here. The elevator factory was producing uh, spare parts for uh, the cargo elevators and then also for the smaller elevators. There was an agreement between uh, the municipality of Spitak and Zangezur Copper Molybdenum Factory, which uh, sold this area to uh, Copper Molybdenum Factory. And in exchange, they had to actually build a small soccer state, football stadium, but nothing was done. And then, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, <clears throat> for about 10 years or even more, uh, all activities have stopped in speed up. So there was no construction. People in the center of speed up were living in small temporary shelters, <coughs> so called domics. The situation changed when Suren Avetisian was appointed as the mayor of. Uh, Spitak City in 1996 until 1995. From 1995, he was the executive director of Louis Foundation. So he provided some support to students who were going to the university using pro bono buses or commuters. He also provided free of charge transportation to the mothers of deceased <coughs> soldiers during this time. He uh, gained some support in the city in 1996. 
He received 90% of the votes in the city and was elected as the mayor. Uh, information about Surena Vetisian could be found from Agapi Haikazunis book. She was a staff member. She tried to actually put together all interviews of Surena Vetisian in one book. So all information about Surena Vetisian is from this book. So from the book, we'll learn what were the plans related to reconstruction of Spitak, what was his vision of uh, the city. In one of the interviews on how they initiated the rebuilding of new Spitak, he answers that after seeing for 10 years all the ruins, and Spitak had decided to initiate this uh, having in mind that no one else but people in Spitak should do that work. So uh, the work started in 1997. He started with uh, fundraising among the businessmen and businesswomen in Spitak, and it was soon joined also by those people from Spitak who were residing at that time in Russian Federation. One of his inter other interviews that we had, uh, he said that he participated in cleaning of the city. And during the time when uh, Surena Vetesian was mayor, he was a student in the school. He remembers how the city was built, how the work was done. So. Students from the school were taken by Surena Vetesian on Saturday to the city park, and they have cleaned because of this initiative the entire park from the waste. Then different projects have been put together with the government and with individual benefactors. And Jim Torosian, a famous Armenian architect, was tasked with. Uh, development of the master plan. Papin Avetisian, father of Sven Avetisian, has said that he had a specific priorities. So, for example, memorial complex devoted to the victims of uh, the earthquake church, uh, the main square surrounded by uh, the living quarters will compile the new image of the city. So, Suren Avetesian had a vision. Uh, there was Bagramian Street, uh, which is now renamed after Suren Avetesian. There are five similar buildings. Uh, those should have been considered as the central gates of the city according to Surya vision. He also had 15 building triangle district in the center of the city. 15 residential building triangle district. Surya was paying special attention to house, housing construction and also rehabilitation recovery of the industrial quarter. I will talk about uh, the symbols of revival or renaissance. There are several small uh, monuments that uh, Surina Vetesian built or restored as a symbol of Spitak uh, recovering from the earthquake. There was a monument devoted to the victims of uh, the earthquake, 4,300 victims here. Usually, a memorial ritual service is taking place on the day of the earthquake. The next one was a uh, building of the central square of the city designed by Jim Torvalsian. This should have been uh, the main symbol of uh, the recovery of the city. From 1998 interview by Jim Torosian, we learned that there was a competition on 
uh, the rebuilding of the city. And Jim Torresian was one of the members of the competition board. Kevor Karamian uh, received actually the first prize for the project he presented. So then they started to also work on the design of the schools, cultural house, etc., etc. This was done right after the earthquake, but the work has stopped because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then Avetisian becomes the mayor of the city, and he uses his personal links and contacts, and he brought together all his friends, including Jim Torosian, who had to put into the architectural form the ideas that uh, Sven Avetisian had in his mind. Uh, after the war and earthquake, after the collapse of the Soviet Union due to economic slowdown and crisis, uh, the recovery was actually left behind. And Sven Avetisiano and Goldas took on initiative using his own image and reputation in order to initiate this process. According to his vision, the new square would be a place where the unique Armenian architecture would be presented. It should be should have an entrance in the form of an arc with some galleries. Behind the galleries, uh, there was a possibility to have also some residential buildings and uh, the first floors of those buildings should have been used for different public services, cafes, restaurants, etc. They should have had some incline in order also to host uh, the club. The closed area should have 20 meters of height with uh, the tree of life, a symbolic representation and uh, the floor should have been covered by uh, the concrete. And it was also supposed that Spitak people will spend their leisure time here, organize some events. And from the square, the church would be visible, where they should have used uh, stones, the gray and uh, pink stones from the stone mine. There are some interesting stories related to the construction of uh, Sorp Arutsun, Holy Resurrection Church. Uh, the role of the church became important in principle for the city, and uh, there were some uh, rumors that the residential building which they erected in place of the destroyed church was cursed. That's why no resident had good luck. So that's why there was a decision to build a church. It was a decision of the citizens of Spitak. And then they approached the Apostolic Church of Armenia, which actually agreed to that project. There is an interesting notion or idea linked to the new church. If the idea was to uh, restore the old church, it should have been the church of the Holy Mother of God. But there was also another church, uh, iron one built near the graveyard, which is non-functional now. So there was, which was called the Church of Holy Resurrection. That's why there was a decision made to name the new church, the Church of Holy Resurrection, as a symbol of recovery and renaissance of the city. It is located in the center of the city, and it is close to the square. The work started at the time when he was uh, mayor of the city, but uh, the construction was finished after the death of uh, Surin Avetisian by different individual benefactors who supported this construction. Uh, near that, there is also a cultural house where there are different groups. Uh, according to his vision, vision of Surin Avetisian, this a cultural club was for uh, the youth of the city. Before he was elected, the mayor of the city, only 20% of the houses in 
speed up will be stored, and he was actually considering this to be one of the top priorities for his work. You see the uh, wall standing after the earthquake in the central court, and he decided to keep it as it is, as a symbol of the old city. That's why it is still there. It is in the center of the city now. He also took some steps uh, in order to reopen uh, the sugar factory, the cane sugar factory, also the elevator factory, and diary factory. But he unsuccessfully, he was then elected uh, member of the parliament of Armenia to bring this issue to the attention of the national authorities. At the same time, he kept his contacts with the villages near Spitak, trying to actually put together an itinerary of the issues they had. But unfortunately, on October 26th of 1999, there was a traffic accident that took away the life of Suren Avetisian in the early morning of that day. So he was a mayor for only two or three years, but because of the work he done for people in Spitak, people started to sanctify his image, and it is evident in the way they treated his memory. The central square was called Surin Avetisian Square. This is the church which was built right after the earthquake in order to also serve as the funeral house. Uh, it is no longer functional, but it stays there as one of the symbols of the earthquake. So, and um, other case of iconization, he is elected uh, the chairperson of the Union of Spitak Communities. And one of the central streets, former Bagramian Street, is now named after Surinavetisian. And the last point that I would like to make, <clears throat> it is related to bridging the gap between the old and the new city. One of the districts is called Glendale. It is being built between the two cities, and now some attempts are being made to fill in the gap between the two cities. By the way, uh, Glendale is the name used by the population in Spitak because uh, this district is built by the Glendale, Glendale Hills. In reality, it is called the Master's Quarter. Uh, it was planted at the center where you see the empty space. Uh, they planned to build two-story houses for uh, artisans, artists, etc. The second floor would be the residence. On the first floor, they would have their workshops. However, uh, this work also uh, is unfinished, and this is the actual situation that we have now. This is Ukraine restaurant, and Yanukovych Square. This speaks about the multiculturalism of the city of Spitak. Probably I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. Do we have questions to Mariam? I have some clarifying questions if the others do not want to take floor before me. Mariam, please take a note and then you can answer to this question. And what year the memorial was built? Which memorial? Memorial to the victims of uh, the earthquake. Uh, I 
as far as I understand, it happened before Surinavetisian became the mayor. It was one of the first monuments erected. So when he became the mayor and when the monument was built, in order to understand the chronology, when you speak about his sanctification, you showed the iron church which was built right after the earthquake, how it is related to him, why his sanctification or canonization in a sense by people is related to this church. If you think that this canonization is witnessed by the fact that he, the main square was named after him, I would like to see the link between the two. So many squares could be named after some people, after some people by the decision of the local councils or the national government. So we probably need some additional information how the population decided to actually promote this idea and then municipality took it over and made this, this decision how this process are linked together. And the next one, when you have taken the image of this person as the main point of your presentation, I would like to also know what is your main trigger. You are presenting his life, but I don't see where are you trying to put forward the main question or what is the research question that we have to get after your research. Probably I missed that or I was not able to catch that idea. What is the main research topic that you wanted to present? Thank you. Other questions to Mariam? No? Okay. Thank you, Mariam. Let's move to the next presentation. Sonam Natsakanyan. She's working on her doctoral thesis in Humboldt University in Berlin, Slavic languages and literature. She's also a Friedrich Schlegel literature school member, where she is uh, working in the framework of a research project. And bachelor's and master's degrees are received in Armenian philology from the Yerevan State University. The topic of presentation reading Makartic Armen's novel Yerevan in the context of the Soviet national, national policy. Initially, I presented the same novel in the context of Soviet Orientalism, but because it was too large, I have changed uh, the topic and narrowed down it. I will speak only about the national policy which is again related to this topic of Orientalism. I will try to fit into 20 minutes if there would be some questions remaining. I would gladly answer to those as well. So reading Mugat the German's novel Yerevan in the context of Soviet national policy. This novel was published in 1931 for the first time in Armenian in Moscow. In 1933, on November 18, the decision of November 14 of the Communist Party board and one of the decisions to discard Makati Jarman's book Yerevan because it preaches local nationalism and advocates for orientation towards feudal East. Several years later, in 1937, Armen, along with many representatives of intellectuals, have been arrest, was arrested, and Yerevan is named as one of the anti-Soviet works. He spends uh, years in exile, and then after the war, he is rehabilitated and returns to Armenia. But none of the works uh, has even any close relation to Yerevan. Yerevan 
novel as a modernist novel, but others are absolutely in line with socialist realism. And among the Soviet Armenian writers, many of them have been accused or their works have been assessed as and not many of them have been actually accused of being accused for orientation towards the feudal East. If I will try to say that it is a dialogue between the two Soviet architects were designing the city of uh, Yerevan. One of those protagonists named Gurgen Kuzits himself was a defender of Western architecture tradition, and the other one, Ashak, is for Eastern style. Gurgen, the advocate of the Western architect, explains his choice with the imperative of the time, relying on such plenary oppositions as present, past, modern, outdated, progressive, backward, or regressive, where the first uh, term stands for the West, the second for the East. A citation from the novel, I get inspired by the last word in architecture by the civilized West, whereas you by the back, by the regressive East. Ashak, the architect fascinated by the East, opposes this dichotomy, considering it as, it as indication of Orientalism, the demolition of the old city to build a new one. He interprets as not only the destruction of old non-functional buildings, but as of human relations, social bonds, and structures. He proposes to build Yerevan as the center of a new East, more specifically to build a Soviet East. Another citation, I believe that here in Yerevan should be a created a Soviet East. It is interesting that some recent studies of Soviet literature analyze the topos of the East in the context of socialist realism, modernist aesthetics competition. As you remember, I have mentioned that this novel is aesthetic competition modernist aesthetic competition work. Particularly, I mean two articles, Culture One and Half, and Einstein in Fergana from avant-garde avant -garde to national form, penned by literary critic Nariman Stokov, and the paper Orientalism as Modern and Oriental Stylization in Soviet Culture, that is sixth is presented by Ilya Kuplin last year at the Conference for Soviet Cosmo Cosmopol is the Soviet project of world literature and its legacies developed the idea since 1930s there were emerging phenomena in Soviet culture which can be called Soviet Orientalism. Initially it was called uh, proletarian culture put forward by uh, Stalin. This was done under the imperative to reform the cultures, making the national a national inform and socialist in content the reformation of Eastern ethnic groups in the Soviet Union mainly led to the exoticization and orientalization of those cultures, but the strangeness of the Oriental out the modernist valorization of the familiarized forms of to continue its existence in new ways. The national informed socialist and content formula provided a context in which formal strangeness could reemerge as a sanctioned entity formal experimentation was possible only at the national context and only if a singular socialist content predominated as such national form was the last sanctuary of modern strangeness, end of quote. In his presentation, mostly referring to Skakov's article, Kukulin also interprets the usage of Orientalism and exotization as an excuse to circumvent the rules of social realism. The analysis of the circumstances and the content of the novel Yerevan allows me to contribute to Skakovs and Kukulin's thesis and to question them simultaneously. The time of writing the novel Yerevan, that is 1927-1931, is a basis for claiming that the exotization of the East in Soviet literature began before the mid-30s, which they argue started at that time. And it would be interesting to investigate whether Armen's novel is unique or it is mere one among other works of art which use the East as a topos before 1932. If it is not the only one, then another question will follow. What was the fate of such works and their authors? These are open questions for further research.
<clears throat> Apart from that, I argue that the exhaust exoticization and orientalization of the East and the novel Yerevan were not done to circumvent the rules of social socialist realism, because the latter began to exist as a clearly defined method or direction since 1932. And and was declared as the official direction of the Soviet art at the first Congress of Soviet writers in 1934. So if the theme of East in the novel Yerevan was not a way of resistance to or excuse of not using socialist realism aesthetic, then one should question why did Armen refer to that topic. The novel Yerevan represents a prominent example of Armenian engagement with Korenizatsiya policy that provides space for national communists, communities in the Young Soviet Union. Arshak returns to Yerevan, the novel's protagonist, educated in Leningrad and spent years working on different constructing projects in Moscow. He was sent by the Soviet government to Armenia to take part in a replanning of the capital city. Yerevan is one of the main architects, such a professional path from center to periphery was not uncommon in the Soviet Union. However, this secondment to periphery is more than career because he is an Armenian and Yerevan is his hometown. So, Ashak represented a generation of young specialists from the national republics whose higher education began in the mid-1920s, mostly in the universities of the center, and to enter the professional field of their respective republics in the early 1930s. However, it is not worth it that there were differences in realizing colonization or indigenization in different republics of the Soviet Union, for example, because the government met difficulties in finding specialists among the natives of Central Asia, they sent specialists from the center who were mostly of Slavic descent. In case of Soviet Armenia, we have a different picture. Armenia produced many of its own Soviet experts, making it a model for the possibilities of colonization policy. Since the 1920s, alongside the preparation of the new specialist, many Armenian professionals from different parts of the former Tsarist Russia, the Ottoman Empire, and elsewhere had been moving to Armenia to take part in the construction and building of the country. This was not only because of the opportunities the Soviet authorities promised them, but the dream of a state cherished in the national literature since 19th century since the 19th century, followed by the liberation, liberation movements, which was terribly shaken by the Armenian genocide, drove many to Soviet Armenia. One such example is Zabel Yesayan, the Ottoman Armenian female writer, a female activist, who settled in Armenia after the destruction of the Ottoman Armenians as a political community, only to perish in the Stalin era purges. She moved to Armenia from Paris. She never imagined that she can go. She can perish because of the Stalin persecution. Such professions arrived in the Soviet Union with a clear sense of national consciousness and the motivation to develop different spheres in the country. The chief architect of the city of Yerevan, Alexander Tamanyan, was one of those specialists who started his career before the revolution and followed the path back to Soviet Armenia, similar to Ashak. Tamanyan was born outside of Armenia in the Russian Black Sea city of Yekaterinodar, modern day Krasnodar. He was educated at the Imperial Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg. After more than a decade of work in different cities of Russia, he moved to the newly established Republic of Armenia and started to work on the urban redesigning of Yerevan. After a year, in 1920, when the nascent Armenian Republic fell to the Bolshevik Revolution, Tamanyan had to flee 
the repressions launched by the new Bolshevik state against forest intellectuals. He crossed the southern border of Armenia and took refuge in Iran out of need for profession. The Soviet government softened its attitude towards such specialists with highest educational background. In 1923, Tamayan was called back to Soviet Armenia and entrusted the position of the main architect of the city of Yerevan, chief architect of the city of Yerevan. And Tamayan presented the master plan to the People's Council a year after his return in 1924, and it was approved. The construction works started, but I'm telling you all this uh, dates, so you know that it was written, Yerevan novel was written, along with the development of the city. It's kind of semi-historic book. So. Tamayan was tasked to revise the plan. He did so in 1934. The construction of his revised plan named Metzir Evan Greater Evan began. The composition of the novel and the construction of the city of Iran took place simultaneously. It is not difficult to note the similarities between the biographies of Tamayan and novels Kratok and Starshak. Both got their architectural education in Peters Petersburg, Leningrad. Both started practice their profession in Russia. Both were engaged by the Soviet government in the ambitious replanning of the city of Yerevan. In addition, Ashak alludes to Yerevan system passed on the Iranian rule, introducing another parallel between the fictional architect and the experience of Tamanian short exile in Iran. Makhrich Armen, a witness of the city construction process, also followed the debates on the problems of architecture, not only in Armenia, but all over the Soviet Union, which centered on finding an architectural state that was national informed socialist in content. Those debates are also included in the pages of Yerevan, illustrating how the novel was deeply rooted in the political context. One of the novel's poetical refrains, ancient centuries old Yerevan is dying, might seem to be a mere indication of fictional characters' melancholy, but that is not so. When we read Tamanyan's report on the planning of Yerevan, where he presents the principles of the city reconstruction, we, and the justification for that, we see that the demolition of the old city was not accepted unequivocally, and Tamanyan has to explain. If we ask ourselves whether there has been a case when it was allowed to change the shape of a city by demolishing the old one, the answer is ready. And there is a lot of literature about it. There is no a single city in Europe that has not been subjected to such situation. 100 years ago, a century ago, Paris was fundamentally changed a quarter of it has been demolished and rebuilt with a completely new style, new parks, wide streets, squares, etc. The same can be said for Berlin, London, Vienna, Rome, and other great cities. Tamayan refers uh, to the experience of great European uh, cities and calling to use their experience. Tamayan probably refers to the early 19th century when the neoclassicism dominated in European architecture. The neoclassical forms were harshly criticized by the constructivists who were against any kind of decorative elements instead offering laconic and functional forms. After the October Revolution, constructivism as other avant-garde art trends developed and flourished in the Soviet Union as a direction of poetry, proletarian futuristic art. Nevertheless, from the early 1930s onward, when the mainstream view of the art changed in the Soviet Union, all innovative and experimental methods began to be interpreted as bourgeois formulas. Constructivist forms in architecture replaced by such forms which experts later would classify as Stalinist Neoclassicism. In the novel, Yerevan Arman stages a lengthy debate between constructivist and neoclassicist, which is represented as an East West civilizational debate. The West representative character Gurgian, in a sense, follows the steps of Alexander Tamayan. Here is our teacher, the West. Here is the huge storehouse or warehouse from which we must take whatever is possible, whatever is not rotten yet. However, Arshak, the character representing the East, challenges Gurgian imputing to this perspective the defining features of constructivist architecture. Can you imagine the Yerevan you want to build? Cubic rooms, orbital lumps, square walls, round windows, everything, everything is based only on the principle of vertical and horizontal lines and on circle. Arshak posits his city plan as a way to save and develop the culture of diversity, while his opponent's plan he interprets in the frames of culture of standards. This is also a constructivism concept. The 
All these arguments about architectural forms and styles between Ashok and Gurgin, however, are not formulated under the names of any art movement or direction such as constructivism or neoclassicism in the narration. Rather, the controversy between those directions is used by the author to create the East-West debate, where neoclassicism is wealth under the East, while constructivism is under the West. As much as the novel reflects the image of its time, we cannot demand valid accuracy from it precisely because it is a fiction, not historiography. So it is important to analyze the choice of symbols. Those are not unfamiliar and accidental for those who have dealt with the Armenian issues. It should be noted that during the late Soviet and early Soviet periods, a prominent linguist and archaeologist, Nikolai Mar, puts forward a theory according to which Armenian culture is a synthesis of Eastern and Western culture. According to him, the Indo-European people of Phrygia moved to the East, where they met the Hyaphanite people from Uratria. Nairi and the fusion of these two cultures formed the base of the Armenian culture. Thus, we can say that Makach Arman's novel Yerevan is just one example of fictionalizing the narrative about Armenia. Armenians as a bridge between East and West, an idea which was circulated by the Soviet historiography under the authoritative patronage of Nikolai Mar. But in its core, the novel appeals opposed to the notion of the nation as an objective and relatively stable community. Here we would like to remind Stalin's formulation of the nation, which he gave in his pamphlet Marxism and the National Question in 1913 before the revolution, which then became a cornerstone in the process of developing Soviet national policy. A nation is a historically constituted stable community of people formed on the basis of a common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a common culture. I have presented the word stable in bold to show how the whole emphasis of the novel contradicts to it. Returning to the novel, the novel's main protagonists, Ashak Budagian's wanderings through uh, uh, the narrow streets, gardens, memories, and dreams, his relations with the other characters of the novel are metaphorical images of the disclosure of his identity, which show that any identity is multi-layered and any concrete formulation can be short-term and deceptive. For example, one of the techniques used in the novel is the play of dual characters or mirror effects, through which the Ashak Gurgen pair can be interpreted not only as a dispute or conversation between the East and the West, but also as a narrative of, ident as a narrative of identity duality. It seemed to him that uh, there were not two architects standing face to face each other, but only one who shook hands with his own image reflected in a mirror. Another example, Ashak Budarian has a cousin with the same name and surname in Yerevan, who whose regular appearances in the novel also aim to construct a narrative to identify searching hesitation about himself. It seemed as if he had lost himself and was calling himself in the darkness. To conclude, the novel's non-linear narrative and the possibility of various interpretations given to the reader contradict not only to the aesthetics of the so socialist realism, which became on mainstream in 1932, but also the Soviet concept of the nation, which demanded the construction of the stable identity. Uh, thank you, Sonia. It was very interesting for me because I am trying to analyze the new districts built for the Western Armenians repatriated to Yerevan, and I see many perils which we will discuss later. If there are questions to Sona, please. So now I had an idea. Have you ever looked at Tamanyan's works before he came to Armenia to understand whether he is Eastern or Western? I know of some works for some Russian aristocrats. He designed some buildings following the Western and Russian architectural styles. 
but do we have any things survive, surviving from Tamanian and close to Eastern style? So I would like to know whether there are some traces of the East in his art. Shall I answer now or wait until then? Do we have any questions in the Zoom? It seems no. Next presentation is by Tigran Simian, Doctor of Philology, European Languages and Communication, Foreign Literature Professor, Ivan Hovanasaivazovsky Habitus, Politics of Memory Architect of the City. I am on the Zoom, so don't look for me in the hall. If you give me an opportunity to share with you my presentation, I will be grateful to you. Uh, do you see? Yeah, you see my presentation. You have already presented the topic of my presentation. I would like to thank for organizing this wonderful event. I would like to thank the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography, Gaina Shabayan, Levon Abrahamian, and the team that invested a lot of effort in organizing this event. I would like to inform all of you that there is an internet scientific journal, online journal, Orbis at Orbis, Microhistory and Semiotics of the City. We have it in English, Russian and uh, German. You can publish your articles on this website. This is for your information. Our team is also ready to make this platform available to everyone interested. I will move now to the topic proper. So, Ivazovsky's habitus in the context of imperial memories. And the next question, how Ivazovsky uses Theodosia as the context. I will try to present the following topic that he, Ivazovsky was not only a very talented marinist, but also a good diplomat, a person with the rights over the city. This is uh, Lucien Lefebvre's idea, and there is a chronological division, but Ivasovsky, by his own example, shows how he lived and created in that city, also helped to build the city using also his right to the city and artistic freedom. Pierre Boutet, Lefebvre, and others' research was used in order to uh, present directly and indirectly this idea, and they were used in this presentation. Ivazovsky is a person on at the edge of the Armenian-Russian cultures, on the borderline. Of course, we have to take into account his biography. He had an opportunity to study in St. Petersburg, which was the center of Russian arts, and after graduation, he returned to his home, Feodosia. If you compare Feodosia with St. Petersburg, this comparison between the periphery and uh, the center becomes even more vivid. During uh, the presentation, we will see that. And I agree with the presentation of Caroline Humphrey yesterday. In her conclusion, she said that 
the center and the periphery are very relative. They're outdated, outmoded, and there are many revisions. And center could easily become a periphery, and periphery can easily become a center. So I Vazovsky is one of the bearers of uh, the imperial memory of Russia. I Vazovsky moved even forward. And uh, Rupert Murdoch's the media magnet principle was uh, first started by Ivazovsky. He was thinking globally and acting locally. It is uh, manifested in his supra and transnational creations, artworks. And he was also very faithful to his local context, which is part of acting locally while thinking globally. How Ivazovsky became one of uh, the embodiments of uh, the imperial culture. He was the Marinist of the joint staff of the Marine Corps of uh, Russia. And we read about this in different documents it, when how he became a Marinist and at the same time remained an Armenian artist. Uh, there are, of course, sources which support this idea. You can read them yourself. But in the War of 1853-56, Ivazovsky, through different paintings, actually presented this war in a very artistic way. And he was one of those who preserved that memory. Uh, this. Uh, British descent in Subashi, for example. And we are not going to look at the specific features of this, because this is a work for uh, actually art critics, and I will leave it to them. Navarin battle. If we look at that painting, we have also another painting in the same line. If we Look at those, we will probably realize that Ivazovsky during his lifetime is able to transfer his symbolic capital into financial capital. He was creating artworks, paintings, and uh, the political leadership was highly valuing his artwork, giving him unending opportunities, endless opportunities for creating new artworks. Ivazovsky is also taking part in one of the expeditions, and Tsar is paying him 1,000 rubles in order to take care of the family expenses while being away. And there is also another interesting notion that Tsarist, or the Imperial Center, was using the talent of Ivazovsky to some extent, of course, to represent the periphery of Russian Empire, Kerch, Feodosia, Odessa, Sevastopol, and Ivazovsky living in his uh, birthplace, and his cradle is creating paintings of those cities, and uh, those cities become well known through his paintings, and to some extent he creates a brand of those cities, and other important a function is added to the artwork of Ivazovsky. Ivazovsky being an embodiment of the uh, culture, cultural policy, he becomes also a photographer. Many of his paintings could be seen in uh, the different galleries, also in the Kronstadt and in the joint stuff of the Russian Marine Force. Just an example how he implements the policy of memory. He tries to collect money for a house museum of one of the generals. He organizes an academy uh, exhibition and he uses the money for that purposes. When he was invited to uh, dinner 
in Tbilisi. He was able to fundraise about 3,000 rubles among the servicemen and then uh, turns this into a symbolic capital. So, so why it was important to have a monument of uh, General Kotlarovsky in Feodosia. He was born there, but besides that, Kotlarovsky played a key role in the South Caucasus context during Russian Persian War and signing the Gulistan Peace Treaty. So he was trying to implement the imperial policy through this. And he is able also to have the painting of the general in a frame showing his St. George's Cross and the Banner as symbols of his heroism. General Kotlarevsky's statue was recently erected in Feodosia and is considered to be a symbol of Russian officers. It was done in 2020. Kotlarovsky's sword was stolen in 2021. There was a big noise. They found it and returned to its place. And this narrative reminded me. I'm sorry that I was not able to take a picture. There is a statue of Ivazovsky in the uh, round part. They cut the upper and lower part of Ivazovsky's brush, uh, but we didn't make a big noise, which we should have done as the Russians did in order to restore that, as they did in case of Kotlarovsky's sword. Uh, uh, accompanied by uh, 50 uh, ship, Admiral Nakhimov comes to uh, city of Feodosia in order to greet and congratulate, wish happy birthday to Ivasovsky on his 50th anniversary, showing how what importance Ivasovsky had for Feodosia and for uh, the empire. So this is how he embodies the city of Feodosia. Someone says that uh, Ivasovsky's coming to Feodosia is a paradigmatic shift in the development of this city. And one of the important development was the opening of the archaeological museum on the Mitridates hill. It was built there. So then Mitridates mountain was renamed into Hovanes Ivazovsky's mountain. And uh, just one technical question. Are you changing your slides? because we have a frozen picture. Now, probably, I'm changing actually my slides and I'm far advanced in my presentation. Do you see it now? We see now the Admiral Kornilov arrival to the city on 12 Apostle ship. Do you see? We see only picture of uh, Hovanna Saivazovsky on the left part of uh, the slide. That's Admiral Kornilov's slide. Yeah, here is the. So now we see the archaeological museum. So if you look at this picture. Ivasovsky is uh, choosing a very good place on a hill, so the 
museum is visible from all corners of the city at and it gives you a good perspective in understanding how the heights in the city or the hills in the city were used in order to make them landmarks. For us, it's probably Mother Nadaran and Mother Armenia statue. And there's also a gymnasium in Feodosia, which is used as a high point. So, Hovana Zaivazovsky also organized some archaeological expeditions and excavations. Uh, he found Etruscan vases, the three heads of uh, Pan, and three heads of Medusa, which have been sent to Hermitage, and now they are located in St. Petersburg in Hermitage. This shows how globally he thinks and how he is able to properly allocate this cultural capital and how he acts. He also organized Janka Feodosia railway construction. Patriot painter has surveyed and served his homeland with his long standing experience. So he is paying attention to many developments in the city. He organizes construction of a 28 kilometer long drinking water pipeline, which uh, becomes an important landmark in the development of the city. And this is an interesting and well known fountain, fountain which was built in memory of Alexander III. Uh, but uh, it was suggested to actually name after Alexander III, but the emperor refuses that honor. And there is a small tray, silver meat, played stating drink for the health of uh, the emperor and his family. At the same time with Alexander III's fountain, uh, the municipality started to build an other fountain to name it after Ivazovsky, but then they have named it uh, the Fountain of uh, Dut Genius. Uh, you can see that it is wife of Ivazovsky, Anna Burnazian Sarkisova. She owned a water resource which she donated to the city, 50,000 buckets of water to avoid any water supply problems. So the water goes into the bowl from her hands and it shows that a precious thing is flowing into the container showing that that is an important thing being done for the city. 2004, good genius fountain. It was a reconstruction of the previous one uh, because there were leakage of the water and this is a new variant. And there is an inscription here to genius Ivazovsky and his disciples from grateful Feodosians. I told you that Mitridat's mount was renamed after Ivazovsky and there is also a boulevard from Genovian bridge to the city, a beautiful boulevard named after Ivazovsky again. Ivazovsky also wanted to move port from Sevastopol to Theodosia because it was more convenient, specifically in the winter time. He started a big campaign and there was a struggle between intentions between people in Sevastopol and Theodosia. And uh, Ivazovsky was trying to solve this issue and he was victorious. And this is well presented. 
on the painting The Victory of Theodosia. We see that the city of Theodosia is represented as a woman. So uh, we have some coincidences with one with the presentation made by Victoria, with the text uh, Victoria presented police and, uh, uh, the police and the woman. And you see also the ravens. Those are Sevastopol, people of Sevastopol who come, make some circles and go away. Now, the victory is after Feodosia. So, if we try to summarize and make some working conclusions, Ivazovsky creates own center, which is cultural and infrastructural because of the symbolic capital he has uh, created, because of supranational values he created. The center as a creation of the center is possible when you know the imperial memory uh, policy and the rules of the game. If you don't know them, you cannot actually change the city, the landscape of the city and the image and create new infrastructure. Ivazovsky creates a new city and the city in its turn generates symbolic capital. Symbolic capital which is art and Ivazovsky and Theodosia meeting of the two is very fruitful and Ivazovsky to his paintings made Theodosia a well-known place turned it into a brand. Thank you for your attention. And I will stop here. Thank you, Tigran, for a very interesting presentation. Of course, it would be interesting to read the entire article when it is ready. If there are questions to Tigran, please. Thank you for an interesting presentation. I am very much interested. To what extent Ivazovsky gave importance or focused on his ethnic origin, and from what time on Ivazovsky becomes a topic of research for the Armenian researchers or scientists? Isn't it an example of uh, the competition for cultural heritage? When we always talk about Ivazovsky as an Armenian, uh, are we bidding for uh, the imperial heritage or what? Are we trying to position ourselves as the heirs of that imperial heritage or what? Thank you for the question. Other questions, other comments, interpretations, suggestions? proposals. Probably we have to move to the discussion. I should say that the uh, discussant is Sayana Namsaraeva. She is from the Center for Mongolian Central Asian Studies in Cambridge University. She looks at issues of diaspora, ethnic relations, boundary special attention is given to the Russian Chinese border cities. She had carried out many studies. She is teaching at Social Anthropology Chair a course on. Northern, Korean, uh, Northern Asian countries and in, for Inner Asia magazine. Uh, and my uh, kind of a comments are not very critical because I see your papers, your presentation as a potential papers for publication, which needs maybe some theory frame which maybe needs some structural changes and I also prefer to give some let's say literature recommendation to make your papers look stronger. So first paper by <clears throat> Victoria Vasilian, The Image of the City, looks at gender aspects of the police city, imagine 
uh, on the imagined protectors, which, as author argues, in ancient biblical tradition often had a feminine in the representation. In particular, it uses much historical data to tell how female images were employed in various cosmopolitical projects of the Roman Empire in relations with the remote Armenia, either when a feminine image was used to demonstrate subordination of the city to the metropolis, or female warrior demonstrated victory and triumph as the Hellenistic Nike goddess symbolized. Similarly, female image was used as a unifying symbol in the modern nationalistic projects to strengthen Armenian statehood and unity and to unify the nation. So it was interesting for me uh, to see that in modern Armenia, feminine image of the mother Armenia was kind of is being replaced sometimes by very masculine and patriarchal symbols. So I would say uh, I would call this phenomena a sort of shape shifting when feminine becomes very masculine and patriarchal symbol kind of of man, then woman turns into man. And um, uh, as for your paper, it's very rich, lots of historical details. I clearly see three sections. One is a um, uh, women imagination uh, in Hellenistic and the Roman Empire in, in, imperial tradition. Second section is a women in the Christian tradition, how they've been reimagined. And when, for example, Christian tradition had lots of legends about how female heroines in nationalist, and the third section is about female heroines in nationalistic modern projects. So what I miss in your paper is information on how Christian tradition constructed female images like Mother Virgin and the ways how it was reimagined by Christian Armenia to talk about sacrifice, loyalty, and devotion, kind of very strong Christian concepts. And my final comment is to develop this paper into a bigger article and to submit it to academic research journal called Aspasia. It's kind of focuses on the like, kind of feministic and uh, female images in history and present day political culture. And I would recommend you a book by Ma Marina uh, Werner. It's called From the Beast to the Blondie. Uh, fairy tales yeah. and their tellers. You can ask me it. later. I can give you more details. And actually, this book explains how pre Christian era mythological figures like gods and goddesses have been transformed by Christian tradition either into Christian saints or into anti Christian characters like beasts. And goddesses shape shifted into masculine beasts and female heroines, as Mother Armenia, also in this case, can be explained why she turned particularly in the patriarchal heroes of patriarchal heroes, symbols of masculinity, of political struggle in Armenia. So this is my kind of comment to, <clears throat> to Victoria. Another paper by, um, uh, about the recovery, um, post-earthquake recovery of Spitak and the role of Mayo of uh, Spitak, Suren Avi. Tisian, how the role he played in the making of the new rejuvenated city with the help of international community. Of course, international help gave Spivak, uh, Spitak, Spivak a new cosmopolitan and multicultural look. And in addition to rebuilding the city, new city required also new places and spaces for commemoration. I like the episode uh, when uh, planting of four, more than 4,000 trees symbolized the bodies of the dead. Uh, it, it kind of, it's, I thought it, it was kind of it, it, it imagined replacing of the dead bodies by living trees. And in this case, you can use the Foucauldian concept of biopolitics. It can be very useful in, uh, to characterize this episode and how the city and people make their dead citizens to continue their lives in a new form as trees. So I thought, I, th I thought this conception would be very interesting. And uh, to my mind, the main idea of your paper is a story of the power shift. So initially it was understandable what, that it was in the hands of the international humanitarian organizations and foreign states who provided to 
help to rebuild the city, but they were not familiar with the history of the place and they were not able to understand the needs of the people. But they had simply a utilit utilitarian task to provide people who suffered from earthquake with basic houses and shelters. And then when Mayor of Pivak Suren Avitisan took initiative in his hand, he was able to make a new project which combined ruins of the old city and for touristic ideas about new city altogether in one. And people of Spitak like this approach very much. So finally, citizens of the city took power into their own hands in making decisions about the future of Spitak. So they became the real agents of, 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 of the process. So, so kind of, you can try to show how the shift slowly moved <clears throat> into citizens' hand. And I think that when Mariam will be developing her presentation further into publication, she can put more emphasis on why all the ruins of the city were so dear to people of Spivak. And why did they prefer to rebuild city on the remains of the old city rather than to move it into to a new place? So in this case, I would recommend you some additional literature, which includes a recent book by Andreas Schoenle, on architecture of oblivion, ruins and historical consciousness, to develop further the idea that Spivak is not about the building a new modern city, but it's also a place of memory, grievance, and historical consciousness, to, and to show how ruins of old Spivak have been interweaved into the fabric of the new city. So I always was thinking about the Armenian carpets when you use the old um, kind of canva and you put something in you. So you kind of, you can buy both old and new things. So this is kind of my, <laughs> thank you. It was very interesting. I think that I'm very happy to present because all papers are extremely interesting for me and they have very multicultural approach. And um, another paper by <clears throat> Sonia, Mnosakian analyzes the novel Yerevan by Armet Mkrt in the context of the concept of the Soviet Orientalism developed by Edward Said. And actually reading this paper, let me think about very rich and complicated history of Armenia. And I was thinking about the dichotomy of Armenia being divided between the West and the East. But obviously, historically, Armenia is a part of the Hellenistic and Christian tradition to be recognized as a, uh, as a Western country, but part of the West. But in the Russian imperial project and later within the Soviet state, Armenia was considered to be underdeveloped East, which needs to be liberated and freed from feudalism and it needed to be removed, reformed under socialist and communist modernization project. So I would recommend to use as a methodological frame for your research, the relationship between these three isms. So one is the concept of Orientalism as a bigger narrative kind of <clears throat> uh, overarching uh, theory developed by Edward Said, then Russian Imperial Orientalism, and third, Soviet-style Orientalism, where political theory of communism became a part of the new modernizing projects. And to add to your bibliography, I can recommend a book by <coughs> David uh, Schimmelpenig, Van der Oye, uh, it's his German author. It's called Russian Orientalism, Asian, in the Russian mind from, uh, from Peter the Great to the immigration. So it will kind of uh, make theoretical <clears throat> concepts stronger. And paper by Tigran uh, Simian opens to the public a new unknown personal characteristic of the famous Russian artist Ivazovsky, who as truly as Leonardo da Vinci, multi-talented person, was gifted in many, many ways. He was well recognized as an artist. He also tried himself with architecture. He was interested in archaeology, etc. And having Armenian and Russian origin probably allowed Ivazovsky to continue to contribute to many aspects of the social and cultural life of both Armenian diaspora in Feodosia and Russia. And your historic uh, and uh, historic material of Tigran suggests that Ivazovsky became a person who actually transgressed Armenian and Russian cultures to become a transborder person. 
So it is probably better to call him as a transborder per person rather than a border person, how you called him in, in, in your paper, you characterized him in your paper. So Tigran uses an interesting approach to see <clears throat> Irazovsky's life through the center and periphery relations. Yes, it is true, and I support this approach. Gazovsky got imperial education, he extensively traveled around the world, and he still remained uh, a strong Armenian nationalist. As far as we can see from his publishing activities, he refused to get a word from Sultan Abdul, etc. But at the same time, he was loyal to empire and to the state. Tigran shows Ayvazovsky as an active and responsible citizen of Theodosia, and appreciation of his contribution was commemorated in many places, in place names in Theodosia. However, it is not clear from the text who Ayvazovsky was in reality, what was his main identity. Okay, in his main identities, one which was the main, the dominant one. Okay, he was an artist by professional identity. Then he was a patriot of Feodosia, place where he lived, and it was his kind of local identity, but it's not clear about his Armenian identity. So it will be interesting to know more what was his attitude to Armenian history and to Armenian statehood, if it's possible, if historical materials allow, and how his Armenian identity was expressed to support his ethnic origin. It is a very well-written paper, and I enormously enjoyed reading it. And my final question uh, to uh, Tibran to, to is, do you have an ambition to rewrite Ayvazovsky biography to demonstrate his, um, his unknown sites for a wider audience and to present him not only as a Russian artist and citizen of Theodosia, but also as an Armenian nationalist and Armenian culture activist? And I think that this new biography will undermine the Russian imperial culture uh, image, and it will kind of deconstruct uh, the image, uh, and it also will demonstrate that the contribution of other ethnic groups and nations into high imperial culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Namsaraeva, for your valuable comments. Uh, so, uh, let's go back to the presenters. Let's start with Victoria. Victoria, please answer to the questions that uh, you have received. I will use them for my other research. Um, uh, by the way, uh, Mar Marina Warner's book, A Female Body, is my beloved book. I have it in my home and I have used it mainly uh, for Lady Liberty, for Lady Wisdom. Uh, there uh, are very interesting chapter virgin warriors and how she is comparing this with new and modern era but um, i try to examine mainly armenian culture and armenian archetypes that are um, coming from ancient times and we have many archetypes from christian period too i will try to use for my other research and there we have mother with his dying son and until now, we have such a monuments. Uh, for example, um, in monument, you can see unknown soldiers, dying soldiers, and they are very similar to dying sons of mother goddess, uh, to Atis, and we have Semiramis and Ara the Handsome. Uh, many myths connected with it. And uh, we have um, Virgin Mary, uh, image in miniatures and we have many types and I will try to show that in my book and by the way this personification is only one type from other personification and uh, during my research for dissertation we have used long way dure uh, by Fernand Brodel and we have used only main archetypes, but I have others too. Uh, and masculine image, male image, mainly is more local. Mm -hmm. And a feminine image is more universal. And when you are speaking about military forces, and she have two sides. She have bad sides and she have good sides. 
and uh, virgin, um, virgin warriors and uh, virgin cities and also mother cities. Uh, there are, in my opinion, two sides of this goddess and uh, two sides of Ishtar. Astarte, I will use your comments and corrections. Thank you very much. Um, when it comes to Gohars and Guyana's suggestions, I will return to this as well. You touched upon the bright image. Kabarov has this bright image, which is compared to the heavenly Jerusalem or to uh, the image of Mother Goddess going back to Babylon. Babylon was a trade city, the other one was a virgin city. It comes again from the ancient times, uh, pre-Christian times. There were some, so to speak, warrior cities uh, populated with virgin warriors. They were presented as bright cities and there were capital cities, the trade cities, which had a seated position. We see Dike, we see uh, Anahit in that position on the coins. So I had that in my mind. Thank you. I have been to Shushi for uh, only two times when I was teaching our soldiers. They were uh, calling uh, the White Church City, they were calling the Archangel City, but never called it a bright city. So I will now look at it as a bright city or city bride. As of uh, the Armenianness of Ivazovsky, Ivazovsky has many paintings uh, related to Armenian history, for example, uh, Ararat, consecration of uh, General Vartan, Aragat. There are some archives and letters from Ivazovsky to uh, the Holy See in Echmiadzin. He has seen, it seems, Ararat with his own eyes, and the Armenian history is well presented in Armenian, uh, in Ivazovsky's works, and we consider Ivazovsky to be an Armenian, not only because his second wife was an Armenian. Thank you for your opinion, I will take into account uh, your comments. It was a very difficult uh, time when I did my uh, research and I didn't get into the depth because it was COVID and war time. Uh, probably in my speech there were some gaps and I will try to clarify those because of your questions. The first question, when uh, the monument was built and when Surena Vetesian became the mayor of the city and how those two are linked together. It was built in 97-98. It was ready for the 10th uh, anniversary of the earthquake. It was built with support of uh, the city of Thousand Oaks in the U.S. So, and uh, he actually participated in the construction. Am I correct that this was the first project that he started his reconstruction of the city or uh, restoration of the city. Let us start with the monument or not. Uh, you're absolutely right. He started with that. He was actually focusing on those monuments and the residential buildings and other stuff. 
the monuments were occupying central place in his uh, activities. So he was also trying to restore uh, the industrial zone. So, as of uh, canonization of uh, Srinavatisian people are writing songs in his memoria, in some poetry, you see some uh, Christian attempts to describe him as a true Christian, why his image was there to Spitak people. Right after the earthquake, some of the people moved to the new city or to new districts. And, uh, if you go to those buildings which were residential buildings which were built were built in the old city and uh, to some extent he actually lived up to the expectations of the people in Spitak in two years he was able to do more than uh, before and after his tenure as the mayor of the city, and not only the city, that not only the square, but also one of the main streets were named after him. And uh, this is how we see that he is being well respected by the people when he died. People were calling that the second earthquake in Spitak because they were actually associating the recovery with his name. We will discuss that later, but when we talk about canonization or sanctification, it's a completely different issue. It's it includes also religion, it has a special procedure to follow, a ritual that you have to actually follow, and you cannot simply call one person a saint just because you have decided to canonize him. It is very similar to the mayor of Gyumri. Why have you chosen the book only? Because in the book you have only good opinions about the people. You can talk to ordinary people on the street to understand whether there are also other views about uh, Suren Avatisian. We had also interviews with ordinary people. Many of them were refusing to talk about Suren Avatisian because they were afraid that we will remember something wrongly. They were saying, there is a book, read the book, you will find everything in there. That's why I have used the book as the main source, but I have talked also to people. I have heard uh, opposing views, by the way, and it was interesting to hear that there are two diametrically opposing views about him. Part of the people were revering his image, uh, even reaching the level of uh, the worship. The other part didn't like him. So I realized during my interviews that after becoming a mayor, he solved the issue of street lightning by uh, imperatively ordering the owners of the shops to put, let's say, street lights in front of their shops to clean the area near the shop and people had some reasons not to love him, to say the least. But uh, most of the people who benefited from his initiatives actually still like him. 
So now, please. I'm sorry, for the comments and uh, for the suggestions. Um, of course, uh, there is a line heritage uh, from the uh, Tsarist Russian Orientalism uh, into Soviet Orientalism. And of course, there are also differences, uh, which I encountered in several articles, books, while I was doing this research. And uh, it's also interesting to see differences of uh, Soviet Orientalism practices, Orientalist practices, and Western uh, Orientalist practices. And I would like to uh, read the book you, are, uh, you suggested because I, I haven't uh, encountered it. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. And there was also a question uh, from Ghana. Yeah, okay, hi then. Before the arrival of Tamanyan to uh, Yerevan, what were the projects implemented that might have had some oriental notions? I never thought about this, and thank you for the question. I will definitely look at that issue. Uh, as far as I know, there are no oriental notions. Uh, as far as I know, uh, he was rather Im influenced by Russian architecture than by oriental. Uh, I uh, thought we can look what he had done in Iran, though he stayed there for a very short period. Three years are nothing for an architect to live in imprint. But by looking at his own writings, he is rather inclined to continue the line of European classicism. And uh, actually, the provocation of the book is such that you are finding Tamanyan in both these people. In, some, in one case, it's the biography, the East, East, and East, and in another case, you see the manifested Western pattern. We follow the West, which is uh, the actual imagination of uh, Tamanian. And the author is not discussing architectural topics, but uh, using this novel in order to present the interplay between uh, the East and the West, he is also able to present the ideas of the constructivists. And uh, you are absolutely disoriented. You cannot find where do you belong. This is uh, actually the success of the book. He is uh, turning the reality upside down and presenting in a different way. I just had an idea, and I cannot live if I would not tell that. Don't you think that the second person is the Chislev, Chislev's image? Chislev was in Gyumri in 1920s, and he built some buildings which are absolutely orientalistic. Just look through those lenses as well. Never thought about that. Thank you. Probably the fact that uh, he's from Gyumri is also contributing to this. The author is from Gyumri. Are you done, Sona? Yes. Tigran, if you hear us, please. I do hear you, of course. Do you hear me? Thank you for uh, the questions and for the observations made by Sayan and the question raised by Sona. The Armenian identity became the main link, as I see. Let me try to say the following. Thank you for the observation that he is not on the border, but a transboundary or supra-boundary, supranational person. Thank you. And I would like to synthesize your observation. All persons or talented artists, sculptors, and even 
directors like Parajanov are on in between uh, Georgian, Armenian, and Ukrainian culture, for example, in case of Parajanov, and they stand above and over that national identity, and they try to synthesize those cultures. I agree with you. As of the roots, when I was uh, looking what we have in Armenian sources, in Russian sources, and I was trying to find also some German and English sources. In English and German, we have one or two words about Ivazovsky. I'm uh, referring to information from the last year. Probably the situation has changed in the two or three months of this year. If you look at the level of name, in all Russian sources, you will find Ivan Konstantinovich Ivazovsky. In Armenian, it's Hovanes Ivazovsky, which is the Armenian version of the name. To what extent his Armenian identity was evident in his paintings? It's a good question. If you look at the letters, their correspondence with the imperial powers, it was in Russian. If you look as a linguist, you see interference or mixture between the Armenian thought, Armenian grammar, and how those were translated into Russian. So he translates into Russian. It's not clear Russian constraint. It's rather a Russian of an Armenian thinker. We should say that he knew the Armenian language well. I was trying to find a gap that we have in the Armenian literature. In the Armenian uh, sources, he is always presented as an Armenian. In Russian literature, he is presented as Russian painter. I was trying to move away from that narrative and find a meta-narrative. And I found the context of imperial memory, and it worked well as the framework. So during the Sultan Hamid massacres, Ivazovsky with Katolikos Makartich Hrimyan agrees to have some paintings. For example, the massacre of Armenians in Trapezunt of Ivazovsky and many others actually served those purposes. So he lived with this Armenian pain in 1880s. The same Abdul Hamid and in Turkey, they respected his paintings, and he donated one of his paintings to the Sultan after the Hamidian massacres. He returned uh, the honors received from Sultan, including the title he got from uh, the Ottoman Empire because his Armenian nature opposed that. And besides uh, Russian, uh, Turkish relations were not very good at that time, and the Armenian paintings were also fitting well into this imperial discourse. There are also many other interesting notions. For example, he was sponsoring the uh, creation of Armenian history or the authoring of the Armenian history books. And so it is not clear. He was also trying to his brother to also write about the history of Mechitorist in <clears throat> Venice. He was baptized in the Armenian Apostolic Church. He 
had many links to the Armenian culture and Armenian history and Armenian cause, and uh, those all are fitting well into this imperial discourse and imperial narrative, which he was part of. Uh, thank you very much for your observations, of course, and uh, thank you to other speakers. Thank you, dear Tegman. If there are no other comments, please. It's not a comment. It's a continuation of the question that's on the race. Nevertheless, the paintings of Ivazovsky with Ararat, Mount Ararat, are one of the first paintings where Ararat is depicted. And he actually introduces uh, the Mount Ararat into the national fine arts, into the national paintings. If our texts, if our narratives are starting from uh, the 60s, I'm very much interested. Using the image, referring this image, and then continuing the line that he introduced in the artistic narrative. When it started, what was his role actually in introducing Ararat into painting? Or we should thank the vernissage in Yerevan for doing that. I was trying to look into the electronic databases I have not looked at that issue specifically. I would say that he it is, he is describing uh, all Armenian issues in one place, all Armenian teams in one place, without making a distinction. I have looked at 60 or 70 articles. Now the old texts are also being digitalized and uploaded to the internet, but I never found this observation on the internet. It's a good point. I will definitely take that into account to see whether he was responsible for introducing Ararat into the Armenian artistic discourse. Uh, so if there are no more questions, let's stop now and meet tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Recording stopped.